both for the anniversary of the Vatican II, the Apostolic uh, Constitution of Santum Consum last year, and also for Bologna. This year, 1944, it's been 17 years after the institution of the new churches uh, instituted by Cardinal Giacomo Lercaro, who in 1955 would start here in San Giacomo Maggiore the great international exhibition, the first major secret, uh, architect, interna architecture international exhibition. So it's we are at a great moment of change socially. So I think we should consider the historical traits from post-war architecture, so from the rebuilding to date in order to take stock of it and then uh, seeing how to, to change. On the one hand, how to update architecture of churches for the cities that is changing. So I'd like to thank everybody who is here, who took the floor today, and also the institutions who cooperated in this event. And therefore, I would like to give the floor for uh, the introduction to the director of the Department of Architecture, Professor Fabrizio Ivan Apollonio, whom I thank. Thank you, Luigi, and good morning. Good morning, everybody. I am very happy to open this conference by uh, bringing, by uh, greeting you on behalf of the department that I represent. As Luigi just said, the two journals for departments promoted this initiative that led to uh, the, uh, this event. So the reference to Bologna is fundamental. Because as Luigi said during the introduction, Bologna has been one of the three cities that were quoted in the calls that uh, represented innovation, points of innovation. So they, thanks to the Cardinals, they explored new roads, anticipating what would have been done by uh, the Council of Vatican II. And I also have a personal memory about these events. Around 30 years ago, well, probably a bit less, I had the honors under the guidance and uh, together with Giorgio Trebbi, one of the architect that together with uh, Glesleri and Cardinal Caldo did these initiatives, organizing the uh, exhibition, the architecture of the sacred space, which retrace the exhibition 1955 trying to update the uh, landscape of the evolution and also the building of churches in the world that followed that let's say brought uh, on those teachings so i'm very happy because this is by pure chance that i'm representing the department right now and having this memory so I uh, apologize uh, since I need to go to Cesena for uh, the campus uh, con council, so I cannot attend these very interesting presentations, but I hope that you'll have a great day and to make the most of these two very demanding, but also very interesting uh, days. Thank you for participating and thank you for being here. And also thank you to those who uh, organized this event. So thank you on behalf of the department and have a great day. As you know, uh, for the tradition in which we are located, this event is sponsored by the Archdiocese of Bologna. So I'd like to give the floor to the General uh, Vicary, um, Monsignor Giovanni Silvani. So the greeting of the Cardinal Archbishop Matteo Maria Zuppi and the Church of Bologna in, uh, uh, in welcoming your uh, study event. So these topics are very uh, interesting to us and uh, also 
because of the uh, art and uh, architectural heritage uh, that is represented by the churches and uh, their uh, premises and also the role of the church of Bologna and uh, also regarding the uh, perspective that your research can open. So we are very glad that you are interested in this topic and that you can provide your own uh, scientific contribution in the uh, debate. For us, this is as is our everyday life. So it's, um, let's say, our job, our everyday work. But you could provide some more insight. You could provide some more, you know, an external point of view, and which is more comprehensive of the values at stake in this fundamental dimension. So buildings are the reflection of their community. And they are a reflection of the evolution of such community. And uh, they also tell the changes that were many during history and also during the last century. So I, you have the task of researching this and we therefore welcome your research and your desire to share the results of these two days that I hope will be fruitful and uh, very interesting. Thank you very much. The conference is supported by Centro Studi Cherubino Girardacci, the Cherubino Girardacci, Centro Studi Cherubino Giradaci is in San Giacomo Maggiore, on the other side of the road. It's a monumental church that was the temple of uh, Bentivoglio family. So it's rich of art like this room that is hosting us. So I'd like to invite you to see the building uh, if you are interested during lunch break and also for the relationship that we uh, had in the past uh, between Lercaro and the church and the spaces of San Giacomo Maggiore, the Centro Studi, the study research center always uh, carried on this memory, this recent memory of the um, city of Bologna. We have Padre Ronda of the uh, comment of the of St. Augustine representing the uh, research center. Thank you very much for the possibility of for me to greet you. Unfortunately, I can be here just for a few minutes. So in 15 minutes, I need to go to the altar because we have the uh, St. Rita's uh, Thursdays. So my congratulations on uh, the research center and the organizers because this attention that is related to the intense relationship between the city and the church should be like both as a material image and an institutional value has very long history and it has a present towards which we need to be very attentive and in the future we will have other possibilities so the study that that you are carrying out and also the contribution and the contribution of the speakers will be very interesting so i wish you a fruitful day and i wish uh, you to have a great uh, cultural experience that is located within the many realities of the University Church of Bologna and also the religious church of the diocese. Yeah. So as St. Augustine Friars, we are uh, here close to you and we feel the duty of cooperating with the university and we wish that this plurality of meetings would uh, create a better path for the society and the church. Thank you very much. So this meeting is also supported by the professional guilds of architects and engineers, professional guilds that cooperated in uh, the event. So they had co-sponsors and these allow many colleagues to have uh, uh, training credits for uh, this uh, 
for this meeting. But it's not just a bureaucratic and training issue. There's also history of friendships, history of friendships that are generated around these topics. So they, I'm especially grateful that the Guild of Architects is represented by uh, Jacopo Gressleri, whose name also reminds uh, of his father and his uncle, Giuliano and Glauco, a family with whom I've always had great a great friendship, but which marked the story of this city. So thank you very much, Jacopo, for representing the Guild of Architects. Good morning, everybody. I'm bringing very quickly the official greetings of the Guild of Architects of Bologna and our president, who unfortunately could not uh, be here for, uh, for his work at the National Council in Rome. I would like to thank Luigi for his kind words. Well, I need to thank him, not just as a councillor of the uh, Guild, but also for this initiative that we've promoted with great uh, interest. So among the objectives of our mandate is to uh, spread uh, architectural culture as much as possible in, um, let's say, in its many topics that this will deal with. So I'd like to thank the architect that looks at with attention and curiosity to the development of this important event, the openings and the uh, and any insight that can come out from this event. I would like to thank also you as a citizen who uses the liturgic spaces and who sees them in uh, their many facets, but also as a city then use, um, enjoying the relationship between the church as a physical place and the surrounding space around the church. Finally, I would like to thank you as a professor, as a teacher, pushing the students to think about the importance of the church as a place that, let's say, can summarize all the elements that are part of the architectural design as a whole. So light, colors, the space, movement, the aggregation of people and the relationship between the internal and external space of a building. So I would like to thank you for many reasons. I'm really moved by uh, this topic and the friendship uh, with uh, whom I've been introduced. So I would like to wish you a fruitful event and I hope to uh, be able to see the acts of this important conference very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jacopo. And as you've heard, now we talk about the acts of the conference, but actually, the there won't be proceedings, but we will have two books on uh, two international uh, journals, two international scientific journals, History of Postwar Architecture related to uh, the uh, speeches on uh, the past century, this last 50 years, and also INPO related to the visions and prophecies on the future. Among the curators of history of post-war architecture, as Andrea Longhi, one of the editors, sorry, is a great full, notorious uh, full professor in Turin of history of architecture, but also a notorious specialist, specialist on this topic. So he will be the editor of the uh, history of post-war architecture issue. So I would like to give him the floor for his introductory remarks. Thank you very much. I would like to thank the institutions, the distinguished guests, and all the friends here uh, in the room. I don't want to contradict Luigi because it's not easy to do, but the two journals, the two calls, the two call for papers, the two sessions, yes, one is related to the 50s and the 60s, and it's 
made by professional historians. The other one is about the future. But what guided us in this historical call of papers is a consideration. So uh, professional historians know that you can't write history without a, a vision of the future. Historians are among the researcher professionals and scholars who turn the present into uh, the place of questions uh, to ask history and who make their method uh, of writing history about history uh, using the their gaze on the future, otherwise would be just old fashioned. So I think it's interesting to see that the journal in a scientific program introduced a work on the 1950s and 60s as the call for paper uh, said, and the today's session will be uh, structured because it's a passage of generation, a gen generational turning point. So those of us who are older than 50 years old who started dealing with this at the end of the 90s had a chance of meeting the protagonists of that season in person. Some of them were very uh, longeve. So uh, uh, Gresleri uh, and then others Pasquale Pulotta, and many more. And we are grateful for their own work and their own endeavors. So now we are in front of generations of uh, young researchers, PhD students, and scholars, for which the 50s and the 60s are a part of history, which is not no longer part of their own biographies. So, And it's interesting to see how a researcher, a scholar, was born in the 90s, 30 years after Va the Vatican II, and uh, in a different professional framework where universities already became de-ideologized but also impoverished in the political and cultural debate. And it's interesting to see how they are facing these crucial years. So. I'm not just the only editor. I have some other colleagues that are editors, and we've read more than 50 papers that we've got between the two uh, mag uh, journals. So more than 50 scholars that are interested and also seeking a future in the historical research. So I'm very curious, and I, can I look forward to see how uh, will it end. Thank you very much, and I wish you all the best. Thank you very much. So obviously I'm not leaving the floor to all institutions that sponsored this event because otherwise the day would have been too long with the uh, introductory remarks and the representatives of these institutions will take the floor over these days. So it's pointless to uh, anticipate uh, their own uh, introductory remarks. So I'd like to thank Unicredit for the spaces, Mr. Massimo Piana, who managed uh, uh, all the setup with two, uh, with Duecom Eventi people at the direction of Matien Diego and the interpreters, because this event, and I'm saying, uh, is broadcast in English, thanks to uh, Future for Religious Heritage. And therefore, we have around 250 uh, online attendees from all over Europe that are listening to us in English, thanks to the interpreters, Francesco Cecchi and Edoardo Ballerini, of the Department of Interpreting and Translation uh, of the University of Bologna, thanks to a convention that we have as a Grovino Dutch Research Center. So I'm speaking slowly also to... Uh, help their job. So I would like to ask all the speakers to do so and to stick to this instruction, please. So this allows also, and I'm saying it here, to connect online for those, uh, some of you are doing that, for those who don't speak Italian in the room, so you can connect uh, with your uh, uh, mobile phone and you can listen to the interpretation in English if you don't speak or, well, 
but I said, if you don't understand Italian, or if you wish to, or if you prefer to listen to English, I would like to thank the uh, Castellis Parmedonia Foundation who funded part of uh, this project to uh, organize this uh, conference and also the national office for uh, worship uh, buildings of the uh, Italian Bishop Conference that funded the event with research programs of which Professor Giovanni Leoni is in charge, of whom I thank for, uh, for this event. Now I would like to get to the topic with the first session of this day. Because the moment in which, in which we live in is an anniversary that for the Church of Bologna, but I think at least for the Italian Church, is quite important. 70 years ago, Cardinal Giacomo Lercaro in 1954 created the new church office. It was a place to give trust, uh, to give confidence uh, in the young people. The average age was the lowest among the similar offices in the European dioceses. There were uh, newly uh, graduated people and the oldest person was 35. So this person created the mm, worship, the places of worship and the districts of the uh, outskirts of Bologna. This quality comes from a relationship between a left-wing municipal administration and the uh, Church of Bologna during the Cold War, during the Age of the Walls. The ways of this symbiotical relationship have not been cleared in a scientific way, so we hope that this meeting is a way to, let's say, go towards those archives, those papers, to take a look at the ways in which, as Andrea Longhi said, well, it's not just possible to study the past, but also to have keys uh, to read the future, keys with which we can build relationship, new possibilities to build a design for uh, the local community. This conference that the two um, that was promoted by the two mag journals of the uh, Department of the Architecture was organized for this to open a key for the, to the future. On the one side, to finding the roots in the uh, comprehension of critic and history. So this conference would like to analyze the relationship between churches and cities in the rebuilding plans. Uh, urban planning, the cultural debate of uh, places of worship and their own image according to Vatican II. And in the movement leading to different uh, European contexts. In Europe, there was a contemporary network of church and district workshops that animated Europe and that moved to, through human uh, and friendship uh, events under these uh, European centers, think about Italy, Portugal, and Germany, and think about the far uh, Finland, there were network of friendships, friendships that were generated by common passion, a common love. Sometimes we believe that knowledge is just rationality, but then Padre Dante says that Sorry, uh, Dante Ligari reminded us that love is what moves the sun and the stars. And this is, applies also to the design of the city. And this was the first aim. Andrea said it better than me. To, let's say, to go into history, to take a look at the future. So a second research line looks at the future of these relationships between churches and the cities in the radical changes of uh, society, in the acceleration between secularization and post-secularization, in the final distinction between civil community and religious community, and obviously between religions and Christianity. So this overlapping, Luca Diotalevi will talk about this, overlapping in this afternoon and that overlapping finally failed it has been overcome and this is not bad probably it's a new opportunity so which form then which role 
which design, which presence for uh, the churches of the contemporary cities. Sometimes we suspect by looking at the projects of Italian churches, and I see that Luca Franceschini hasn't arrived yet, but I think is coming. So we suspect looking at the uh, projects of the new Italian churches is that, that we are repeating a typological model that is built on foundations of the past in relation to a city which is no longer the present city. Probably we need a, a further effort of knowledge, prophecy, analysis that cannot be asked just to the designers. So the architects can't do everything alone. This effort must be shared. It must be a whole effort by the uh, church and the civil society. Going back to Lercaro, his intuition 70 years ago with the creation of the new church's center was the conception of the city as a living body. In more than a place, but let's say uh, in that speech that we can consider as a sort of testament because it happened in the Annus Terribilis of 1968 when he left the diocese. A speech he delivered in Kohl in Germany. So he manifested this need of not leaving the research on places of worship uh, considering it as over. So this is a risk that the, the church cannot afford, uh, said Lercaro. Design must be uh, renewed continuously. Research must be continuously renewed. Lercaro was aware of the fact that the models that started from Bologna and then spread to Italy and Europe uh, through the Chiesa and Quartiere Journal were the outcome of a specific cultural context of internal migration within the country. And he, and he understood that the responses of the design of churches and cities should have changed when the cities would have become the stage of other flows, the crossroads of populations of inhabitants from uh, different origins coming from far from far away uh, countries or other cultures. So I've noted down a, a quotation from that speech from the 1968 speech in Cone. So I'm trying to quote here, the success on the architectural interpretation of contemporary church, the important uh, um, common traits in the roles of painting, sculpture, music, and literature, they all run the risk of becoming goals in the static sense of the term. What do I mean? Meaning uh, the end of the line. So if they are not permanently in contact with the pace of life that renovates and changes everything, if we want to uh, go with life, its expectations and instances, so if we want to grasp the constant evolution uh, far away of staying on the goal line to be immunized against any possible mannerisms and uh, breakings of the sector, so we should relentlessly go on on our journey, a journey of patient research that goes along with all our uh, earthly endeavors and ending with the end of the church and the uh, incoming of the uh, heavens. So a, a, a believing pastor who is not avoiding a constant research, but on the other hand, puts a lot interested on that. So we are here to ask ourselves which kind of churches uh, is required by the changing city. So which models of, ch of church? The Christian population is dropping and the cities are having inhabitants from other remote uh, origins. Individualization 
process of sacred are radicated and are rooted, sorry, and also that Catholic substrate layer that was all around the country where everybody had to declare themselves uh, Christian, even even if not by faith, but by root. So, and now the cause and the consequence is the misunderstanding of the language of the sign and the forms of the Christian cultural heritage that are uh, weaving our cities and on which we need to open a debate. Because if we no longer understand the sense, how can we preserve them? So marked by these quick changes, we should update, we should change the question that the Cardinal of Bologna asked. So which role, which image, which inspiration for the churches of the contemporary city? What is the relationship with the context? What is the meaning? What is the image and what is the identity? Once the church wants to give itself, the church with capital C, through its own churches. This is a question that the institution must ask itself in a moment of change. So we are here with a broad participation, both of the church and the uh, research, in order to uh, take on this debate. So I'd like to thank the attendees, the many speakers that are that came here. And I'd like to thank the keynote speakers and all those who uh, submitted their own abstracts, their own papers. There were many of them. And I would like to open this conference. Thank you very much and have a fruitful uh, day. Now there's first session starting. I'll give the floor to Lorenzo Grieco, who will moderate this first session. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. Let's start today's business with an incredibly interesting uh, speech of Albert Gerrits that will introduce uh, today's keynote. Uh, Professor Gerrits studied philosophy and theology in Innsbruck and Rome. He uh, had many uh, jobs uh, in, actually here in this place. And it will be too long to name them all. But just to give you a, a broad idea, after graduating at, in, theology, in theology in Germany, he was is uh, he worked at the University of Bochum and Bonn as the president of the president of the um, German Episcopal Ecclesia, uh, and he also advised the liturgic commission, and he also worked within the the commission in the relation within the relationship with Judaism. So also president of the Commission of Christian Art of the Diocese of, of Aquis Grana. And he also works at the University of Bonn. He will have a keynote lecture called New uh, Types of Churches, uh, Innovative Relationship Between Churches and Cities in Germany. I don't want to waste any more time. So I'll leave the floor to Professor Gerrit. I'll ask you to come here and talk. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for your presentation and for your invitation here at this conference. I'll start by saying that the current situation of the Catholic and Protestant churches in Germany, when it comes to research, churches cannot be used anymore for liturgical purposes on a on a large scale. There are major factors 
having to do this to do with this during World War II. Too many churches had been built thanks to the large uh, possibilities that the churches had back then. Also with the demographics and uh, the diminution in uh, in the amount of worshippers in church cause lots of financial problems for churches. Many churches have been shutting down. Between 30 and 50% of them shut down. To fight this financial problem, we need research, in particular interdisciplinary research, as what the German uh, as the uh, this university work at this at the transformation of uh, sacred space in Germany that was mentioned before. Other disciplines learn a lot from learn that spaces are not uh, static; they're not pure uh, physical containers. But there are social phenomena relating to the church's space. It's not about the walls of the church that build the space, but it's the relationship between people that uh, live, in, live in the space, that are in the space. In particular, social interactions are fundamental. So when it comes to ecclesial uh, spaces, The ritual performances, thanks to ritual studies, are now uh, studied by uh, liturgical studies that we, they usually concentrated on artifacts and objects, thanks to interdisciplinary studies and sacred topographies of internal and external spaces can be rebuilt, could be rebuilt, from uh, the ancient times to today, allowing uh, churches to appear as you know subjects of interest in today's society, they interact with the actions that are uh, done to, uh, through all of this, and then with uh, changes in. In the personnel, for example, when churches change uh, owners or in, due to uh, organizational changes, when, for example, for uh, liturgical reforms, churches change and it's then, then they're then preserved. The permanence of such churches is the result of interactive and continuous uh, processes. The second thing I would like to say is that I would like to talk about the interaction between urban space and churches. In particular, when it comes to sociology of the facades. Per Particular characteristics of the building in its entirety are, is what really matters as well for its function. The facade of a cathedral, which represents uh, a city, and, but of course uh, it has a different uh, purpose than uh, a church that, uh, you know, is is in a small town and is used by only a few amount of a small number of people. All of this can be uh, resumed by the by the fact of being close or far from it. Facades, especially when uh, facades are used to different. Diff to separate and and to create a border between what is 
uh, sacred and what is not. Facades can also be uh, welcoming towards all and can be the synonym of uh, endless uh, hospitality. So they also have a social function and they're part of the diaconal uh, mission of the church. Often uh, certain uh, worships were forced to uh, have churches in, in yards, in churchyards, and they were forced to build them so that facades could only be recognized after uh, passing maybe a house, and that is the case for uh, Catholic churches in uh, former Prussian uh, areas. The most recent one and the most spectacular uh, construction of churches, the Propsteikirche in Leipzig is certainly a really important uh, church in urban in the urban uh, urban area, but you can only see the facade when you enter the churchyard towards this entrance that looks like a, a, that is on, on the street. And this allows uh, to have a space for people to roam around. And this shows this uh, sense of, of, you know, of self-awareness that the church has. The entering and the subdivision and different zones. Uh, today's time, church spaces have always had non-religious purposes other than the liturgic ones. And they, they were multifunctional spaces. Back in the days, uh, the basilica was used uh, as a sort of meeting area. And then it was divided in different sections. On the one hand, they you know, show the growing clarification of the church. But on the other hand, they show the right, free management of, of the area of transitions. In the Middle Ages, there was no, there wasn't this division between sacred and non-sacred because the presence of God was felt in today's life, in everyday's life. So there was this difference between being close to what's sacred, be far from what was sacred. And churches, for example, were lightened or, uh, sorry, were um, yeah, very bright colors. Uh, so there are certain spaces that have different functions in the in the church. So what can a facade do in terms of uh, you know, theology, uh, the theological framework? It it shouldn't force people to enter the church. It should be a, a threshold between what is outside, and what is inside. But it's also it also indicates what the borders and thresholds are in our world. Church spaces are uh, sort of third places. So what happens when such uh, places undergo transformation and the outside when the outside still looks like a place of worship, but it in Inside, something completely different happens. Transformations have always been there, but it, they can become a problem when they become the norm. And, and then the necessity to have sort of hybrid uses 
of the church that should not necessarily be um, things that people do in, emer in terms of emergency, but they can be a possibility, meaning uh, a prolonged use of these spaces in Germany and in nearby countries. There are still uh, uh, numerous initiatives. We can see some of the the sites of these initiatives. The thing I wanted to say is the hybrid use as an opportunity for the church uh, in, in a post secular society. So the fact of to give extra space or to take space away. It is really the initiative in, in the congregation of using the space of the church as a vital space is fundamental. So in the allocation, for example, of pastoral spaces and the reduction of worship places, in all of these um, parishes take the initiative. they want to give a new purpose to their churches without having to abandon them completely. And, and last year, in, in recently, uh, different uh, parishes in Cologne started to, uh, to do all of this. In 2021, an initiative group from uh, uh, a church from St. Hippolytus in Troisdorf near Cologne, through the uh, help of the Bonifatoster uh, funds, which is a, and also an initiative called Space for Grace, experimented different forms of liturgic assembly in this op sort of open space here, the empty space at the purpose of uh, drive creative uh, creative actions in the church. And the, also the approach to liturgy is more uh, aware of the space with this new solution. There was this, there was a, an art exhibition there. Then the St. George uh, Parish in Cologne studied for some time the space of this church that they wanted to use for numerous meetings and non-liturgic uh, meetings. Because see on the left, the, uh, the original situation with all the benches that were uh, uh, eliminated, and you can see the current situation on the right. with this sort of uh, the time of desert kind of uh, context, they organized uh, an event where they, during uh, uh, during Easter times, they got rid of the benches and they used it in, they used the space in this way. There are also exhibitions in this church, they even bought new ch new uh, new chairs, and you know they had all sorts of events and exhibitions. The term hybrid space. This uh, word is used, and this term is used in different ways, relating always to the space of ch of the church. Thomas Herner used it to uh, talk about different uh, encounters in sacred spaces. Although this term can be used for uh, sacred spaces where the setting factor is keeping the sort of sacred characteristic characteristics of this place. So that was the case for the multi uh, multifunctional churches in the 1670s 
that you know uh, were um, repurposed after there was a new sort of sacred space, worship space that was built afterwards. There are also among these uh, city churches that have tend to have a separate uh, sacred space that you know still has its importance. The hybridation of space is not just about uh, repurposing uh, large holes and uh, rooms. But what's what's more important is to be aware that such buildings. There are sometimes, you know, they have an incredible potential when it comes to uh, congregations and in their uh, tasks and, ob and objectives. Recently, all of this was done, or at least temporarily, when churches were used to uh, establish uh, vaccination hubs or to uh, host uh, migrants or have, uh, you know, sort of almost shops that uh, had, you know, clothing and all this for people that were affected by natural disasters. Another uh, sort of hybrid use uh, that was used by our colleagues Alexander, Alexander Alteik and Karsim Menzel. And the first category that we'll talk about is simultaneousness. You know, churches have always had a tradition in Germany since the reform. In the past, the space, the space between the different uh, congregations were separate, but most recent times, Catholic and Protestants share the same wor worship space. And even in other, you know, the realms, they're, you know, getting more together. An example of this is the ecumenical use, ecumenical use of the uh, St. Pius Lucas uh, church that used to be only Catholic, now it's used by both Protestants and Catholics at the same time. And as I said, it's called uh, St. Pius Lucas in Krefeld in, uh, in West Germany. Most recent times, the uh, most recent example is uh, represented by church cities. The, the, we, here we have a ecumenic uh, church that is that is a Gothic and also Moroccan. And, you know, there's a space only used for uh, worship uh for worship reasons and but they're they're changed the the floors they changed the audio systems and the lighting systems for all sorts of purposes the same thing uh, was done for uh the same Maria Emelfart in Mission Gladbach, now we have the the worship space can be separated we can, from all of the rest towards the different uh, uh, arcades. So the second type of uh, of it is the separation. the The simultaneous aspect can be found also in the 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 kindergarten church of St. Bonifacius Dioran. Here, a kindergarten was brought in the church.
because this church is also uh, when it comes to uh, not our architectural point of view is is a very important one but the congregation still uh, does the mess on 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 Sunday but there's a space where this these kindergarten children can play uh, during the week the second aspect I wanted to touch on is separation according to uh, the so canonic um, terms these churches must be separated in Aachen in the Aachen diocese these spaces are 14 we have this Saint Joseph one here These uh, columbaria are organized in different ways. If, of course, if that depends if there are just regular mess or other kind of celebrations. We have here an, an sort of electronic a screen that you know shows the life of, of people that died here. This is another another church in Aachen, you know, Saint Donatus. The separation happens when an ecclesiastic space is reduced in term uh, of size to serve other functions and to bring other uh, kind of groups in the church. That uh, is, for example, when there are charity events. For example. The Vilikniasen church in Stellenachus has done the same thing because initially it was too large as a church. Here we see the library and a meeting space that can be seen from the church, but it's separated from, from the church. These two, two spaces cannot access cannot be accessed directly. Such separation was done in the Saint Bernard uh, Church in Cologne, where the nave is used as a sort of uh, a sort of a warehouse almost. So that's of course a very different use. But you can see part of the church is still used for uh, liturgical purposes. The third aspect is annexation. Uh, that is a sort of a new uh, definition of surrounding of the surrounding space that can actually affect directly the space in rural areas. That can could be used, for example, as a as a garden. This church is near Leipzig. In urban areas, uh, the square near the church can be used for all sorts of social purposes by incorporating not just a facade but also the church in the square. In uh, the Stiftskirchen in Bonn is as being used as a parking lot uh, and as a, a sort of recreated for recreative purposes in 2022 but only for one day so it was a, a consultation for repurposing uh, the entire neighborhood around the church isn't there uh, what's more obvious than just opening the church and getting having life entering the church. I'm personally invested in this project because uh, projects can happen thanks to uh, charities that 
uh, you know, establish themselves near the church. Uh, this caused a long time ago that the church of Saint Maximin in Trier was used as a as a sort of a sports arena. Now I'm getting to the end of my speech. Here we have the relationship between diaconal and communitary use, simultaneousness, synergy, and symbiosis. This can be a sort of architectural uh, concept like in the St. John Baptist uh, Church in Cologne, in Cologne, sorry, that was almost abandoned despite its uh, historical importance. It was divided in four areas that you know serve all sorts of uh, pastoral functions. It can be a space of meeting for uh, young people. There's one space that can be used for all sorts of cultural events in the lower part of the church. There's a space for uh, mess, the mess. And there's also a, a warehouse for artifacts that belong to the church, of course. There's also the San Maria Alts uh, project in, in Stuttgart. And this has a completely different approach, whereby the congregation uh, shares a single space without dividing the space. The image on the right shows situation uh, shows an ex one of the the events that were held in this church. And it was, uh, you know, there was a public competition, and then uh, the winning bid uh, you know, uh, the the winning the you know you know the refurbishment of this place is still going on in order to have a hybrid use of the spaces there's no need sometimes for uh, an architectural, a uh, large architectural uh, sort of intervention, like in this uh, church in Mönchengladbach, there's a library in the church, as you can see. There were shelves, bookshelves that were uh, built in the church that can be then moved to the la to the chapel on the side, that in order to have extra seats. This prolonged use of the uh, the internal part of the church contributed to revitalize uh, to repurpose the church. And last point that I wanted to make is to uh, renounce to this hybridation. Uh, past examples uh, often referred to churches that were still used for uh, liturgical purposes. But what about churches? There are no longer churches, it, churches de facto, but they're still used in, in different ways. For example, we have a social warehouse in, uh, in uh, Aachen, near Aachen, and it's used as a, a sort of secondhand, uh, almost secondhand warehouse shop, or, sort of so it's used by actual customers there we also have the so-called digital uh, church in Aachen here we have the facade and the the front part of the church and now it has been sold to uh, an investor it is used 
as a digital hub in uh, Aachen. And it's used for all sorts of events and co-working events. So there are no spiritual uh, services in this church. And there are still some people that look for someone to, you know, ask about uh, liturgical purposes of the church, but it's not the case anymore. Here we have uh, another church in Mönchengladbach, the St. Peter Church that uh, does not serve anymore as a church, but it's sold to a company that uh, creates a wall uh, climbing structures This church is a is a church by Gottfried Brunn near Aachen. It was sold to an accountant that sells uh, um, bikes in this church, bicycles in this church. And here we have a church near Leipzig. And this church is was ruined in the first place, and then it was. Uh, sort of refurbished in a different way. But here, there are tourists on bicycles that come here. Here we have the Dominican Church of Münster that was sold to the city, actually. And you know, still not a church again, and uh, it's a sort of work of art uh, by uh, Gerhard Richter. In here that we see in the picture, this this church still has a sort of sacred, uh, um, sort of atmosphere in it, and that's what people look for. As we can see, these churches still have this uh, church, uh, this sort of sacred atmosphere, despite not being churches anymore. That means that churches, if they're no longer actual churches, they're still so the owners of the church are still aware of the sort of sacred uh, ambiance of the church. The purpose of our study group is to study these processes, especially when it comes to the hybridation process of churches, of churches, especially when it comes to uh, the liturgic science. So uh, my task is also to see how much the let's say the logical space. So how was it? How it was before, and how does space works when this change has been operated, and uh, so that it would serve a purpose to the people in society also after this change. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Gerrits. Now we move to the first uh, uh, speech of the first session. I would like to invite Tino Grisi on stage. Tino is an architect. He graduated at the Polytechnical University of Milan. He earned a PhD at the Department of Architecture of the University of Bologna with a, a doctoral thesis on ecclesiastical buildings by Emil de Stefan, a, a thesis that was published in 2014. And he also took part in the Master of design and adjustment of uh, buildings of worship at the University of Rome uh, Sapienza. He wrote countless books and articles, and we remind the most recent one, The Mystical Body of 2022, and 
architecture and liturgy as a, as comprehensive, uh, a, a comprehensive uh, dictionary for Lettera 22. He is going, in his speech, he is going to talk about a new way of conceiving the sacred space in relation to the needs of the uh, multi form of the human space and the need of the uh, liturgic uh, building in a new perspective with this speech called Vita nella Chiesa, Life in the Church. So the floor to Professor Grisi. Good morning. I would like to thank the organizers of this conference for allowing me to participate and to be the first among the selected speakers to talk after the precious keynote uh, speech by uh, my friend and master Albert Garrett. So I would like to thank you for enabling me to come back to Bologna where I earned my PhD and where I could have an academic uh, trade on liturgic architecture study. So I would like to remember Professor Giorgio Praderio. Can you hear me? Is it better? Thank you. So I would like to take a moment to remember Professor Giorgio Praderio, a person who, together with Luigi Bartolomeo, welcomed me, and I was nobody in the university of this uh, in the in this university of the city uh, 15 years ago. But let's start. David Bowie asked himself in the 70s whether there was life on Mars. It was a critique to the way in which the society evolved. At the basis are the thought that there is a far better life somewhere and, that, and the great disappointment of not being able to access it. So what we are called to do is to go beyond uh, what we are used to see and live. So there's a life which is worth living but first of all it's that's inside ourselves if you discover mars within yourself you will look around and you will realize that even though reality uh, seems the same now it has a different meaning at the same time we can ask ourselves which life is possible within the architectural expression of the church and understanding whether a uh, landscape that looks unavoidably the same, which is poor of evidences, can instead lead to the future atmosphere. Church has deeply changed since Saint John the Twenty Third saw the moon from his window and he realized the world had changed. A spectacle that show that the St. Peter's Bale in four uh, centuries cannot be, he could com can contemplate. So now Pope Francis can say today that we are no longer in a regime of Christianity because faith is no longer an obvious uh, basis for common life. And he brought to that a new culture is pulsating in the city. And this ask for new uh, spaces for prayer and communion with more attractive and innovative practices for urban populations. Between these two poles, there's a long and troubled architectural, uh, architectural story of steps uh, forwards and backwards, which rarely took stock of what happened before in the pioneer times of the modern construction for the Catholic worship. But it was the object of uh, misknowledges, of provocatory and continuous misknowledges. In 2007, I published an article whose title predated this, uh, this, uh, the, the title of this conference. I published an article, The Church and the, Ch and the City, called uh, about uh, talking about the parish center of Munich. I saw that the church can be seen between destruction and the community that lives in that part of the city. So if the district is considered to be the, the real place where to spend aggregation time, the experience of communion that is uh, developed in the church can give a spiritual touch 
touch to what has been outlined in the urban environment and the architectural block escape any metaphorical attempt and explore the possibility of being factual signs of transcendent realities through through a mild expression of the church. So it's an expression that does not put sacrality in front over the uh, daily life, but it sucks in the city within the uh, silence of a cloister. So now, in Munich, the Frauenkirche, the cathedral, Madeleine Dietz, during uh, Ashes Wednesday, put this installation uh, earth to earth so clay is amassed in front of the altar and they dissolve on the steps a sort of barrier that covers the direct path to the eucharistic mast and forces the liturgic operation to take other paths so new paths require new efforts but they are vital surrounded by the walls of the church we are reminded the provisional nature of all the structures which are just apparently giving us safety. The walls of the church are also temporary finite. They are limited. These two radical examples make us understand that how the church is an obsolete architectural type. It's on the recursiveness of uh, ancient weavings, which do not hold with the their relationship with the ritual and modern society. But the modern explanation, if it doesn't revel it doesn't reveal this crisis, it still fails because it cannot communicate a positive and dynamic essence. And it falls within a context that wishes to be stable and ingenious instead of being mobile and creative. But besides, the parish center was a genre that was never born, so it can't grow. So the church community center has been transformed and turned into a functional case and packed in a, a strict category. So uh, at Urban Innovation, the same criteria was used and that put into crisis the sense of putting a parish center which become, may, became marginalized. So architectural research can respond by clearing the field and uh, um, and uh, uh, and proposing some some solutions that are not too shy or too bold. So they need to be parabolic. Jesus Christ responded to the apostles, you were given the mystery of the kingdom of God. So for those who are outside, everything comes in a parable, Mark 4, 11. So that's why Benedict XVI said that language of art is a parabolic language, which has a universal opening. And if the church architecture encourages faith, it must do it in a new parabolic language. Having the courage of finding new signs, new symbols, a new flesh to convey the word in several cultural uh, uh, fields, using also that non-commercial beauty, which cannot be significant for uh, the gospel spreaders, but which are very uh, attractive for other. And I'm quoting uh, Pope Francis here. So in the moment of suspension of uh, misunderstanding, fear that are renewing in our uh, existence, we should be able to take to to take from a modern cultural heritage to understand the circuit architecture today, which is penalized by the exasperating comparison with the past, cannot uh, uh, communicate its poetic weight. Only a living writing turning us to ground zero of architecture can resonate as the speech resonates in the person as uh, soft plastic and being reproducible by contemporary voices. Since 2019, I started my research project, Church for the Future, answering the question of the, church, of the contemporary church architecture with narrative configurations where you do not express uh, feelings, but you express things and realities. So with this explicit exchange between uh, earthly uh, matters and the transcendent. So this led to the parabolic architecture, the creation. Architecture here is the parable 
as the reference to the elements of the heaven. So it expresses the will of God and, uh, and a message for the salvation of the material world. Generation. In a space-time development, which is uh, in scale, bipolar volumes have a conflict and they open in the uh, approach of sacraments to the uh, Christian faith. Existence, a sanctuary, a respiratorium, open to words, a shared reality, made a transient place between individual and community of people in a new coexisting. Here, worship architecture has a new way of communicating towards the um, environment of communion, produces some breathing with a green core generating oxygen. The parable of its existence is a symbol that is actually produced as a something that happens in the world. I try to show how much parabolic architecture can take the features of reality and use them in its own tale in, with the elements of reality by opening the relationship of the spirit of the Holy Ghost and offering a uh, reality that goes beyond. So sp the spirit can take a role, the spiritual can take a role in the city and define its own presence with other words, other kinds and new uh, consistencies. The future church is not the building nor the parish center, the variable and modulated response to the crisis in its being an active part of the polymorphic urbanity. So it can host different spaces at the same time as more times in the same space. Having a narrative topic uh, to be told and be understood. So church architecture should silently propose the propensity to go on on the, on the journey because they cannot just exist in the here and now, but they commit to the future with a progressive image of the buildings. Simultaneous places that are close to each other and that can be crossed generate the living, um, the living group in which reality and ritual can uh, be placed in other urban maps. To think about liturgic architecture in producing sustainable urban environments in contemporary metropolis means to deal with the presence of the unseen in the expansion and regeneration of cities. So faith, arch architecture and faith can become welcoming notes of urban spiritualization, uh, sorry, of human and environmental spiritualization. So the uh, neighborhood and life became uh, become a continuously evolving uh, way of communication and living, and they cannot forget the spiritual representation of the place. The work of Church of the Future evolved towards uh, towards what Don Giancarlo Santi said, a support, uh, a great support to research, which I always remember and thank, and I'm grateful of. So it became a didactic workshop at the Polytechnic of Milan with the subtitle Spiritual Architecture and Urban, and Urban Innovation. So an intensive workshop of design uh, lasting 14 days with two editions that were completed in just six months. And the workshop has as a goal to introduce students to think about the life of architect, uh, of faith architecture in the cities. So we deal with the uh, faith in the renovation of districts. So in the idea that we are not just uh, living in a single and inclusive world. So we would like to stimulate a non-conformist and an open uh, view of the church, allowing the architect to understand the real, the actual uh, um, needs of the churchgoers, the faithful and the non-faithful in order to make them a living being. So in this workshop, we developed two vital states of the near religious space. So the creation of a urban chapel as the place of reconciliation among individuals, cultures, faiths, and generations, which are different. A line, a boundary between uh, the everyday life and the opening and the inclusion. So a hybrid building, which is innovative for community for Catholic communities, creating a single compound where to have many uses without 
concealing this space for celebration. So the church invites both to prayer and to arts, playful and other moments. So uh, a life in the congregation and beyond. So the workshop interested two urban regeneration projects in Milan, Scala Porta Romana and Santa Giulia. These areas were interpreted as places for discovering spiritual animation to find a more understanding environmental and perceptual environment. Within the Olympic Village for 2026 Winter Olympic Games in an open environment between the Olympic Village, which will be destined to another fluid community, which is the Students' House, so we wanted to find the positioning of the urban chapel as the space of silence and meditation and also usable for uh, the celebration of small groups. The proposals uh, had a diversified network of relationship taking inspiration from the bu other buildings and uh, uh, making some points of references that can be uh, seen as a significant public space. In one of them, the active center of gravity, not just the geometrical center, is the measured presence of spiritual architecture. That's the space of the intersection and the enlightenment. Or a uh, shiny uh, box, which tells you what is this real symbolical value that can be sought after and found in the city, having as an expected goal what lies beyond it. The measure opens a new available between uh, the incumbent mass of tall uh, buildings, allowing air and light to animate in the space the synesthesia of the meditation, finding the metaphor of the journey, of the walk, of the path. So by using the gardens as a, an act of creation, the chapel is an archaic sign, a natural sign of the availability and of reflection. In Santa Giulia, in a part of the church plan of Milan, we found some arch archetypes which are at the forefront of the Christian language, which have their own cosmic orientation in a variable urban architecture. So first propose, in the first proposal, the new building, this community center, which is a space for worship and also a place for coexistence, is within this found memory of special traits that is together a place for the spirit and also an expression of sustainability. Get into grips with a new topic. In the second project, we uh, went towards movement and transparency in order to uh, put a place which is at the same time urban but also uh, aimed at spirituality. So it's a ballroom made with openings collecting the uh, space bubbles of the Baptist tree of the space for celebration and multi-purpose space. In another case, this succession of volumes and the traces of the compenetration reveal the greatest aspect of this uh, kind of setup. So the preparatory work that we do in the inside, the use of the atriums to uh, of the halls to, for very scenarios for the community, the celebration uh, areas with two wings, filling the void center where he will live with them. In the second edition, we added the spiritual park, whose idea started with the uh, confrontation with Stefano Boeri while writing the call for the new church and the premises on uh, Regina Pacis, as the great parvis, as the uh, joint that structures the relationship between the city and faith, a delicate work of light and life that inhabits and makes the city inhabited. So the workshop was interreligious on the uh, example of the Abrahamic family house of Abu Dhabi, which was supported by Pope Francis as the variant of the current master plan by placing the Christian, Islamic and Jewish worship places oriented on the uh, background of the bridge uh, architecture of the social cultural center. So the common parvi 
brings them to the new use perspective. While the trees courts have a plane where each religious expression can find its own uh, identity with a symbolical relationship with water and nature. I'm going to conclude. In the 21st century, there's no century that is not places with a places of reconciliation and are they have the sign of how faith can be believed. So the most important part of research was spiritual AI, imagining space for ecclesial architecture. So the small album collects together with three uh, small articles. Mine, Daniele Viva from the Polytechnic of Milan and Dr. Francesca Leto from the Theological Faculty of Central Italy a set of AI-generated images of ecclesiastical spaces. So this takes the challenge of the representation of ecclesial architecture at, in the light of modern theology, auspicating a real innovation. The use of AI to generate spatial ima images opens to a dynamic uh, design, and it doesn't replace but can enrich the uh, religious experience in an open architecture for meditation and community. The images joint symbolical learning, urban innovation, and multicultural opening, representing the first didactic support to the workshop in showing new spiritual architectural types I mentioned before as places to develop the creative strength of ecclesial architecture. So finally, it's the hope that ecclesial architecture might become once again the focal point for the life of the community within a world that is rapidly changing to be the outcome of a return process in the availability of the subject to take a step back from their own idea and trust it to the community and make it live over time. So we are in the moment in which we need to remove the prejudice and as Amy Stefan suggested, to forget about the canons. We need to neutralize the culture of living in the church so that the space would come from assembling, putting together movement by supporting faith without um, stirring nostalgias. So as Hector Socha said in his radical period, we need to reinvent life to take it back and to uh, film it uh, in directly. So building a church can become uh, a way of declaring the new, recognizing it, deploying the new, and creating when it, the new is manifested to do new architecture for the new world without detaching from what we had so far. Thank you very much. Grazie. Thank you very much, Dino Grisi, for your speech. Produce our next speaker, Dr. Bern Illebrand. Um, Dr. Illebrand studied Catholic theology at the Eberhard Kars University in Tübingen and at the University of Bologna. He also obtained a doctorate in Catholic theology at the Eberhard Kars University of Tübingen. In the meantime, he had several roles as a university and youth pastor in Germany. Um, he was professor of practical theology at the Catholic University of Applied Sciences in Freiburg. And he is currently professor and head of the Institute for Pastoral Theology and Pastoral Psychology at the Faculty of Catholic Theology at the Karls Franzen University of Graz in Austria. So I please, Doctor, I invite Dr. Ilebrand to come here, if he's with us. Okay, thank you. So uh, today he's gonna talk, he's gonna give his contribution uh, on unintentional presence in an urban uh, liquefaction, the church mission of care in a, in a participatory network. And he's going to talk about um, uh, the role of supremacy that church buildings have lost in the urban context and also in society. So thank you very much. I leave the floor to you. Yes, yes, yes. I speak only 20, 20 minutes. I do it in, Ita in Italian. Parlo in Italiano. Perché? Grazie per l'invito. Perché? Thank you so much for the invitation. And it's really uh, nice because 25 years ago, I studied in Bologna. 
at the Faculty of the Theology at the Emilia Romagna and also in the philosophy one. And I'm still friends uh, with a lot of people here in the city. And my uh, topic regarding relationships, non-intentional presence. This means that it, being present without any particular intention in a urban uh, liquef liquefaction But it's about the, the human care in a participatory network. So the uh, church in north church in north of Germany in Essen has a a night called Kershka Get Kino. Church goes to the movies, in which there's a movie being shown in the city uh city movie theaters or there's a so-called Zinzuka Salon a uh, hall for uh, researchers from Salon and, and you can talk maybe to a photographer in this place or with all sorts of people or the Holy Week and, uh, and, and Easter are celebrated in theaters outside of uh, churches uh, in the pastoral uh, the church works with uh, places all all you know you know outside that um and it's present in all sorts of places with its pastoral uh, approach. It does not relate the world to itself, but it it's about its relationship with the world. This uh, crucial presence in the city represents a pastoral that is the aim to uh, you know connect people with God, and at the same time, it, it is very serious about. Uh, people's freedoms towards its presence. Four steps show how a new form of presence of the church is responsible for a fluid city and what it can have, what it can be. The first step is a city in transformation. The second is called uh, fluid churches. The third is called let yourself be touched by life's vulnerability. And the fourth is called non-intentional presence in social environments. The first point is called uh, city in transformation. Cities are going through a process of radical transformation. They're always less uh, popular and they're no longer a place of exchange. Their, uh, their purpose is, has changed. Also, the fact that in metropolitan areas, there are uh, phenomena of liquefica liquefaction that cause uh, people being detached from such vital uh, places everything that it was known back then back you know in the past now is confused or not very clear anymore so what is different what is foreign or what is non what cannot be planned is before us all of this can be seen for example when it comes to uh, refugees to uh, gender relationships and to uh, the digital war along the urbanization of modern societies there's a, 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 there's a sort of exodus from cities caused by stress and economic 
uh, acceleration. Young people uh, just leave, for example, the city of Hamburg, living in uh, apartments, and do workshops or eat uh, vegan slow food. All this shows how today's life in the cities are is characterized by heterogeneous and extraneity uh, experiences. According to Sigmund Bauman, it's and to in inequivocity. So we have the problem of how people can handle ambiguities. Such relationships must be uh, renegotiated all along. Second point, uh, you certainly recognize St. Stephen here, the St. Stephen Church. It's about fluid churches. So churches are subject to this sociological liquefaction and this uh, brings about, this changes uh, their even possibility of existence. And churches are experiencing the end of their social supremacy, except for uh, monumental uh, buildings. And these churches are always uh, more marginalized. They have no longer the social uh, power and monopoly when it comes to uh, social life. And they, they always have less and less uh, believers in, in the churches. And church is always more ambiguous and more fluid and less binding. The concept of, concept of transcendence and faith are becoming more fluid. The, we all have access to uh, religious archives and the interpretation of religious uh, thoughts is just is about what how single people interpret them. Faith loses its structures and it becomes important as a sort of potential event. So something that it has to be, but cannot be at the same time. It's, this is a new experience for churches, the f and especially the fact that the importance of religions, of religion for many people nowadays is no longer fundamental in their lives. Being a Christian or being religious is becoming radically more, uh, it's, it's no longer uh, mandatory, let's say. All of this becomes a huge uh, challenge for churches because community uh, considers them a sort of fluid network. This network is is characterized by the just weak links and uncertain boundaries. Uh, Bruno Latour, the French philosopher, described it as network theory, uh, sorry, uh, actor network theories, and is interested in how these actors create innovations in this network. For him, these actors can not only be people, but can also be artifacts and things that at the same time are part of a network in which uh, all, all sorts of uh, surprising things can can be can come up come about in this network. You can only act in a relation in a relational way, and not in an institutional way, and that sh is an incredible and radical change for uh, the classic forms of power within the church. What does that mean? What what is this? liquefaction for when it comes to the church point of view.
the church's point of view. But um, what is the purpose of the church? The third point is letting yourself touched by the vulnerability of life. This form of communication that has been transformed in, in, in an incredible way. And it challenges city churches to become uh, more uh, temporary and to renounce to their uh, supremacy. By doing this, church has to go back to its real mission, that is taking care of all humans. As the pastoral constitution says, joy and hope, uh, power and fear of today's uh, humans, especially among people and oppressed of all types. Also the joy and the hope and the fear of the church as well. This mission, uh, you know, make, uh, you know, the church has to uh, look more towards people than just to look for its survival. This is the so-called change of perspectives. Such existence can only be uh, true if there are spaces to meet up with people and to meet with other people and to meet with strangers. So one of the missions of the church is to facilitate having such spaces. And this, uh, all sorts of uh, church architectures should do the uh, she should help in this. Only meeting the people's uh, uh, what is what matters, as the Bible says. Uh, it's so it's just about you know risking being touched by uh, other people's uh, lives. You know, blind people get their sight back. Uh, people with uh, limbs uh, go back walking, as the Bible says. Leave, we have to leave people free. Behind all of this, there's an, an attitude that is not... Uh, it's not aggressive, but it's about letting yourself touched by this dynamic meeting and taking uh, take responsibility when it comes to human care. Uh, the, the theological, the Parisian theology, theological uh, it, it defines, it, the, he says that it's not about having the goodness first and then the church, but the church is formed by people that are forms of being present. We run the risk of ruining, uh, uh, just, just making about rituals and uh, laws and uh, habits. All, all of this, of course, is useful to life, but However, everything manifests itself every time there's an event of faith when it comes to uh, believing in life. Because believing in life, unfortunately, is not something that is available uh, this this attitude when it comes to lack of purpose and uh, in the presence of this free of the pressure of, of the church's mission. So the purpose of the church is to facilitate having these uh, meeting spaces 
that allow people to enter life. And the word of God is uh, understood as trusting life and believing in life and just trusting everyone unconditionally. And the last, we have the last point, non-intentional presence in the social environment. We could call it social space as well. But in a, when it comes to a neighborhood, I would like to say, uh, I would like to use the word environment. All of this can happen in in the in a liquid society, meaning in such network. Unfortunately, this network doesn't work through exclusion but inclusion. In order to uh, reach this objective. Uh, churches have to move from their position of superiority to a position of weakness in the social context of the cities. Uh, together with all the stakeholders and uh, neighbor uh, uh, representatives need to guarantee uh, respect of, of life in the neighborhood. All these stakeholders take the responsibility of having a uh, having of finding a, a new uh, way to uh, you know to to be respectful of each other life conditions and uh, looking for uh, people's interests are the guidelines of social environments in the cities. The objective is to develop and to promote and expand resources and personal potentials of the of these places. But what is the purpose of the uh, church in, in such environment? The specific characteristic of churches in social environments of the city is a a non-intentional presence. That is the space uh, of the, of, it's about these meeting spaces that allow people to enter life. It's not about a presence that wants to take back its territory that it was lost, but meetings, in order to have meeting spaces, we need to, have a presence that does not just uh, does not take power through force and does not force itself on people, but uh, this but this this participation and meetings are born from a sort of learning from other people. This non-intentional presence in a Christian sense means means being a non-conditional presence and, and it's about recognizing an unconditional way the other it doesn't expect anything in return. I think that the Christian contact with other people is characterized by a position of weakness in which you um, you take as an approach that does not that does not impose itself on others, but it's about. Uh, Sort of non, uh, un sort of unconditional uh, presence. It's like a church that allows meeting spaces to to you know for people to to meet. It's yeah. You know, it's like as you said before. It's giving space for everyone to meet up. There's this presence in in the social environment of a city doesn't mean to renounce having a proper uh, space for the church. 
the mission of the church is no longer exclusive and it's not about being a, monop a monopoly, but it's about cooperation and participation in social in the social space. It's it's not limited anymore to the space of the church. Hospitality, I'm almost over, just a minute left. Hospitality could become. could become a symbol of the Christian presence in the city because it you know creates a place where life is heard and shared not just in a spiritual way but not also in a physical way according to Jacques Derrida the philosopher, French philosopher unconditional hospitality would be even more uh, underlined when uh, the guest becomes the host and the host becomes the guest. All this would be the uh, presence that, you know, shows itself to the other without any uh, condition. I'll go back to the beginning, the center of uh, pastoral assistance in essence is in this, uh, glass box in the city this uh pastoral uh, workers are inside and outside this box without any particular intention it's a place for uh, people can drink a glass of water can have a cup of coffee the organization of uh, that helps uh um, um that helps uh uh the poor Asked for this place to uh, serve food once a week in this place. Just one question left, though: Who is going to be the um, the owner of this place, and who's going to be sorry? Who's going to be the host, and who's going to be the guest in this place? Thank you. That's a uh, bad. Thank you very much, Ben Hildebrand, for your speech. Yeah, Martina Baer. Uh, Martina Baer is Professor of Fundamental Theology at the Catholic Faculty of the University of Graz. Her research is strongly rooted uh, uh, in art, art history, and in particular, she studied religious spaces in a period of climate change. Uh, she's also editor of the yearbook of the European Society of Women in Theological Research, and today, uh, her contribution is titled Between Self-Discovery and Dialogue, Multi-Faith Houses as Sacred Spaces in Post-Secular Cities of the 21st Century. She will deal with uh, multi-faith uh, centers uh, and ecumenical experiments in shared uh, religious buildings. So I leave the floor to you. Thank you very much. And please stick to 20 minutes. So thank you very much for this kind introdu introduction and uh, ciao a tutti. I will uh, give the lecture in English uh, because I just uh, speak Spanish but understand in Italian very well. But um, my Italian is not so good to <laughs> give a lecture in this language. For me, it's a pleasure to speak to you in this wonderful city and in this inspiring conference. In my lecture, I am interested in the question of which sacred buildings of the 21st century can make uh, transformation processes towards de-churching and religious pluralization architecturally visible and what they mean. I think that multi-religious buildings are a good reflection of these religious transformation processes in our Western European societies. This lecture will therefore focus on this new type of sacred building, which in my opinion moves spiritually between self-discovery and dialogue, because the architecture of these post-secular sacred buildings is not only intended to serve self-discovery, like the former Bauhaus director Lud Ludwig Mies van der Rohe defined sacred buildings in modernity, 
but also to provide a space for dialogue. I will explain why in a moment. In the early 1950s, the Bauhaus architect built a small car chapel on the campus of Illinois Institute of Technology in Chicago. It has the form of a simple cube made of bricks with a glassed entrance front. In a statement on Mies van der Rohe's car chapel, he admits that architecture should be contemporary, which for him also meant using latest technology and materials, as well as the impossibility of reproducing forms from the past eras. He goes on to say that it is a simple, completely unspectacular chapel, but one that is grand in its smallness and noble in its simplicity. This kind of simplicity and uh, quiet grandeur should enable modern people to lift their wings spiritually and mentally. This is connected with the hope of finding oneself because in the anthropology of uh, modernity, men get lost or um, is uh, suffering from uh, a suffering of self alienation so this kind of simplicity, simplicity we can uh, find now in uh, some buildings of these multi-religious houses. We have seen a growing phenomenon in recent years. New multi-religious houses of worship have been opening in big cities on a regular basis. In Berlin, for instance, the House of One is being set up or in December 2014, the House of Religious Dialogue of Cultures opened in Switzerland. These multi-religious houses aim to inspire interreligious dialogue through communal events on interreligious topics. More than that, these multi-religious houses intend to involve the public life of the city in their dialogue as a way of dissipating xenophobic prejudices against people of other religions and cultures and of promoting social cohesion within a multicultural urban population. Furthermore, they ex explicitly want to come in dialogue with the post-secular cities. The concept, oh, sorry. The concept of the post-secular city of Justin Beaumont and Christopher Baker draws attention to the boundaries of the secularization thesis and points to the increasing pluralization of religion and belief systems prevalent in the major cities of the West. Plur pluralization is caused by post-colonial immigration. And multi-religious houses, like that in Bern, wants to give ethnic and religious minorities in a large city a dignified space in which to practice their religion um, in community. To give you an idea, I would like to show you a short video in which a Hindu priest and an Ethiopian Orthodox Christian woman of the House of Religion in Bern introduce you to their sacred rooms. So... Yes, please. Um, can you? Yeah. So you see the Hindu temple? That's the entrance of the House of Religion in Bern. The Hindu temple, the entrance of the Hindu temple. Buona giornata a tutti. Me chiamo Tarmalingam Sasikumar. Questo è il mio nome. Però mio nome corto sono Sassi. Io lavoro qui in el Casa della Religione, dove qui in Berna otto religioni del mondo viviamo insieme. Io sono un cucinero per la cucina vegetariana, anche facciamo ayurvedic, però 
una volta è entrato qua un ebreo, il rabbino degli ebrei, lui ha detto, mmm, esso sono buonissimo, però io non posso mangiare qua perché mancava una, uh, um, un certificato della Kashrut. Io non ho capito cosa significa questa Kashrut. Lui ha detto, noi eh, ebrei abbiamo bisogno di questa patente, dopo possiamo mangiare anche qua. Allora abbiamo insieme fatto una patente della Kashrut. Io sono l'unica prete del mondo, c'è una patente della Kashrut, questa è la mia cucina qua. Um, noi viviamo insieme, tutti otto religioni del mondo qua, in il caso delle religioni. Qui in Berna e in tutta la Svizzera abbiamo 23 tempi di Hindus, per questo della prima uh, uh, tempio sono molto bellissimi. Questo noi, uh, um, io sono molto contento, lavoro con questo progetto, perché questo è l'unico progetto del mondo dove la otto religioni del mondo vive insieme, i nostri fratelli, con altre religioni. Qualche volta abbiamo tutta la Hindu insieme, entrato nella eh, chiesa dei cristiani, qualche volta andiamo tutti insieme nella mosca della musulmani, così viviamo tutti insieme qua. So, questo della, uh, significa per il mondo, il primo proget uh, progetto dove i nostri fratelli tutti sono uh, un'altra religione, un altro paese, è uguale a quelle lingue che noi parliamo, però il nostro cuore, cuore per tutti sono uguali qua. My name is Yan Siac Abubau, I'm 17 years old and I'm from the Ethiopian Orthodox Father Church in Bern. Uh, I'm a Christian since my childhood and I go to Bible lessons and sing religion songs. And the Ethiopian Orthodox Father Church in Bern was established in 2004 and moved from Peter's Church to House Religion in 2014. Since then we have a private place called the altar and the rest of the room we share with the seven other denominations. And share the room with the others bring a lot of opportunities. We can interact with them and encourage our members also participate in different cultural and religious programs. And the Ethiopian Orthodox Bible Church has also certain rules. For example, we are not allowed to wear our shoes in the church and also not allowed to drink or eat. Um, but these rules are accepted and respected by the other Christian communities and also by the Hosseri Governor. And we are very happy to have this chance. And we hope, I hope in the future, that the other generations and also the young generation participate and involve themselves in the Pulsar by representing our religion. Okay, stop the video. So, um, I want to go to the next slide, but if I um, press the button next, um, it goes on with the video. So, can you help me? Yeah, thank you. So if we analyze this phenomenon together with the new socio-religious approach of uh, refiguration of society in late modernity, which has been developed by Berlin sociologist Martina Löw and Hubert Knoblauch, and which analyzes social transformation processes, then it becomes clear that the emergence of these multi-religious houses is a response to the contemporary religious and cultural situation situation of late modern societies, especially in big cities. The concept of uh, refiguration switches the focus to the reconstruction of the social order and hence also to the organizing principle of late modernity. The two sociologists see the cause of refiguration in a conflict between two spatial logics. On the one hand, the centralistic logic of hierarchically structured organization of business, government, and culture, um, which tend towards a homogen homogenization of social space. On the other, the logic of late modern societies characterized by flat hierarchical uh, network structures, such as heterogeneous and hybrid spatial arrangements. Thus, the refiguration of modernity 
is uh, described by Löw and Knoblauch as a consequence of the conflict between these two spatial logic, each of which can be analyzed empirically. In other words, the refiguration concept is intended to encompass the social tension that exists between contradictory tendencies, a tension-filled conflict that ultimately leads to transformations. On the one hand, there is a discernible social tendency towards flat, interconnected, and egalitarian social relationships, institutions, and institu institutional orders, which is associating with the opening and transgression of spaces and spatial structures and a transnationalism of uh, subjects and collectives through communication, tourism, commerce, migration, and so on. On the other hand, there is a recognizable tendency towards uh, a, revi a revi um, re revitalization and accentuated marking of modern territorial spaces, which emphasizes local, regional, or national boundaries and national identities. And so if these two uh, extreme characterism of figuration come into contact in uh, society, um, they lead to a transformation, synthesis, or conflicts in societies. So um, one of these sociologists, Hubert Knoblauch, is also um, a religious sociologist, and uh, he adapted this conflict um, this um, uh, concept to the field of religion, and he recently published a collection of essays on this subject. And uh, now Knoblauch uh, says that uh, we can see these tendencies also in the fields of religion, um, and he says that in institutionalized religions are less inclined to compete with each other, but tend rather to cooperate, for instance, in the area of interreligious dialogue um, or in uh, spiritual care. And so we can say multi-religious houses can be interpreted as an indicator for the refiguration of religious in the late, late modern societies of the West. So now if we turn to the house of religion in Bern, um, we can say that the architectural heart of the house is the so-called dialogue space, which is available for interreligious and intercultural um, education, family and youth work, exhibition, lectures, roundtable discussions, um, and various cultural events, as well as the culinary offering of the Vanakan restaurant, uh, uh, which, you, uh, which has been showed in, in the video. And um, also for the city's population, um, this house is opened and, um, of course, for all uh, religious uh, believers. So the House of Religion, which is organized as an association, has formulated um, its, inten its intention as more than just a peaceful coexistence, rather as a laboratory for living together. It wants to invite all interested parties, including people who do not consider themselves religious. And uh, they try to cultivate an intercultural and interreligious dialogue. So um, uh, you see here uh, the front, um, uh, the floor plan, and it's a, sorry, it is very small, but it gives you an impression um, how it is um, structured or how the architecture is, uh, structures. The House of Religion was opened in December 2014 and is uh, a uni unique project in Europe in terms of uh, its specific concept. It is unique because the House of uh, the House it is not only a place for encounter and dialogue between uh, different religions and cultures, but also because the various religious communities based in Bern maintain a, a sacred space there. Hindus, Muslims, Christian, Alevis, and Buddhists practice their own religion here in a homogene uh, sacred uh, space. 
Bern's Jewish community, the Baha'is and Sikhs, do not have a sacred space there, but are involved in the dialogue and cultural program and uh, are active in the board of the House of Religions Association. The concept of the House of Religion is explicitly about ensuring that religious minorities in the city of Bern in particular have a sacred space in which they can practice their religion in a dignified manner and live out their everyday, everyday religious life. In addition, the House of Religion is obliged by its service contract with the city of Bern to make a contribu contribution in the areas of education, culture, and integration. In this way, it also contributes to the enhancement of neighborhood. It even radiates beyond the city limits and has already attracted many non-Swiss uh, visitors and interested parties, including famous public figures such as the Dalai Lama in 2016. It has also received many awards for its work, as you can imagine. Once the funding was secured for this building, the groundbreaking ceremony took place in June 2012, and the actual design of the building began to take shape. The design of the individual sacred spaces was left to the participating religion communities themselves, which had uh, to organize themselves a separate um, association under the umbrella association of the house of religion. The operational concept provides for the religious communities to be auto autonomously responsible for their own pr uh, premises and to finance them. The umbrella association is mainly concert concerned with the um, premises for dialogue. The House of Religion is managed by a permanent team that is responsible for the various organizational areas and the cultural program and uh, is itself a multi-religious and multicultural organization. As already mentioned, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, Christians and Alevis have a sacred space in the house of religion. On the ground floor are the Hindu temple and the mosque, each with around 500 square meters, as well as the Buddhist prayer room with around 200 square meters. On the first floor are the derga of the Alevis with approximately 160 square meters and an ecumenical uh, ecumenically maintained church room for roughly the same size. The architects Stefan Graf and Madia Shah contacted the religious communities for the design of the sacred spaces in order to understand their needs. This resulted in a separate dialogue process as the architects recall, I quote it, it was a very process oriented work and a tough one. Uh, at that. We wanted to develop a, a typology with migrants who hardly speak any German, a typology that doesn't yet exist. The meetings were very lively and the wishes were often contradictory. Some wanted to bury their dead, the dead in their prayer room. Others felt that this would pollute the building. Some wanted to hold processions around their temple. Others did not accept that the path also led around their prayer room. Some did not want a common roof. Others did not want a common wall. And this after so many years of project work in constant dialogue. We had to keep insisting that they uh, question their ideas and make, and make compromises. We needed a lot of patience to bring this process to an end. At the center of the building is the so-called dialogue area. And now I show you some pictures of that, um, which as the name suggests, offers space for dialogue between people with their different religions, cultures, and worldviews and covers over 1000 square meters. So you can see the importance of this room. Mm -hmm. 
the large dialogue area has a hall on the ground floor, a room for children, and uh, the Vanakam restaurant and a seminar room on the first floor. This, form, this forms the ar architectural center of the building. The individual sacred spaces can be accessed from the dialogue room. This is where everyday encounters automatically take place between the individual believers, the staff of the permanent team, which has an open plan office on the first floor, and visitors who either want to visit the building, eat in the restaurant, or take part in the events on offer. With this large entrance hall on the ground floor, the dialogue room has the effect of providing enough space for many ideas, beliefs, and cultures, and invites interfaith dialogue. However, interfaith dialogue does not only take place in the context, context of events, but also, and perhaps especially, in everyday life together. The former managing director noted in an interview that dialogue about other religions and cultures often takes place in seemingly unspectacular in sit uh, situation and topics of everyday life. This leads to a closer look to the role of the dialogue space as a space for social interaction. Um, the multifunctionality and size of the dialogue space um, designed by the architects Madia Shah and Stefan Graf show that it is uh, highly relevant and intended to promote dialogue between be uh, people. Uh, Madia Shah comments, I quote, this space in the middle, the dialogue area is essential. It belongs to everyone. It is an open and logic public space that is not only occupied by religion. This is where building unfolds its social impact. Architecturally, the house of religion is also open to the urban community as, uh, as it is part of a large building complex that is used for a mixture of flats, offices, and shops, and is located on Europaplatz in Bern, a square with excellent uh, transport links. A large glass facade decorated with arabesque-like ornaments is intended to provide public transparency on the one hand and protect space for dialogue on the other. Madhya Shah calls this use uh, as a transfer program because it is intended to drive the exchange between public and private sphere and encourage passengers um, um, uh, and encourage uh, passers-by to enter the building. The architect and journalist Andres Herzog summarizes the underlying intention of the exchange in the architecture magazine Hochparterre like that. The dialogue area works both spatially and in terms of content. People come together here, exchange ideas, get to know each other's culture, and their own. The transparent architecture supports this osmosis, allowing many possibilities in one space. And the physical presence of the people um, plays uh, naturally an important role. And this leads to refiguration of um, religious ideas in, um, in, uh, in some believers. And so, um, I give you an example of a refiguration of religious. Um, one Christian um, uh, believer who um, often it, uh, attends other um, uh, spiritual practices of the Buddhists and the Hindus said that um, in this interaction, um, she recognized herself what it is to be a Christian. And she said uh, that she discovered um, the Christian faith in this um, dialogue situation more than ever before. And um, she pointed out that uh, um, Jesus or God in, um, is incarnation of um, um, uh, Jesus in, is an incarnation of God. Um, that uh, this um, theological point uh, was getting very important for her. Um, in this direct interfaith um, uh, community or space which the house of religion presents. So I come to a conclusion. The emergence of multi-religious houses can be seen as an indicator of refiguration of uh, religion in late modern societies. 
to the kind of architecture of the house of religion in Bern allows the participating religious communities a shared place in which they can move about within the tension between a religious homogeneity and heterogeneity. Third, between self-discovery and dialogue, the spatially generated tension between homogeneity and heterogeneity sets in motion process of processes of religious refiguration. And uh, fourth, in the best scenarios, these processes will in turn have repercussions for the society in terms of social cohesion. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Martina Bear, for uh, this final uh, speech of the first session before the coffee break. I would like to give you a very brief technical communication. A technical communication. So the debate is at the end. We will have a long session where the issues will be uh, asked. We will have time to ask questions to the speakers of this morning's session. Line connection. We, they can share questions by the program, by the Zoom window. We have many attendees, more or less 50 at the moment, but they will become more and more. So they can interact with us, writing, typing down their questions in case. E una Another piece of information for those who are here. I remind you that for the speakers and the representatives of the sponsoring uh, entities tonight we'll have a dinner so a bus will take us to the Sandisma church the so-called church of the good thief one of the most recent churches in Bologna after participatory uh, path and after the visit we'll have dinner so for this dinner we still have 10 uh, places available. So, whereas anybody not part of the group I mentioned is interested to partake, you can uh, subscribe Federica Fulini. You can contact Federica Fulini during lunch break. And there is a fee for those who are not in the invited group. So, thank you very much. And... Have a nice coffee break. See you in 20 minutes sharp. So at 12.15, here sitting down in the room. Thank you very much. Encompass the diversity of European culture and identity. This religious heritage is an invaluable resource that is handed over to us for all generations to enjoy. It is all around us and an integral part of our lives and communities. It includes rich cultural traditions, masterpieces of art, wonderful craftsmanship and extraordinary music. In an era of globalization, cultural heritage helps us to remember our European cultural diversity and its understanding develops mutual respect and contributes to dialogue amongst different cultures. The future of religious heritage presents us with challenges and opportunities. Knowledge transfer and innovation will be needed to hand over this remarkable patrimony to future generations. From the creative reuse of historic buildings, to educational opportunities, from both real and virtual tourism, to strengthening communities. The value of religious heritage is almost limitless. It is up to us to make the most of its potential. Since 2011, Future for Religious Heritage, a European network, has brought together charities, conservation experts, governmental, religious and university institutions, as well as other professionals. FRH is a non-faith, not-for-profit organization that draws its strength from its diverse network. Our mission is to understand the challenges facing religious heritage, as well as the opportunities it presents to develop solutions for the 21st century. 
Our ambition is to maintain a network of European organizations with a strong structural framework for ongoing intercultural exchanges regarding the protection, conservation, and management of religious heritage. This network is open to you. Please join us now. Let's start. The religious topography of German cities has been diversifying for centuries in terms of social spaces of faith. For the longest time, however, this had only a marginal impact on the urban structure. The built presence of religions and the denominations became only felt during the last decades. This coincides with the decline of church attendance in the two major churches and challenges the established Christian congregation to preserve places and spaces of faith and community within the contested real estate market while going on carrying inherited responsibilities, be these social, religious, cultural, or architectural. It asked them to ponder interaction with a heterogeneous urban society at the same time. I will discuss phenomena of conceptual or spatial ch changes concerning the use of the parish hall and its adaptations on new designs as a means to cope with changes of the religious topography of the city and the social role of Christiani Christianity today. My argumentation uses but four examples which are representative of the manifold approaches to this issue that we found in the course of a larger research project in cooperation between architecture and religious studies. We analyzed churches, synagogues, and mosques who underwent architectural or functional changes during the last three decades by synthesizing quantitative and qualitative data. You see here on the slide the team that got involved in this endeavor um, on the lower up. You see the religious studies uh, team from Bochum. And on the um, lower right, um, the, the team from architecture at the TU Dortmund, we cooperated in our search and uh, our, our aim to understand uh, the changes in, in German um, urban topography. Uh, the, the really youthful faces uh, are the student assistants who uh, bore the, the major load in collecting the quantitative data and keeping the database uh, running there. Without them, it wouldn't have been possible. I brought a book, which is, can, can cycling around this, the room, um, which contains our results. Um, you can have a digital copy online if you like to, or uh, if any of you read German, sadly it's in German, um, I can send you a copy if you want to. So this was the, the, the PR part. <laughs> so, the project aimed to collect best practice solutions addressing the pressure of heritage protection, real estate dynamics, or the gentrification respective marginalization of neighborhoods. We compiled more than 1,000 cases of building activities in churches and parish centers, ranging from installing a wheelchair access to repurposing a former church as a dwelling or a gym, from restructuring a former supermarket to workshop space, um, to attention grabbing new designs in church architecture. What you see here are some numbers. Um, I can talk about this more if, if you are interested and some screenshots from the database. Between these extremes, we found a broad variety of approaches to balancing the spatial and social needs of the congregations. In moving beyond single cases and beyond single faith or specific organizational bodies, our data allows to discuss patterns of coping with this shift in significance that Christian parishes experience today. Um, what we have, what the, the, the samples I choose are all of communities who did not inherit 
medieval churches, but had to work towards having their own spaces of faith, usually after World War II, and are now trying to cope with the, with the results of, of having failing architecture or, or contested urban space. So let's start with one example. This is St. Martin. In Aachen, um, Roman Catholic, um, the, the, the church was de designed in the, in the 1950s um, and extended afterwards. Um, you see the, the, the main room of the church, uh, the, the later added uh, bell tower, and here the, the community hall, the parish hall, um, which was designed in, in um, 1966. <clears throat> the church was profaned uh, in 2006 after a long search for uh, uh, a special solution for a dwindling community and handed over to a um, evangelical, free evangelical community. What you see here is the, the uh, renovated church on the left side in the use of, of Weinyard Aachen, um, which underwent renovation since 2005. And this community, okay, uh, of course, adopted the inherited space or the, the board space to its own needs, because of course they need a community hall, a parish hall, maybe a, a accommodation for a priest in the within the building um, themselves. And on the right hand, you see the today's St. Martin in Aachen um, because the, the Roman Catholic community moved into their own parish hall. We furnished this to become a Catholic church again. It did a community space and uses, uses is this uh, since 2005. Here you have, uh, we have uh, images um, upper left, the original interim space of the community hall. Uh, the, the lower left, you see the interior of the community hall today refurnished to serve as a space of workshop with, the, with all the proper uh, liturgical processes. One example that shows how a church, the place moves, the church community moves the space of worship into the community hall. Now we look at an example the other way around. This is the uh, um, Protestant community church um, dedicated to Melanchthon or named to, uh, after Melanchthon in Hanover, um, similarly built in the 1950s early 1960s, and as many communities, they had a problem that they needed to, to renovate the church but didn't have the funds to do so. And they solved the problem by selling the parish hall. But what to do when you have the, the functions of the parish hall but no parish hall no longer? Um, they moved the parish hall into the, uh, the church. Um, the, the photograph, is, is uh, in two parts because uh, this is of course the main church and here on the right side hmm, da, is, the, is the, the bell tower which really dominates the neighborhood but it's impossible to photograph um, in relation to the church. So there was an, an architectural, uh, a professional architectural office, of course, involved. And if you if you have fun to do so, uh, Google this this project, and there is a Flickr account that shows many 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 photos from the building process, where you can see uh, um, heavy machinery in the middle of the nave during the building uh, building process. So this is the the church in some more detail. This is how it looked like before the refurbishment. You see the, the, the walls show a, a cross and all the arms of the cross were used as place of worship in, initially. And then in the process of, of refurbishment, um, the, the, the cross arms, except for the altar area, were closed up for different 
community uses stacked above each other, meeting rooms, winter chapel, kitchens, offices. And by now, the community reduced, um, has still left this, this area um, for, for worship, and they changed from fixed pews to mobile chairs. And the chairs are mixed up from different sizes and colors and, and shapes, which makes it really easy um, to refurnish the room, as we saw with uh, earlier presentation as well. And of course, it makes it totally easy to include wheelchairs or a stroller in the congregation during worship without disturbing the 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 mobilia of the of the uh, room. What changes in this case is the urban space around the church. I got only involved in in collecting data on this church really late, but um, if one studies the environment around the church, uh, which you see uh, of course in the right here. This is the bell tower. And I think that this building, this building lot in, um, housed the, the parish hall initially. And this was sold and uh, to, to an investor and there is housing now, which means that the area between the church and the parish hall and the public space is no longer as big as it was before. So the, the churchyard, so to speak, shrunk. Of course, if you see this environment, you see that the still the church is still really present in this neighborhood, and probably people will not feel that the, the the contribution of the church to the public space shrunk, especially the neighbors who have been there for decades will probably not feel this, but actually it shrunk because this is now private space of some private investor. This is, I think, a, a really important element of this um, the, the shift we experience at the time. So, third church, we, we already had this this morning. This is uh, Trinity Church in Leipzig, um, seen from the from the urban area uh, across a really busy crossing um, of a street uh, aptly named Martin Luther Ring. Um, which is a bit funny for a Catholic church. So this is Roman Catholic. And the building is a replacement uh, for, a, let's say, structurally challenged uh, former church building of the same community. There is an intensive, uh, intense uh, history of uh, GDR church policy, policy at uh, her to this. So if you are interested in this, there are some publications. Um, the community was able to build there. You see the, the, the red triangle in the in the lower part of the of the map. The first church was the was the the, the, the blue one vis-a-vis. -vis. The second church was the blue one in the upper upper north. Um, and now the community built the third church in 150 years. And they hope that it's to be the last for quite a while. It was designed uh, 2013 by Schulz and Schulz, a local uh, architectural office. What they do is that they group all the functions in, around the courtyard, they invert the urban space. And the last is the Church of Salvation in Kohl Weiden Pesch which replaced two parish churches, I need to be faster, um, on one slot, selling one lot to finance the structure of the new building. And they include all the function in this tower-like structure that you see here on different floors with different function. It's like a Tetris. Um, it was just, just finished uh, last year. And you, there, there are many more uh, photographs in Cologne. What do we learn from this? 
The four examples show different challenges and solutions involving the parasols. It becomes evident, even more so in the face of many more examples in our data set, that the parasol can serve as an architectural wildcard to address spatial and social needs of the congregations, both inwards and outwards. Shrinking communities might reincorporate functions of worship, parish life, and even caritas into a single building. Others replace their building in which separate functions, but in spatial relation to each other and the surroundings, ensuring more flexibility of use. Heritage law and custom often protect existing church buildings, while kindergartens interlink in larger social context and are similarly limited. Thus, the parish halls and rectories allow for negotiation of spaces and function as soon as the congregation is no longer able or willing to manage the status quo. Some research, as well as conference papers in Germany, hint to, towards the closing of ranks within the communities, a retreat behind the walls of the parish center to lick the wounds inflicted by the loss of social significance. Others underline the efforts to create spaces for urban activity in which parish and neighborhood mingle, inviting local belonging beyond faith, parish, and social responsibility, especially with the designs of new buildings. However it may be, the data collection, as well as the fistful of case studies, show the complex, often contradicting requirements for parish centers in terms of architectural and social embedding. As such, Parishes wishing to stay connected to their surroundings face new responsibilities quite similar to the religious minorities searching for spaces of their own at the same time. As theorists and practitioners, we are therefore called upon to go further beyond the Christian churches alone to recognize the role of religious communities for the urban structure, both structurally and socially, and to support their work for urban coexistence. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much, Professor Löffler, for this interesting contribution. And now from Germany, we can move to Milano. E invito qui a dare il proprio. So I'd like to invite Francesca Dapra on stage, who will present a work titled Churches, Cities and Communities, Ambrosian Parish Complexes Between Identity and Transformation in the Contemporary City. Francesca Dapra is an architect and PhD, She's a research fellow at the uh, ABC department of uh, uh, the Polytechnical Sc uh, School of Milan and adjunct professor at architecture and technology at the School uh, of Architecture in Milan. She carries out training and research activities in the field of technological design with references to processes, methods, and tools for the regeneration and enhancement of the built environment. And since 2019, he, she has been collaborating with the Ufficio Nazionale per i Beni Culturali Ecclesiastici and Edisicuto of the Italian Episcopal Conference for the Paths of Participation for the Construction of New Churches in Italy. So I leave the floor to Francesca. Thank you very much and good morning. I'm sorry I don't have much voice, but I hope you'll hear me. So like to start with that, clearly it's a pleasure and an honor to be here today talking about these topics in front of many people that I hold in high esteem and who helped me in my research. So my speech today will be Churches, Cities and Community, because I think that it goes to the core of what I want to share with you. So I can't help but starting by remembering Monsignor Santi, who drove me in doing my research and without whom I wouldn't be where I stand right now. So. To begin, I would like to quote an excerpt that accompanied me since I discovered it, which is a text from 1962 of uh, Montini during the Milan of his, uh, when he was bishop, who said that no kind of building therefore has a popular origin like this, a collective one, a really social origin. These buildings are not just decorative monuments uh, in their perspectives, which are often oppressive and monotone of modern urban 
urbanism. They are houses of the people for its consolation, its concord, its faith, and its uh, goodwillness, goodwill. So my reflection is related to what we can call uh, parish complexes uh, in or parish compounds. So we've had many definitions in Italy, and one of the most exhaustive ones is one by Maria Antonietta Crippa, who defined them as complexes in which some residential buildings for the clergy and educational activities, cultural and service activities are grouped around their core, which is the church. The interpretation key driving my reading is to consider those buildings as a complex uh, system of building in a contemporary city, where the integration between the place of worship, which is the church, and all the related spaces, as well as the relationship that it has with the urban, cultural, and uh, city space, are a fundamental element to understand the nature and to promote its transformation. The history of these places, which is embedded with cultural and religious meaning, is intertwined with the city. And the management of this heritage implies a deep analysis on how to preserve collective memory and, at the same time, adapting these uh, spaces to the needs of contemporary times. So there are some questions. We've already asked some questions this morning. So how are these parish compounds made? Which is the articulation between the space of worship and the pastoral spaces? What is the relationship in local context? How to treat the great parish heritage that modern or ancient history gives us? And how to think about those architectures in contemporary culture? So we can't answer all these questions in 20 minutes, but I'll try to bring some essential topics. So as an introduction, I would like to point out that if I need to talk about Milan, the parish compounds persist in contemporary city as important spaces uh, for religion, society, education, and assistance of the local communities. So these uh, buildings are a living heritage which is still committed in the cities, but with some changes, with some variations in their some differences in their use and their preservation. In my opinion, parish churches have a different role compared to other sacred and ecclesiastic building. They are located at the center of very lively organisms and they ask for specific reflections on the adaptation and transformation, considering their meaning and their value in the uh, urban and social fabric of the city. So the role of the parish and the oratory as a sort of um, driver for cohesion is at the center of urban and pastoral research. In a city like Milan, these places are still fundamental for uh, the neighborhoods, and th which because they are often the only places of aggregation. They have a primary impact on young people, especially with regards to sports, but also a very high potential of inv involving different uh, communities and age ranges. But there is not much attention towards the artifacts that host this uh, liveliness leading to uh, unregulated or ephemeral uh, transformation processes which are related to the contingent needs. So we can briefly say that parish compounds are in the shadows of the reflections that interest the church and the churches. So I don't want to dwell too much on talking about the history of what we intend by a parish center and its own uh, architectural origin. But I would like to underline how much a reflection on the centers in the contemporary city cannot escape the, the uh, to understand the, the origin and their historic moment that here in Bologna, Milan and other Italian cities, the reflection on the role, the form, and the design of this project on the city has been developed in a determining way. When these artifacts were conceived according to the urban planning, creating a, a great um, hubs for uh, services and pastoral uh, hubs for the community. So the research I'm presenting 
were carried out on the city of Milan mostly, which was a fertile ground for many experimentations. Here there were some starting data and a consolidated bi bibliography on uh, uh, churches and parish centers, both ancient and new and modern. And this element where the base uh, of the research for the current assessment of this of these centers and the role in the contemporary cities. So the choice of focusing on a specific concept a context like Milan instead of dealing with the topic in a more uh, cross-cut way, which can be done, allowed to consider the relationship between the functional and ar and urban, architectural aspects with the uh, social uh, features of them. So we started with a sociological approach to define the urban, social and functional role and real estate role, and as well as the architectural and morphological aspects of the parishes. So on Milan, we carried out a mapping at an urban scale, which was started by the Diocese of Milan some years ago, and which was fine-tuned for the research. Secondly, a sample analysis has been done on several parish centers uh, which had, with a different uh, origin and geographical location, supported by maps, multi-criterial analysis, and uh, uh, moments of dialogue with the communities. So the outcome of the research was the awareness of the current state of the system, of the Ambrosian system, and its own characteristics. And... Uh, also, the development of a tool for analysis and read these artifacts that could uh, drive future transformation. So the research generated data, which I'm not presenting comprehensively, but which I use as a base to uh, present some issues. The first issue that I'm raising is the relationship of these centers with the neighborhoods. For their nature and their uh, real estate value, the parish center is collocated in its own context, so there are tools and methods with digital maps helping us reading the context and analyze the relationship between, among the uh, urban elements. So in this sense, there's a fundamental consideration. Parish centers are a, a full network of uh, real estate assets that are supposed to be in a dialogue among them. This reading is much more urgent at the pastoral level in an historical model where the lack of human resource implies uh, a different way to manage uh, assets and spaces. Think about pastoral units and the need to redistribute the uh, activity over spaces of different parishes. These processes must make use of the knowledge and the, understand and the understanding of a broad uh, system which goes beyond the individual parish church. If we see the parish in the, in the neighborhood and want to understand the interactions, we need to realize what is the fabric of services that is around it because it's different to think about a parish in a densely or not densely inhabited uh, area or with very few users. So we have a mapping of the parishes of Milan, their distribution in the neighborhoods, the interpolation with some demographic uh, data, like the map on the bottom right, like the quantity of young people living in those uh, uh, neighborhoods and the distance among uh, uh, the uh, parishes, which is a mesh that doesn't have more than 15 minutes walking from a parish to another. So here is, and you will see it repeating because that's the territory where we carried out many experiments, which is the uh, territory of Citta Studi in Milan, a, a parish in Milan in the university context with a uh, very high student population must wonder about its own nature, functional, social, pastoral, architecture, identity, service, etc. So here is a map on the bottom right that I had fun of tracing of like I. Uh, would have liked to do it on other parishes, but I haven't had the time. But we try to map where the participants to the activities of uh, of the teaching participate, and many of them are outside of the parish borders, and some others are in remote areas of the city. This is due to the everyday mobility of the citizens. So these are simple readings which suggest the relevance on thinking about the parish at the supra-local scale and how much the systematic knowledge of the heritage is a fundamental part for any future consideration. So what we see from an urban scale map 
doesn't say anything about the nature and the quality of this uh, of the centers. So another topic, another issue on which we started thinking about and which we can ask ourselves many questions is the organization of spaces, function and architecture, and in a certain sense of the typology of the parishes. By analyzing a sample on the uh, urban mesh, Taken, uh, from taken from different areas of the cities, we have a different a differentiated, a diverse panel of cases. So the bail of the uh, historic center, where there were some additions which were not homogeneous to the centers that were conceived as one, the, which are the one that match the times of Schuster and Montini and many other cases where the church building that has an historical and artistic value goes along with uh, low identity value uh, assets, which are still used and which are part of the life of local communities. So it's interesting to wonder about the relationship among the parts and how much these complexes interact in the consolidated urban fabric. Among these complexes, we have, well, ones analyzed by literature and the critique, which are historical or modern, and some of them and um, several of them dealt with the design of a, a city parish, but which needs a further analysis. So we have the topic of value, which is very interesting, but we unfortunately don't have the time to analyze. So a city like Milan is disseminated with churches and parishes of the second half of the 20th century, which is object of many misunderstanding and disaffection in uh, what is called a um, undetermined va value, which is related to their uh, early obsolence, obsolence um, well, in spite of the effective value for the communities. So many of these churches are about to be reconsidered. They need maintenance. They need to be adjusted for ceremonies, even though they were built recently after the uh, Vatican II and they should be put at the core of a specific debate. So going back to this in Citta Studi, here you see the church that is the uh, university chapel, even though we can't say it, uh, define it as a chapel due to its size, but it's a very low architecture value, even though there was a, a good project at the beginning, but it was uh, built with poor materials then, uh, with poor concepts then, it redefines its concepts in its context because it's now a youth church rather than a parish church where the participation to mass is just one of the moments that unites the Catholic students community in that place, suggesting um, several spatial uh, solutions. You can see uh, at the bottom some liturgic adjustments, but the case studies that we've seen this morning are very interesting from this perspective then. I'm moving to the conclusion I'm just mentioning because I think we can't escape it. Some aspects on the heritage and uh, the uh, enhancement of these elements. So the parish heritage is part of the church heritage, of the ecclesiastic church heritage, but it's a living heritage. It's active, it's transforming. And its main feature is to have a multi-purposedness, which makes it stand from other types. So what emerged, regardless of the historical origin and nature of the complexes of the centers, is that the differentiation of spaces and uses, these centers are made of underused spaces because they do not respond any longer to the needs of the territory or are used just in some times or days of the week. So here you see the analysis of a parish center in Milan when you see where the structure is used, the whole structure, not just the church. So on the one hand, we can find many parish centers, many parishes with spaces like uh, theaters that were built in every parish in, which are now abandoned. On the other hand, you have socially lively uh, parts where the church is underused or not used at all, or where you have redundant places of worship compared to the needs of the community. Think about the Milanese parishes where you have more than one church, subsidiaries or ancient churches that are not used every day. So we find ourselves and we will find ourselves a huge uh, heritage, a huge uh, number of assets which will need a repurposement. And these 
leads to many implications. So how to consider the parish complex where one of the parts would not function anymore? How to make the most of places of worship in these organisms that are going towards uh, scars or uh, use or no use at all? So I think this is fundamental without forgetting the, mm, the first thing I said. So to adapt, uh, to adapt this, uh, these structures towards an active reuse, we need to be aware of the territory and its needs in synergy with the planning of services, with cultural instances, and with the social vocation that the parish still holds. As you can see, I open some questions rather than uh, giving answers. So the research try to shed light on a, a system and inter interdisciplinary vision on um, parish centers starting from the fundamental interpretation okay, in considering these organisms as complex uh, building compounds in the city. So this is just one piece of knowledge, but I hope to show you uh, many other future research perspectives. So research shed light on the parish, a complex institution, whose spatial configuration cannot escape its origin and identity, which is social and collective, along with cultural and uh, of worship, which still is an account there being in the city and for the city, the values and the pillars of a culture of a cultural identity, which is profoundly Italian. So the nexus uh, parish and, and city, which is apparently weakened by the uh, lack of connection with the everyday life and the all factors of change, is still valuable, or at least a value to be discovered. I would like to conclude with a provocation on um, we, which we've already talked about. So to reconsider the parish compounds, the existing parish compounds also interrogates us in design terms. So which parishes are we giving to the future of cities? This is an answer that we can measure in a few years, but we hope it can go towards the direction of Montini uh, so that the churches and the uh, parish center can be houses of the people, which are uh, the keepers of beauty and uh, meaning for the city. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Francesca Dapra, for this very interesting uh, speech. So. I thank both the speakers of this second panel who stick to 20 minutes so we can take the time for some questions. So I would like to invite all the speakers of the morning session, the first and the second session, if you can come here to the stage. So Luigi, if you want to chair the questions, you can do so. It's a tattoo. So you already listened to many uh, interpretations, to many, many topics. This morning we've had theological, uh, liturgical and architectural uh, points of view. There are some considerations. Are there some remarks from the room? Are there some elements that come out? Are there some questions? There's a microphone and you can use that. Don't worry. Who's breaking the ice? There's a topic that has come out in the last speech that Francesca Dapra with her uh, conclusion. So, okay, let me open uh, the floor. So these topic, I think there's a topic on which we need to think about. So in, 
in cities that are increasingly international, you made a conclusion by quoting a perspective and ultimately an Italian identity. You used this expression on the Italianness of the aspects of the Italian culture that still come out of parish centers. So my question is, on the one hand, it is clear, it is clear that in the past also of recent past of newly founded cities that this is evident. So there's a trace. So this is a very evident element, but for the future and the present, I would like to ask you, what does it mean today? So is there a typical aspect of the Italian parish? which can be identified as a design tool, as a design element. I mean, with the examples we've seen today, that if we think about the cities, probably they are leading us to a more international horizon and at the same time, a more globalized one. And still at the same time, a more homogeneous one. Well, talking about uh, Middle Europe, or Central Europe. So this is my question. So the Project Horizon, what are the perspectives of the Project Horizon? So maybe this input is not just for you who spoke uh, this morning, but it's also for the audience. But this is a topic, this is a recurring topic. So what is the passage in the moment in which there's a huge tradition of the Italian landscape, and then this tradition is embedded in cities that are increasingly globalized. So how, where do you place the dialogue between uh, tradition, which is constructive, math material, spatial? And so this is my remark. I don't know if, it's, if it is an actual question, probably. Probably there's no answer. This is an input, I don't know how to call it. Well, it's a very tough question because it's a very tough issue. I see it in the university. So when we experiment, and Martino would, can talk, and Martina can talk about it. So when we experiment this uh, with international students in class at university, we have eighty percent of international students. So when we try to make them understand what it is like to place within a context in identity and tradition, this is a topic that has to be thoroughly analyzed, but I believe that for as much as globalization is part of the everyday life, I think that in these places or in some traditions that are construction, constructive, typological, morphological, call it whatever you like, but there are some points that can say something to the whole. So what do I mean? If we rediscover some founding pillars of some urban elements like the churches, I don't believe that they won't be uh, understood. So the topic is to see what are them, what are those elements that can enter in a dialogue with a uh, globalized landscape. But I don't think that this challenge lies in the homologation and knowing the founding value of these places and spaces, like how and when to work on the territory. And uh, so one thing is to get to a thing that can be here in Bologna or in New York, or working in a sense of comprehension with urban identity. I think this is a very important, uh, the more important thing, so we see glo globalization in the urban innovation processes, for example, in Milan, if we compare it, then the project like the ones we've seen in the Rogoredo area or other urban areas, they have the same identical criteria. They are repetitive also, enjoying open, open spaces. The introduction of this architecture can be the counterpart because it's a different measure compared to this repetitiveness that we've seen in 
urban innovation processes. And this is what we said about the measure against the mass that Schwarz indicated around a century ago. So between churches and metropolis. So that's fundamental, in my opinion. So I think that the analysis of these past experiences lead to understand what is the measure or, or the extent of the introduction of this kind of architecture. There are two questions. Let's hear the questions. I don't speak English, but I have a question for Professor Hildebrand, who's I like and uh, is I like this speech and he opened some horizons that are very present. He talked about participatory networks, he talked about being present without any particular intention of fluid churches, of letting of being touched by the vulnerability vulnerability of life. I think he's Austrian, he's from the Graz University. Probably it's a question that I can ask him and Albert Gerards. How much the German or Austrian Episcopate is aware of these issues? Thank you. that is the system of bishops is aware about these new trends, new needs in uh, ecclesial communities. <laughs> it's challenging. That's a great question. It depends on the bishops. It depends. In Austria and Germany, there's a big transformation merging several parishes together and there's this the concept that and there's still this concept of the 20th century uh, theology to continue uh, to uh, you know continue with church activities, but in a bigger space. And I think that this is the new idea. But theology was the old one. And therefore, all the issues on clericalism, for example, are, aren't solved. So we are going, we are pressing forward like this. So in my opinion, there's a feeling of many bishops that, there's, that there is an ongoing transformation, but without idea. The big problem is also in Rome. In Rome, they don't have any idea they don't know so they see that there is an ongoing um transformation there's a liquefaction but they don't have any idea that's the problem they don't know how to make the church go on under this problem so they put these problems aside but in my opinion It's also about the uh, exams that we, saw, that we saw in Cologne, for example. Uh, around uh, the subjects and the new churches where the architects start with a parish and there's a change of the church and also the pastoral changes, in my opinion. And in my opinion, this is a reciprocal process. the narrative of the parish is carried out there's a process and then there's a dialogue with the architect and this might start the process i've talked about so there are examples in the pastoral in which they start with this network that they say, as in Stuttgart, for example, in St. Maria, they say that we have a church. Do you have an idea? So that was a, their topic. And, uh, and they started in the neighborhood asking, what can we put in the church? And other uh, people received a key, a powerful key. So they left 
the monuments also for and their uh, and their assets for other people. So these are subjects starting from the grassroots. But you're right when you talk about the bishops. They the bishops they want to. To preserve, so it's hard to say, so I said it in the presentation, so it's hard to change the thought of the monopoly of the hierarchy. And so all the ideas of many bishops, so I uh, think how to save its power. So in my opinion, because I talked about uh, this weak position so it's, it's all about being humble. The church and the bishops only change if they start with being humble. And that's a second issue that I don't want to open right now. But Eucharistic and monarchic liturgy, which is celebrated each Sunday, and it's always about monarchy. So my question to the to those who do liturgy and also the architects. Do we want to build churches in a monarchic way or as a network? My final sentence is I'm very inspired by uh, this morning's speech. And then I want to talk to you later on because we need to start to open a dialogue together. We need to open a participatory di uh, debate with the people in the parishes, with theologists, with architects, and also with the bishops too. A uh, synodal process maybe. So I think there was another question from the audience. So I'd like to underline something that naturally, when we talk about liturgy, these conferences, these meetings show how much the communication register is very uh, helpful. I mean, so we can't talk about a liturgic gesture regardless of the sacred music and the architectural space. So when you uh, quoted a monarchic liturgy, this is built by the environment that the architects provide. Space sets the tone of the place. So we have two, three questions, three considerations, four. Well, for the complex topic that we are dealing with, a question that I've already asked myself on this. Talking about the theme of the complex, of the complex theme that I uh, that we are dealing with, and and which I wondered about seeing the territory and the churches and the provocation that Professor Dapra made. So there's a question I always asked myself. So in the past, to build a church, it took 100 years. Now you can uh, have uh, these new uh, buildings in three, four, five years. So, so we need to, to see this topic, how it should. So starting from different perspectives, starting from architecture and the urban fabric, and also thinking about a participatory process within a social fabric. So to make sure that this aggregation that we are trying uh, to uh, bring is also uh, promoted by the community, first and foremost. So the research that the professor has done must be done in a more sectoral way when you are about to design a new church. Because if this doesn't happen, this means that there is a disconnection between this ecclesiastic uh, structure and the urban fabric. So I don't want to talk about urban planning in a loose or tight sense, but I would like to say that this should be the main topic because we need to deal it at an architectural level 
according to the fact that many times I ask myself so whether the houses must be churches or the churches must be houses. So we need to, to summarize, otherwise we can get to the end. So let's have a round of questions and, uh, and remarks, and then we go back to the speakers. Please, we can't hear you. Speak louder. I was struck by the speech by Hildebrand, who referred to the informal character rather than the formal character and also the participatory character. So in the end, Christian communities at first were abusive. In a period where there is a growing secularization and also fragmentation of society, should we start over from scratch? But there are some traits, that some things that were done. So when I was young, I took part as almost as a misbeliever. I uh, participated in a meeting by Tese uh, Messeglen in Bien or Stuttgart, and we were hosted in those places that were churches. And you can do it when you're young. So for example, the, the example of reusing and uh, the repurposing of spaces that have a memory. You should not destroy them, but you need to renovate them or to remodel them with the use. Because we know that the grandmother's cupboard can stay in our home. So it's cooperative learning. So the institutions that are the school, it's the same. I mean, it's no longer about a non-monarchy top-down lecture. So there are some ideas that are communicated starting from the grassroots and not ex cathedra from or top down. So this one, you were clear enough. I think you were clear enough. And and you start. A new San Petronio. So, uh, you know, a church built from the grassroots with a crowdfunding. There's an answer by Professor Gerrards. We listened to him before giving the floor to the final two remarks or from the floors. Unfortunately, I haven't grasped the last example because it was too long, so I couldn't give the last example. So a church of my parish, St. Francis, it's a bipolar church with uh, seats and the uh, altar is mobile. So in this church, we do many things. There are people who do spirituality, special spirituality exercises. And then we had a dinner there. So, you know, the community lives in this church because it's a church which is a grassroots church. It's not a top-down church or or a clerical church, as the colleague said. So church or churches already exist, and communities exist. The community living in these churches exists. So. In our parish, we have, we are starting living in this church. Thank you very much, Professor Giovanni Leoni. Very quickly, I'm really uh, inspired by these inputs. So in a, well, I'm trying, I'm simplifying too much and I apologize for that, but in, in this city management framework, I see two trends on the one hand, the narrative of building of community building, which are fueled by the post-COVID area by the social media and these tools. So on one hand is this, the effort of building communities also in, a, in an artificial way. On the other hand, a strong trend towards dematerializing the city once again after 
the second generation plants that transformed it into something intangible, there was a coming back to physicality, but now we have the digital twin. So I hear talking about from this speech, I mean, talking about these places, which are places, and I'm saying an ugly word, as a core business, they have as a primary goal to build some communities and which are actually communities with a long tradition. So they are not artificially built with uh, determined process processes. So I heard the very interesting idea of uh, flexible spaces. There are topics that can be taken out of the specific issue. So my question is sharp. So how much the big models that we like, the post-war models, so how do you see some tables, some chances, some opportunities of intertwining the policies of the church related to the city, the society, with the with politics in a strict sense? So are there possibility of having common tables among these actions and the political action of those who rule the city, or are those tables lost and there are places where they can be rebuilt? I think that this is an urgent issue, seeing also the intervention in Milan, seeing this mapping of very solid networks. This, do this focal point enter the government of the city? Are there some debates? Well, let's listen to Professor Andrea Longhi. I would like to start over from your initial question on the Italian parish. Let's not forget that the Italian parish, it's an historical product which is quite recent, meaning that the great tension between a territorialist aspect, a lecture of the uh, and the reading of the ecclesia belonging has come out in the post-war uh, year. So in the international context, we have Jogjek, the workers' uh, society, the youth. So the Italian... The Italian choice is that, no, let's not join the uh, fight of classes, making a Christian um, class, but let's choose a territory as a territory of experience, because the key word was that the, the parish is interclass, so not the priest that is a student or comes from the factory, but we need a parish where the professor, the students, the worker, the teacher would meet uh, at sun on Sundays and they have an experience of a complex society and not a, a society divided by class. Now, translating it to your question, by liquefying classes, the real um, challenge is globalization, the second generation migrants or the following generations. So, I'm leaving the role as a story and I take uh, the one as sociologist. Are the parishes still the actual place of experience and meeting of the generation coming from different cultures? Because my question, because I repeat, traveling around Italy, uh, studying history and observing people in the churches and the gardens, it's not uh, rare to see the priest saying that parishes are places where different generations of new uh, Italian citizens experiment a spontaneous and natural co-living, co, co existence. So sorry to talk about my uh, personal experience. The football team of the Parish Community Centre from 11 starters has nine uh, people from Maghreb, from Northern Africa, and it's a good team. But I doubt that the sense of belonging to the parish is the one that it's an animator so uh very interesting that's a great group so it's great to joy but many are islamic orthodox so to do uh the teaching of the gospel it's very hard but they come but they come and they and we stay together so the interclass of the uh lecture from 1453 became uh, another thing in the parishes and without the parishes 
Where do you experiment these experiences? That's a great question, but that's not my job. That's a great uh, reflection, Andrea. Thank you very much. We are running out of time. So to the people talking about participation, I like to throw a stone, but this afternoon we'll talk about it. We have to look at Franceschini of the National Office of CHE for uh, Worship uh, Building and also the participatory uh, processes exist. And there are some ways in which new churches in Italy are built. And maybe the uh, this piece of news does not circulate, but it exists. And in Italy, there are some workshops for this. So my the consideration by Andrea Longhi, I think it's a very interesting uh, uh, speech. In the Italian immediately afterward, after war, the hierarchy decided to create a system of parish based on the sharing of the land rather than a system of classes, the church of the youth, the church of the elders, and so on. So this, uh, con uh, this is the consequence of conceiving the landscape, the territory of the church, like the place, the natural place, where all the classes could find uh, a pot a pillar to to meet each other without uh, without differences between different classes without different between the elder and the young the professor or the worker so uh, maybe uh, professor said this is also the the realization no? uh, the the place where today is possible to experience this kind of uh, community which other place in the in the city have to can today guarantee this kind of quality in the meeting? It's a question we keep for the afternoon. But the question that uh, Giovanni Leoni made, uh, I want to share with you and uh, ask your opinion. Because Giovanni Leoni said that uh, uh, he saw interesting places of renewal, interesting, interesting experiences. But uh, during the 50s and the 60s, 60s, there was a table, there was a way to plan together with the municipalities a certain politics regarding uh, parishes, regarding communities. Do you think this uh, will be possible in the future? Do you think this uh, could be possible in contemporary Europe? The fact that uh, not the, the communities are not alone in planning their own stay, their own practices and the action in the city. Do you have any kind of experience of sharing, um, I would like to say, pianification issues uh, or uh, pianification trends, politics with the municipality, so with the administrative board of the city? Is there a kind of agreement? Do you, or also, do you think this will be possible again, or these two trends will be completely separated? The municipality from one side and the church on the other. Um, for the latter, I, uh, we have some indication that the cooperation between the planning institutions of the municipality and the churches or non-Christian communities is crucial for all the processes, for refurbishment, for further development, for having autonomous uh, religious spaces for migrant communities and so on. Um, if the, the stakeholders in the municipality are not willing to discuss, to, to go into dialogue, then it's impossible to, to do anything. So they are crucial, and it's crucial not to cheat each other in these, in these processes. We have some cases of failed attempts to, to build places of worship, uh, especially for, for migrant communities, due to the un unwillingness of um, local administration to cooperate. And on the other hand, we see how smooth processes can proceed 
if the community is willing to start into dialogue. So it's crucial for, for the communities to have their um, lobby groups with the with uh, municipality and with the uh, building authorities. So I think that for the time being, it's lunchtime, so we will resume the discussion in the afternoon. So for lunch, for the speakers, guests, and uh, the uh, sponsoring uh, uh, authorities is in the Sala Gigante. See you at 2.30 here. Please be on time. of religious heritage presents us with challenges and opportunities. Knowledge transfer and innovation will be needed to hand over this remarkable patrimony to future generations, from the creative reuse of historic buildings to educational opportunities, from both real and virtual tourism to strengthening communities. The value of religious heritage is almost limitless. It is up to us to make the most of its potential. Since 2011, Future for Religious Heritage, a European network, has brought together charities, conservation experts, governmental, religious and university institutions, as well as other professionals. FRH is a non-faith, not-for-profit organization that draws its strength from its diverse network. Our mission is to understand the challenges facing religious heritage, as well as the opportunities it presents to develop solutions for the 21st century. Our ambition is to maintain a network of European organizations with a strong structural framework for ongoing intercultural exchanges regarding the protection, conservation, and management of religious heritage. This network is open to you. Please join us now. Thank you, Luigi. Congratulations for you know, everyone that, uh, you know, uh, are behind this moment. I'm the moderator for this third session, which is the hardest one, because after lunch, it's always hard to resume when it comes to uh, especially people's attention. But since we have uh, extremely effective speakers, I think it's going to be rather easy to really get into the topic of the third session of this of today. So I, I call here Emiliano Romagnoli, who will speak about uh, secular space and space of faith, considerations on the architecture of new uh, parish complexes. The topic is rather, uh, you know, rather uh, difficult. I also thank uh, Mr. Magnoli, Dr. Magnoli, who uh, graduated at the University of Florence, uh, did his PhD, and is also, uh, of course, works at the architecture faculty in Florence. And since uh, March 2023, is researcher, and he uh, published many uh, publications on the topic of the crisis and rebirth of the city. He also wrote a lot about liturgic architecture. It's also a part of, um, of a project group that won a prize for, won this uh, public competition to build this church in Calenzano in Florence. And his research studies the change of urban spaces. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I'd like to thank especially those who worked to uh, have this wonderful meeting, a wonderful conference. I also thank IJ, uh, Che, sorry, who, uh, Bill, who you know, publishes all sorts of documents that were very important for me. So the results of 
um, the competitions on on building churches with all sorts of the you know the uh, calls for bidders. All right, so I just limited to uh, work on this database that can be easily accessed by everyone. So I'll move to the next slide. So I started in uh, putting all the winning bidders of these public competitions in this, uh, in this database. These are very simple uh, graphs and tables. And, and you can see all the contexts of this bit of winners. So the urban one, the marginal was in suburbia, and the countryside. Wanted to exclude the the countryside. The next one shows where these complexes are built. Their contexts uh, that are quite empty sometimes or unspecified areas by the urban uh, planning, or they're often uh, rather, uh, you know, they're not very uh, cohesive places. Uh, some, uh, you know, some data might be wrong, but that doesn't change the bigger picture. Then I move to, I, I try to understand whether these parish complexes were built near existing urban spaces, public spaces, sorry. Uh, this one case of a, a park and a, in the other case of an existing church that was then uh, uh, yeah, amplified with, uh, with the call for competition, uh, call for, for the public competition. Then I, I noted where, uh, pub, in which uh, churches were supposed to be uh, some work to be done. I still consider the architecture of parish complexes as a form of a collective work where all stakeholders work together. So in every uh, collective work, past history, but also recent history, have value. So it's a project built on itself and that learns from the past. You know, there's a question to be made from this data that the Yosses were able to find specific places where wasn't there wasn't there were many buildings in the area so unfortunately we're used to uh, not paying much attention when it comes to expansion in our cities and when i talk about public spaces i'm not talking about you know roads and streets i'm talking about uh, something i actually studied in in the south of florence great percentage of uh, public spaces were made of roads. And, and, but Florence is not an exception. We see that in many cities, but this place is a, has just only one function. So there's not really a collective purpose behind it. So the next question I ask myself, the fact that religious architecture took charge and you know, to cop a role that was it used to be um, something that the public spaces used to used to provide used to do and why did they do that from studying uh, documents on the che uh, website and i think it's Quite evident for everyone, especially for all the all those that work in these public competitions. There's a growing uh, request for uh, pastoral spaces, uh, sports arenas, uh, theaters, not just internal spaces but also external spaces. There's a growing 
research for uh, these type of spaces, also the you know, green areas, et cetera, et cetera. So after all of these requests were made, all, you know, all these uh, show a moment of change. There's about taking responsibility when it comes to uh, spaces that were not the competence of religious institutions. So I try to understand whether by facing this moment, if there were some common uh, uh, themes, arching themes for all these projects, how do you, how do you face this um, this change? And more in general, there was something, and that is these projects tend to uh, just just tend to face the dimension of the city, and I. I saw these uh, points, the informal external space, the, um, the uh, parties, uh, the, the whole, the scale uh, relationships and uh, flux, fluxes and uh, links. Yeah, but of course, you can we can find these also in other projects, of course. And sometimes these are the, Kind of the point of the project. Sometimes it's something that is totally absent or comes later. This is not really. Uh, it's not about giving more merit to certain projects than others, but it's about understanding how uh, parish complexes are adapting to this difficult to these difficult times. The first point is about informal external spaces. That is, you know, so many of our spaces derive from uh, a confrontation between uh, politics and religion, and so many celebrate maybe one institution or the other or both together. External spaces of, of these complexes, of course, are related to uh, the religious institutions. But there are also other spaces that the rise, and with the purpose of having uh, an impact on everyday life, on everyday life of, of our society, There's areas for for playing sports, for having all sorts of uh, you know projects. There's a you know a side of it that is next to the park. It's a public park, and there's a, a number of different spaces that can be enjoyed by everyone. Whether you wanna you want to take part into you know religious teaching and teachings and so on, you can see all the the public green spaces. And I when I saw this. Picture, I was quite stunned. There's the images of Don Camillo and Pepone that kind of looked like uh, something I saw in the movies. Another aspect is the uh, Parvis. And it's been a long time that, that the Parvis is, has always been something to uh, think about. But it's hard to define it from a geometrical point of view. So it's hard to define the, the exact area that the Parvis covers. We can see here a project in Bagheria in Palermo. And you know, it was identified through a change of the of the, the tiles. To identify the Parvis, it's hard because it so the part of it is, it's always is becoming more and more of a of a sort of a, of a concept. So the part of it is you know is way large. It's always more always larger, and it prevails in other spaces. 
and sometimes there are elements of the religious tradition, the bell tower, in order to uh, find an area that does not relate directly to what surround what, what is surrounded uh, by, but with the entire city. A third aspect is about the entrance to the hall. Such entrance is always, you know, it's always something that we we've been seeing here in the same way, with the same logic that is used for realizing the for creating the whole. We see here in the, the example here from Terracini in Palermo. It's it's space that's used to anticipate some ar architectural elements that can be found in the hall as well. You have to, do, you know, make a little, a little premise. John Battista in the 1748, he uh, drew this uh, map of Rome. There are squares but there are also the maps of the churches. You can see the whole church. And this map is used a lot during the second part of the last century to understand what public space was about. It's, it's this all, this never, the, the separation between the internal part and the external part is always more blurred. I'm talking about Smithson, Van Ey, to De Carlo. So I ask myself, in being aware of the importance of having such division, vision for you know the liturgic hall. So, is there maybe a will to find a greater relation between the internal and external spaces of the church? It's not just about what is in front of the uh, the edifice, but it's all about what surrounds the building. The example on the right, you know, I put it there because you know, all of these topics are present here with the same uh, frequency. There are some traditional case, more traditional cases like here, but here in Javera del Montello, there's something really important during the public competition, the square is is designed a square that wasn't there before, and you know designers will think about the confrontation between politics and religion, the new religious institution in this case. The fourth topic is about uh, scale reports. Reports. So it's always more about finding a certain amount of distance from the infrastructure. In this case, there's a railway, there's a railway. And that's what we talked about before, actually. The fact that public space, especially in suburbia, is about the road. And that's not a space for individuals. It's not a space that uh, creates a sort of unity among people. Such distance appears to be as a necessary distance in order to find again this uh, this aspect and you know people's relationship with faith, this project also has a sort of domino effect with other uh, projects here. There's a, there's a church, there's a square, there's a road. So all sorts of different spaces that are connected to each other. So there's a, there's a last aspect and that's about uh, fluxes and um, and uh, road connections. 
you know, this is one very important ex, um, you know, example here for the Locri uh, complex in Reggio Calabria. This is sort of an alternative, um, you know, alternative uh, roads and around this axe, this axe that takes, you know, keeps everything together with a, a complex for the church. And that's uh, an alternative to this, you know, path that you would normally take. So these are also different spaces that, you know, enrich the city of having an alternative. Two last things I would like to say. Sorry. Yeah, okay. First things first. Considering what we said before. And considering the fact that parish complexes are no longer so-called pure places, only dedicated to worshiping to, and its teachings, but it's also about different kinds of spaces. So considering all of this, we could sort of you know, bring about something that David Lynch last century uh, talked about the so-called knots, knots of density as an alternative to more monocentric uh, systems in our city. So having uh, such complexes as knots in our uh, urban context, or last things I like as la last thing I'd like to say, and uh, we'll conclude with the first slide where I. You know, I put uh, many drawings that can be found on the CHE website of this wonderful initiative uh, sponsored by local uh, you know, organizations. And these very simple but not uh, silly uh, drawings. You know, there are places in where you can walk with your, your family, there are sports, uh, there are sports fields, there are gardens, trees. So also in these drawings, it's part of, maybe these drawings can tell us uh, an idea of what is changing. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Romagnoli. And that's a great, topic, very intense one. It would be interesting to <clears throat> see where, uh, which plots these churches were built, because now we're planning the plots for religious artifacts are the most unfortunate one, and put where the economy did not generate profit for houses or others. But we are opening more a bigger, a broader topic on urban planning. So let's move to the second speech of the afternoon with Andrea Marcucetti, we will talk about religious archaeology, new aggregation spaces. Andrea Marcucetti is an architect, a PhD in architecture in Rome, I think, in France, sorry. In Rome and France. And he had, as a supervisor, Padre Silvano Maggiani, historical uh, liturgist and great uh, character. And he dealt with the uh, topic of the construction of space and sacred, uh, Catholic space and sacred in Italy and France. Andrea Marcucetti published uh, uh, many uh, articles on sacred architecture, but also with the opening to uh, Eastern cultures. And he cooperates in didactic activities at universities in Rome and Milan with specific experiences related to the design of the sacred space. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for inviting me and this presentation started in Morocco because along to the universities that you mentioned, 
I also have a course in Iran and I didn't put the university for reference. Otherwise, I would have had ideological problems. Design as social and cultural expression. Expression also in Morocco, thanks to the Sorbonne University in Paris uh, about urban regeneration. And this text came out of Morocco. And it's sort of four part uh, story. The other three are most uh, urban. So two will be delivered in Naples and one in Greece. So this is act one. So. By holding the course in Casablanca on urban generation, I was asked to hastily do another course because uh, the uh, the, the lecture of the course had some health problems, which was on mobility, architecture, and the city. In my analysis, which is resumed here, I analyzed archaeology as, as a multifaceted uh, matter, a social cultural one, historical artist, urban, industrial, experimental, and in that period, I was going around the city to prepare my lecture. And I noticed that the cathedral in Casablanca built by the French was actually to be inaugurated as a cultural center. And therefore I thought it was appropriate to add religion. So uh, religious architecture as a, uh, an element for uh, analysis. Obviously, before having a general reflection, I asked myself some questions, questions that I've been asking myself for years and which generally I ask uh, at many conferences. So I always hear talking about sacred. My question is, what does sacred mean? And what does, does it mean, sacred space or holy space? Space. Where can we find sacred or holy spaces in the urban environment of the 21st century? These are the questions that I ask myself on the airplane coming back and which originated other uh, reflections. So what does sacred mean? Sacred is what belongs to other compared to the to the uh, people. So I don't know why you use this word to define a church, because especially today, the word sacred is used for many aspects. So for example, in arts, these are some paintings by Bansky where uh, some problems are highlighted, but they are related to the sacred. On top, you have all the symbols of all uh, monotheist religions, which are very dangerous. With this, uh, they generate uh, uh, wars. They are an excuse to, to generate unpleasant things. What does sacred art mean? Sacred art, well, and I'm going to the contemporary which is quite often forgotten. Fabre, on the right, you have David Lachapelle. There's an ad that was done some years ago on, uh, I think it was on uh, the internet, a phone company where a footballer is taken as a saint and is taken all around the city. The sacred also leads to some reflections that are political. This is the political campaign of François Mitterrand in, in France, where in order to promote the, uh, the brand of a socialist party, put the church on the billboards. Then there are also sacred places, let's call them like that, where they do branding. The famous I love New York was turned into I love Lourdes and I love Medjugorje and so on and so forth. Brands provide an identity, but they can uh, give an attractive or repulsive identity. So you need to pay a lot of attention to that. When I was a PhD student in France, 
one of the partners I had was Marcel Roncaiolo, a great French urban planner who died recently died. And he, analyzing Marseille, he noticed something very strange, that the metropolitan, the subway of Marseille, a city that had a lot of issue among uh, the religious and non-religious ethnicities, was growing dangerous, but the subway leading to the stadium on Sunday didn't have any kind of problem. There were no uh, thefts, there were no aggressions, nothing. And he said that because that was because everybody had the same faith for Olympic Marseille, and therefore we are all brothers. Therefore, this means that this concept of sacred is being translated from religion to uh, the sports, for example, the hand of God by Diego Maradona, or the language is uses this word for many aspects. The pop star Madonna, taking the name of the Virgin Mary, they use some objects that are usually used in churches. And everything is permitted, is allowed, everything is diluted. I like this graffiti by Bansky where it shows that this person is cleaning this wall, they're whitening this wall, and I invite you to keep this image in your uh, memory because it will be the light motif of what I am uh, proposing here. So there's a whitewashing of diversities, a whitewashing of local cultures. So we try to give culture a more uniform role. Think about the cars on the road. If you don't look at the uh, brand, you can't tell which make is that car or in fashion shops. So there's a sort of uniformity of taste. And even in TV, the name, the word sacred is used a lot. In Florence, there has been recently a protest at the Uffizi Museum. And in the news, they say that the um, the temple of Renaissance art was raided and calling it the temple of art, well, I think it's a bit exaggerated. But if you go to Naples, religion is taken very much seriously in the graffiti, which for the city. So this is a Madonna, a virgin by Bansky, who paint, who he, whom he painted some years ago, which has now been protected. And you get in a sort of social language and to promote it, they use the word sacred. There's a new writer using the image of the Virgin Mary, not as blasphemy. She is speaking out, speaking out because to think that women should be treated like the Virgin Mary to be respected. So she uses this language to express her thoughts. And even crime uses the language of the sacred. These are local criminals that died and altars are made to them and they are treated like saints and are respected as such. So what does sacred space or holy space mean? So this is the difference. This is the point. You are Peter, and on this stone I will build my church, Matthew 16, 18. Jesus Christ didn't want to tell him that build another temple. He destroyed the temple. He didn't want another temple. He referred to, the, to humanity. And if humans become the stone to build the new ecclesia, the new church, he meant that it's the people who are supposed to believe and must gather to celebrate Jesus. But only holy people, only holy people can believe, and they are not sacred people. The place of the church is can be interpreted in three moments. So this reflection comes from my uh, uh, meetings with Padre Silvani for decades. So giving a name and an identity to a uh, place of worship. So the liturgical space, the places of the celebration, religious art, everything that goes around it 
so it's not sacred art, it's religious art because it's functional to the religion. Sacred art, well, we found a definition. He wrote a book on that. Everything that is in contact with the uh, divine, liturgical poles, the callus, everything that is in contact with the divine. So if we make this differentiation, we get, we are attuned to what does the liturgical and the church space mean. During my PhD uh, study, I've noticed that when interviewing the parish centers, there was a great discomfort. Many churches didn't have church goes, especially uh, in the weekends in Rome, especially too, because the priest told me, because in the weekends, people go back to their places of origin. And in France, there has been a very thorough analysis on the mobility of people, especially during the 50s with the advent of cars. People moved and they started to having weekends uh, away. So there was the need to differentiate the churches and to open some churches out of the cities because people commuted, people moved. And this is a church in Paris, which is very small, it's not big, but it has this capacity of being welcoming, of putting people around the liturgic hub, so to build a community. This is uh, the chapel at Montparnasse train station where the church is also a place of welcoming. So it also makes up uh, for the lack of assistance for migrants and for the poor. We have another chapel in hospitals. It's another place where there's the need of a moment of uh, comfort and uh, reflection. But people go on holiday. Therefore, inflatable churches were made on the beaches. So I'm not saying this is good or bad. I'm just making a list of possibilities that came out from this reflection of delocalizing the liturgic space. And the other is a chapel in uh, cruise ships where since you are on a ship, so you have to have a place for worship and meditation. Then there was a period which was very fashionable of doing interprofessional spaces. So trying and put more religions in the same space. I visited several of them and I can say that they don't work. They cannot work. This is at the Orly airport in Paris and the Catholics are not going to pray there, and not even, not even the Jewish, go, only the Muslim. Uh, well, it was just only by the Muslim, because I asked them how was it used, how was the space used. This is very interesting. We are in Rome at the Leonardo da Vinci Fiumicino in Rome, and I this board drew me, uh, drew my curiosity. They have the six monotheist religions. I am curious to know why they chose the six religions, but there's no Christian church. And having a long walk, it wasn't easy to find, I found the place that for them was the place of meditation for these religions, which have different liturgies among them. And there was this space with these two uh, seats and the carpet. I find it not respectable for the other confessions, actually. There's much to work, but these places are increasingly used in train stations, in shopping malls, and so on and so forth. This is the mosque that was uh, built in uh, at, the, at the Orly airport, and they are quite neglected, I must say. This is Rome Divino Amore, the church that was made outdoors for the Roma and Sinti communities. This is still Rome. This is a chapel within the Corviale building, this one, one kilometer uh, long building in the Roman outskirts, which is a point of contact and meeting the people living in this building. But, you know, it's been years that they try to give it an identity and a, and, uh, a decent value and uh, they can't do it, and the uh, priest is at the front forefront of this discontent. Then there are also churches along the 
highways. So thanks to this mobility study, people move and along the highways, the motorways, you have stopping and reflection places and meditation places. This is Lugano in Switzerland. But in Germany, you have the Autobahn Kirche uh, network, which is very much developed in Italy. We were among the first with the Michelucci's church on the uh, motorway, even though it's quite underused. The word sacred or holy, these two images I'm showing you, I don't know what they are about. I want like to leave them to your interpretation. This one in a subway and this one in Ethiopia. What is holy and what is sacred is evident. We are in the aspect of which in the in the aspect is closer to our idea of reusing, of repurposing of archaeology. So what to do with consolidated historical place? Everything that we've seen is religious archaeology to me, which needs to be redesigned, repurposed to be attractive. This is in Spain. And we are seeing a trilogy of repurposing of historical buildings, which became a skate park, for example. And they are very successful. I'm going very fast because I have five minutes left. So in the logic, is it licit? Is it legit or not? Is it a sacred space or not? If it's a, if it's a holy place, is legit if the church is not a sacred space why can't you use it as a factory that can become uh, a house or a shop or whatever this is another chapel and it has been turned into a skate park too here is denver which i visited it's the international church of cannabis you don't smoke cannabis inside of it but it's a psychedelic uh, place where you can enter another dimension with Games of light and colors. And here is Casablanca. This gave the idea of this speech. This is the church built by the French, uh, the Cathedral of Casablanca. It lasted just a few years, just 10 years, because then Morocco became independent. And for many years, it was abandoned. After a long restoration process, it was turned into a cultural center. Here is Germany, but we've already seen that before with Professor Gerrards, in which the church becomes a cemetery, a columbarium of uh, urns. Let's go on. Here is Germany, where a church was taken down because there was a lignite a cave, and so they needed spaces. And a new church was built for the community, so the uh, so the compound was entirely demolished and rebuilt. Here is Ireland, Dublin, in which the space, which would have been abandoned, and this space is turned into a brewery, bar, and pub. Seven hundred thousand uh, customers per year. So this is a very well lively place. Then I found myself in Wales, I found this church along the road, and I went to see, as I often do, what's inside. Opening the door, I found these, their offices. So repurposing is very varied. And the last one, I put this, because it's a problem. So these issues are taken by politicians, and they are instrumentalized, and they are exploited. There was a mosque in India that was uh, taken down with uh, great social clashes many people died and Prime Minister Modi turned into an Hindu uh, temple by going himself uh, at the inauguration at the opening this is Dublin where the evangelium was taken as uh, experience and uh, the spectacularization was done 
and this has been very su successful. And then we get to our calls for tender. So I participated many times for uh, liturgical adjustments of cathedrals and of new churches. By seeing these uh, paintings, I the painting of Pansky comes to mind. So we can't understand where are we. We don't see the local identity. Churches are synonym of the uh, local cultural language. They are recognizable, but in the end, they could be anywhere. So I think that there is a whitewashing of the space. There's no customization. The seats are uh, always the main element. So I think that we are in a moment of deep crisis. The church today is in a deep crisis. We must admit it. We must not escape it. We can discuss whether we do architecture or not, but everybody contributed to this, uh, to this moment. This is a draft by Rudolf Schwartz, a sketch by Rudolf Schwartz that has been presented by everybody in the conferences, but which is never used. So the solution, I propose a biological resting period. So how you do in the sea, in apiculture, you must stop. Architects, liturgists, everybody, people, church goes, Nobody has a clear idea, so it's pointless to go on because you only create, generate more confusion. We need to stop. I'm putting this sentence once again because this is the core. We need to go out of the idea of the sacred. We go, must go towards the holy space. We need to rethink these places. So is it, has it still a meaning to have a big church or we should go back to the domus ecclesia in the territory, the places where people live? and move to. And then we can find the capesante. So when, when, when it will be the time when we'll have found the main road. 15 years ago, I made my first presentation in Belgium after the doctorate, after the PhD in this conference, but I wasn't referring to the calis, uh, paraphrasing uh, from Spoon to the City. The calis is the population of today. So. Who lives in the city? What is the uh, urban fabric, the human fabric? Because we are still thinking that we are all Catholic, but we are no longer Catholics. Everybody is no longer Catholic. There is a fragmentation, a cultural, religious, dynamic fragmentation. And therefore, we need to start over from this. We need to rethink things from here, this. And I would like to conclude by saying that, in my opinion, this church has undermined the foundation of the church with capital C. And I hope that next time, after religious archaeology, we shouldn't talk about re uh, the archaeology of religion. Thank you very much. Uh, thank André Marcucetti. As we were saying before, we've been knowing him for a long time. It's hard to moderate because it's, it's rather moderate himself. So we thank him for all the things he said. And, you know, we can see, you can have all sorts of feelings by looking at these images. Let's move on to the third speaker uh, of this afternoon, Maria Teresa Giannetti, who is a associate professor at the uh, Department of Architecture of the University of Federico II di Napoli, who teaches technical and, the and theory of the architecture studies are quite wide when it comes to architecture and in particular in studying uh, multi-faith spaces especially with the three main Judaic uh, religions considering the multicultural aspects of European cities transformation of uh, such spaces after the second uh, Council Vatican also the repurpose of uh, religious uh, assets uh, as and patrimony. And this afternoon, she will talk about expression of spirituality. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. Thank you for your invitation. As you said from Claudia, I, you know, I don't miss a bit. I've started working on spaces of spiritual spirituality since I was a student. And then, you know, today's work uh, pushed me towards its various crises that we have today regarding this topic. So I'll always, you know, get to the edge of things. Spaces that are used after the Second Can uh, Vatican Council. I'm going. What I'm going to talk about today is something that is between our research that we're doing in Naples and the work I'm, the thing I'm working on with uh, Professor Abitieri in Germany. So we'll see different declinations of it, but with the aim of working on the on the threshold, on the edge. So I'm an architect, so I work with shapes. So I work with kind of a, a sort of I work on assembling things, work on. You know, Pope Francis, uh, you know, suggests processes of reconfiguration of spaces and repurposing of physical space and of the community. If we only worked on physical space, it would have been just about putting things together. But since uh, our transition, the transition we're going on, it pushes us to work on. Uh, spaces of transition, I often end up working with different communities. So I I work as a sort of a composer. I, you know, established some categories to work on this uh, topic. One of that I use a lot is the performative character of space and it's sort of uh, plastic and a, a dimension under character, atmosphere, and identity that hardly intertwine between each other. So my aim is to research not what is holy or sacred, but what would, how could we use these places today from the perspective of the people that actually use these spaces? So what determines the purpose of a place on a space, what makes people recognize the use the, the use of these uh, of these spaces? That's a challenge for architects. It's about rethinking spaces. Because usually we work with spaces that were spaces used for different uh, purposes. Today, we cannot work with these parameters anymore. So I'd rather work on uh, alternative. As an architect, I often work on, uh, on characters, meaning, either character or atmosphere. But I, I'd like to move on now to touch, to uh, you know, to uh, talk about these things too much. I'd like to start from uh, sort of uh, the patchwork aspect. Because to work on these, I have to ask myself what was happening there. So I thank the organizers because they brought me to think differently and I started to work on the relationship between buildings and city on what we naturally and normally call a parish. And in order to work on the topic of parishes, I clashed 
And I met this very interesting uh, example in Bonn, and that's the Museum of Women. Such museum is a this museum is a uh, host contemporary art on on the topic of women and femininity, femininity, and we can find spaces with a lot of um, you know with a lot of interesting aspects. It was first built on an old uh, cathedral that was then rebuilt afterwards that was possible. And so they decided to build new buildings, but they couldn't erase the sort of memory of the original chapel. Uh, you know, it was dedicated to St. Gertrude this is the image of what is what the chapel can be found today. Chapel and museum are one inside the other because you enter the museum and then you find this space that was designed following this sort of patchwork, uh, um, patchwork mentality almost. And there's a, there's a priest that, uh, you know, works there, but how much, uh, we, we can, can we really call it a chapel? We see the people, you know, going to this chapel, and these people really feel uh, this place, really connect to this place. But it's very interesting because the museum has all sorts of activities, aggregating, there's a place for people to meet, there's a common space, and that is the museum with the purpose of, you know, uh, putting, you know, people, having people meeting together. Then there's the chapel, and there are all sorts of activities that we usually think of when we design uh, parishes. This process, does not see the parish as something that is just built into the city, but it's something that emerges from the city and from the people that actually live the city. Of course, in a different way, not in a canonic way, but it still suggests this social phenomenon that is rather interesting. And you know, there's two dimensions of the formal and informal that as an architect cannot still manage fully, but it's really interesting because it suggests a sort of uh, pollution and we try to um, work on it when we had the problem of working with five parishes in the historical center of Bonn. There are right now in they're almost abandoned. They're really underused because, you know, Germany has a particular has a particular issue. So these churches needed a new new drive. So with Professor Gerhard, we thought about not starting from single parishes, but to understand how the surrounding city was working on these spaces. So we turned it around, basically. We wanted to understand what, what the city was telling us and what was asking us to do when working on the possibility of regenerating these five parishes. How am I, why am I interested in this? In, interested in this because it brings the parish in a sort of governance um, uh, framework in such uh, complexes. There's something very clear that only in the moment when the city and the po and politics in the city and the, you know, the governance of the church take responsibility to develop uh, local projects that 
concern these places. At that point, these places can be part of a sort of an active uh, core of the city. The problem is that now we're discussing these uh, aspects in a separate way. So the assets of the, the heritage of the church, the assets of the church, is that just uh, cultural heritage? Because once we uh, state that it's about heritage culture, we can discuss it also from a political point of view. So it's it's about the whole city at that point. So these places can be uh, thought of and worked on in a more broad way. But when there's this, when we have uh, walls between uh, uh, these aspects. And how much, you know, these uh, these assets uh, are are measured. I'm not I'm not talking about what is newly built, but what is already there. But since we we have separate conversations about all of these, there's no unity. There's no, you know, we we can only. We can only talk about like an urban sort of framework, but but now we have very complex situations. So when it comes to uh, the parishes, we have to realize who is the is the patronage. So the patronage must be very clear and well defined. You know, we have all sorts of uh, infrastructures, uh, buildings, etc. But we have no. I sh I'm showing the a bit of what we're studying here. So we work all all sorts of different maps, the sizes. Now we uh, in insert everything in a more historical context. Now we do it in kind of broader, uh, you know contexts but what happens in Bonn is the same thing that is happening in Naples I'll show you here the process of development of one of the most problematic neighborhoods in the city and you often see the the images that were shown before with the, all the murals and that neighborhood has high rates of crime uh, people dropping out of school really early. So it's, it's a tough neighborhood, basically. And through a process, uh, through a bottom-up process that shows all the contradictions that we uh, deal with uh, today, because this wasn't even done by the diocese. It was done by the father that owns and manages a, all the... Uh, uh, the assets of the church in that uh, area. So it decided to do what is called uh, strategic development urban planning. So they basically, uh, you know, use the, the project of reusing abandoned churches you know, from the 18th century, 17th century, say to take all these uh, assets and they decide to work on the human capital they create these uh, social organizations and they decide to reuse these spaces but not as architects but as people that have a patchwork um, uh, attitude then of course the department of architecture uh, you know, took part of it in it. And then it was the project by Renzo Piano on uh, suburbias. But this, of course, is a, it's a very central suburbia. And together with what uh, well, was together presented, something we're working on in this, con this passage and connection between Germany and Italy on, re on understanding the possible uses of these spaces. I'll show you some of the um, the churches that have been transformed. Some are 
uh, workshops right now. So, some have been opened recently. All They all have this more cultural use and more of a secular use because all derives from what the organization, local organizations can do in the neighborhood. So if there's a need for a kindergarten, we'll have a kindergarten. If there's a music school, we'll have a musical. If there's a, a theater, we'll have a theater. Everything is organized by a uh, by an organization that uh, manages the uh, centenario tombs, and through uh, you know the money made from uh, from these uh, tombs, is able to uh, distribute the earnings to uh, develop the less. Uh, you know, less financially prosperous activities. So we read about these on the papers. There's a slight friction between uh, the Vatican and the local parish on how and who has to uh, manage these earnings. It's just asked. Uh, they ask about you know uh, the you know who manages the financial statements. There's a you know call for involving all the churches. On the other hand, there's a right of property on a, a asset that is not a local asset. So again, we have the problem of governance that, together with my friend David Modugno. Yeah, you know, is often a very important topic because it's important for us as architects because we need clear patronage, clear patrons when we're working on, uh, you know, on such projects. This is something we did uh, to repurpose these uh, these catacombs. And the other one is repurposing um, a, a, a cave where we uh, thought of a place where Protestants and I would say Christians in general can uh, can pray in. We thought about it for the 500th anniversary of the reform. And currently it's been you know, financed. So it's hardly moving on, let's say. We have other examples here. So it's theater. There's a box, uh, boxing gym that has closed down. And then we had uh, another space that was given to us by the, um, uh, by the city. And also, we're working on the space here. Santa Maria della Sanità is a really lively church, but it's just too large. It's it's very interesting place. Uh, uh, yeah, it comes from the Fanulo project. And in this space, together with uh, Father uh, Antonio Freso, who's currently using this church, we're thinking about having other uses, so to hybridize the church, so to have a lab, have a sorry, have a workshop, have a museum, and have a, a school. Yeah, we would, you know, our proposal, our proposals, unfortunately, have been um, rejected by the community and by. Uh, and by the um, by the and by the priests, I've come back fifteen days ago. Uh, fifteen days ago, sorry, here, and I wanted to think about, reflect, and ponder upon why my project failed. And I started to realize that the sound, the voices were voices of people doing different activities. There were people praying, there were people 
meeting up in the morning because people, you know, uh, there were people cleaning, but everyone considering due to its, uh, you know, the the size of the hall that can be divided, that is divided by different uses, but the shape the from is guarantees and allows the so-called hybridation and simultaneousness simultaneousness and i'm just saying currently that's the case because it, this space can be uh, repurposed and reconceived and you know with the fact that this hall can be used uh, for uh, liturgic purposes and for other purposes as well. There are a couple of pictures here. I'll, you know, yeah, the is the work we're doing with the local community. These are some really uh, images. These are some images of what we're doing to understand how the morphology of the space can change or can be changed when we're working on basilicas on on different sort of uh, uh, sort of constructions uh, we often work on direction and we also work on empty spaces that can be you know used or or not some of the most recurring themes that we have is working with the directions that were you know thought of with the original uh church but that is uh, you know all sorts of things basically here we're in messina and in this example differently from the other uh, example that I showed before. We work here on a very interesting aspect. So the possibility of changing the main direction of the space, not just using the X, Y uh, plan, but also on the, on the C part, basically, on X, Y, Z. And the thing is, I usually work on very uh, um, tall spaces. They can be hybridized by using plants that develop, uh, you know, uh, go towards the ceiling. This is a very interesting aspect because it's on the Z axis that it changes uh, the use of, and the direction of the space. They changed sort of the linear aspect of the church, having different spaces moving in the space. So the light also creates new spaces, not just because I'm only because I'm not only working on X and Y, but I'm also working on Z. Light is really important because, but if I want to work on a hybrid that still considers uh, the liturgic liturgical aspect of the church a very sim a symbol on which I can still work on is light is the lightning it's lighting sorry I'll show you what last example this is one of the churches we're studying in Germany in I think it's called village was shown also by Professor Gerard before. It's a very interesting church because it has three different um, aspects. It was built in the 17th century. It has uh, three uh, as three naves. Then it was changed again, and uh, uh, the Latin cross was changed. And it was uh, broke, and the main nave uh, became a community center, and 
the other part was used as a hole. And then was this was a different transformation because they changed they moved the altar. And we, you know, we're trying to understand how to work on a type of space that has a, a Latin cross when we need to reduce the space. This is very interesting, this church, because it has changed like this in uh, in the past because it it was yeah you know, direction was changed it went to a latin cross form We're working on three and these three models to understand you know when the hybrid is so working on simultaneously simultaneousness how that impacts uh, space in the church Why am I saying this? Because when you face such problems, you sometimes need to be aware of everything. It's not something we only do for ourselves, but it can happen to what happened to me. So working on a project and not feeling that you're not being accepted, but to be completely be completely rejected. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Giannetti, for her experience and for sharing so many inputs, especially the heritage of the church, whether it is a cultural heritage, not just real estate. This is just a great and important point of reflection in developing a relationship with civil and political society. What's interesting is that at the beginning of February, as Research Center, we organized a conference in Devozio called Restarting from the Meeting in the uh, Order Announcement and Committee Spaces, where Padre Lofredo was uh, a speaker who is the priest of the uh, Sanita District in Naples. So a great experience, important experience. So. I would like to thank Professor Giannetti and let's move to another keynote lecture. So let's move from architecture to sociology and we'll have Professor Luca Diotalevi. Luca Diotalevi is a full professor of sociology at the University of Roma 3. He also teaches at the Theological uh, Faculty uh, of Northern Italy in Milan and the, fa and the Theological Faculty of Southern Italy in Naples. He's the director of uh, the Master of Culture and Religion Science of the uh, University of Roma 3, and he was the vice president of the Scientific and Organizing Committee of the Social uh, Weeks of Italian Catholics between 2008 and 2014. He cooperated, he cooperated with research institutes such as Censis, and he has many publications, among which the most recent are uh, The Pretense with His Relationship with uh, the Gospel and the Social Order, The Laity and the Church, The Walls Have Fallen, and The Perfect or Order, Modernization, State Secularization, End of the Line, The Crisis of Christianity as a Confessional Religion, and the very recent one uh, book, which has been already, which is published is the mass has been uh, is nuanced is um, has faded away. The participation to religious rituals in Italy from nineteen ninety three and to, to two thousand and nine nineteen. Thank you very much. Buonasera. Good evening and thank you. Thank you for inviting me. We have a complex topic and thirty minutes available. The text is available so we can uh, focus ourselves on a part of that which is the final one in the first part there is a set of things of considerations that have to be done but which we are not repeating it which basically are three of them to define the concept of secularization that is used meaning the relationship between religion and modernization trying to get rid of the idea that Christianity is necessarily just a religion. 
And finally, to find the relevance of both themes on the city. So the object, the purpose that was given to this speech is to imagine what is the background on which we could place the relationship between churches and cities. So to which point, which is the form of secularization in this moment? Because on this background, I mean, because we need to put this relationship between churches and cities and this background of which we are going to talk about in the round table that will follow my keynote lecture. Let's say that a point from which we can start by making what uh, we've just said a little less boring, I would say, is that the analytical perspective with which uh, we are framing the present of the secularization process is focused on three parameters. The first parameter is what is the extent of the autonomy of region in a differentiated society in terms of social functions. Politics are going on the other on their own path, Econo economics are going on the other path, so is so so do science, family, arts, even though we can still talk about that in a, a self-built social uh, reality. So what about religion? It can mean succumbing. It can not have any social function at all, or it might fuel its own autonomy. So what is the extent of functional autonomy of religion? Secondly, second parameter, what is the pretense of extra religious relevance of the religion? So is it a regional phenomenon? Is it a closed phenomenon? Or does it want to affect other areas of the social life? Think about the case we are in Bologna of political Catholicism. It's not a religious uh, phenomenon. It was affected and it affects Catholicism. So I'm making this example because the third issue that we have, which is just apparently another issue, is the self-consciousness the way in which Christianity understands itself. Is it just a religion or it's, it is also a religion? This is very important from a historical perspective because we are at, at the uh, end of a confessional season that characterized continental and cent uh, central Western Europe from the 16th century to uh, the 1950s, in which there had been a a self-comprehension which was just religious, so Christianity as just a religion. So the German historiographic uh, studies of Confessionalisierung are very uh, important, so the difference between Catholics, Lutheran, etc. The Anglo-Saxon uh, world is different because they never had confessionalism. So the combination of the first two issues provides four possibilities. We are interested in three of them because the last one is residual. So we have significant religious form in which you have a high pretension of autonomy and a high pretension of extra religious relevance of uh, the religious. We can call them ecclesial religion. Then we have religious forms where you have a high uh, extra-religious relevance, but low autonomy. They are the neo-confessional forms. Think about all religions that are available to the authoritarian religions. They have great publicity, but they lost autonomy. Then you have a third type, which is after millennia, which is in great shape, which is the, soci the sociology called the commodified religion. So a commodified religion, actually, whose actor bet on a great autonomy to uh, go around the religious market with great freedom, a religious market which is the consecration that you take the catalogue of the goods of se uh, services of the WTO at code 9591, 
you find religious goods and services. So goods and services that are traded, actually. So high autonomy and small relevance of good and religious services are like a great jacket that you can put on any kind of pants. And so you can make billions. So you just have to know just a few of the of Christianity and Catholicism to see that these three forms are present within. So we cannot place, yes, the teaching of Vatican II uh, has a choice towards the direction, but what happened? So a great diversification in turn diversification of religious phenomena. So to be very short, the religious presence at a global level is absolutely undetermined because we find an open competition between ecclesial religion and returning neo-confessional religion and explosive a great religious booming of commodified religions with the piece of lay of laity of secularism which is that case of confessionalism which uh, in spite of macronian ventures is doing very bad so from the christian perspective the self understanding of the self interpretation of uh, christianity as non only religious this is this is typical of ecclesial religious, but for other reasons, the neoconfessional and the commodified forms of religion are forms in which the self-interpretation of Christianity is to be just a religion. Just to give you an idea of the importance of these things, a central category for the Catholic world, since we're talking about Italy, and this is the prevalent form, a concept like the apostolate of the laity, which so the uh, lay people can do, it's only compatible with the ecclesial function, with the ecclesial form of religion, because in the other fields, either it is a pastoral operator, a parallel clergy, or a consumer, a churchgoer. So this is the scenario in the quickest way possible to which we can get and let's let's take the last part last mile of our journey the present moment is the account of a growing crisis of religious ecclesial forms and the affirmation and the growing affirmation of uh, the neoconfessional religious and commodified religious uh, religious form the strength of neoconfessional uh, forms is given by the renewed uh, uh, interest of the religious by the political power, which tends to rediscover and to re reuse them when it's the tool of to maintain and to gather consensus, a surprising tool which is less uh, consumed than the 19th and 20th century um, century. Uh, interpretation. So Xi Jinping with Confucius and Putin with Kirill give us extraordinary example of this use of the religious by uh, people and organizations that are the expression of hostile cultures. The political power also due to this rediscovery, this, this reuse of the religious inaugurated new forms of authoritarianism, authoritarianism both left and right. Think about the South American dictatorships, uh, think about the Trump, Bolsonaro, the Heirs of what Zanatta, the professor of this university, called the Jesuit populism. Think about the Putin, C. Modi. And it's for this reason that in literature we talk about the, the dusk of laity or secularism and the return to a moderate secularism. So the use of religion by political power of this strategy. We have also, it's an example, but we don't have many. So of this strategy, a part and parcel of it are the material advantages put at the disposal of religious actors that are available to neo-authoritarian uh, uh, left or right solution at the price, obviously, of their own freedom and, or, and their autonomy. 
But on the other hand, the strength of the uh, solutions that are going through communication, communication of religion resides in an important part on the growing success of the goods and services that these that these religious firms, even though in competition with non-religious actors, offer on a market which is increasingly similar to the leisure market for a person who is 65 years old studying these things for 40 years out. This is almost fun because the format of sociology of religion 40 years ago it was political so sociology now it's leisure so how to um, you know to spend your time in entertainment so transformation which is very interesting in this case instead of political dynamics so the uh, case of commodified religion, the actors of the commodified religion are subordinated to the logics and the powers that are typical of the economic system. So we have two forms of loss of autonomy of the religion. In one case towards the, politi the political and in the, the, and in the other case towards economy. So let's recap. The social scenario in which this secularization process arrived in which we think we must place the relationship between churches and city is a, an ecclesial religion which is a struggling increasing struggling and an economic confessional or commodified religion which is expanding in this three-side conflict which is new for the strength of each actor and for the number of potential uh, outcomes it's not hard to recognize the traits of the um, debated reception of Vatican II, this complex game will also be decided on what will happen on the um, liturgic worship uh, building. So what a sociologist ob observes by studying the evolution of the artifacts, because sociology is not just belief, but it's also bricks, uh, roofs, and uh, uh, Belfries. So sometimes uh, the uh, religious architecture reflects, but the other times affects. So this intra-Catholic inter competition between ecclesial, neoconfessional, and commodified religious will also be the side, maybe, and not uh, lastly, by where and how uh, churches will be built, which churches will be renovated, and which will be decommissioned and uh, how uh, will they repurpose and if and when these churches will be demolished? So this part is not just a cause on effect, but it's a, an important part of this process. So let's go, just move to what was supposed to be the conclusion. So is, can sociology indicate or suggest the archaeologists, the architects, urban planners, to find some to provide some indicators that from its own perspective could be interesting to understand whether in building a church or a building the uh, faction a b or c1 so let's try to suggest some of these indicators we can find example from the Italian example, so we can enter religious Catholicism, which is not the only form of uh, religious uh, offer, but it's a prevalent one, so it helps us. We can complicate it further, but we are still in this pluralism, so it's complicated, complicated enough. So I found five points by organizing them. The church, who builds churches answers a question. What is a sacrament mostly? Is it an action or a thing? For example, the solution given to this alternative at the same time depends and affects the choice in uh, the disposition of the altar. What is the uh, word and the uh, thing? Have you read David Park? Yes, I did. So the altar and both one, those who is precise liturgy and those who uh, participate uh, to the liturgy. So if the sacrament is a thing, in the exchange that is related to that thing, what does it prevail? The demand or the offer? 
So if the sacrament is an action, what the relationship is there between the one driving this uh, ritual action and those who participate? A relationship that is also decided by the collocation in space of those who guide and those who participate without guiding. And furthermore, those who guide the ritual action must be represented and understood as collocated in an organization or not. This is the fundamental difference that the anthropologist made between liturgy-centered rituals and the shamans. How many uh, Catholic priests are shamans? So how they represent interpretations that see them as the irreplaceable protagonists of the liturgy that should shine of noble simplicity. But it went to waste. Second, as we said, the choices that we adopted in the alternative that we've reminded affect and are conditioned by the way in which the hall, uh, the worship hall, are put the clergy and laity. We've seen here in the half moon, which is quite different from the typical uh, liturgic hall in San Francisco in Assisi. Naturally, for the laity, for laity, we must intend those that within the space and the dynamic of the ritual are consistent with the secular attitude that should characterize them. They are the laity. Because those who uh, go mad because the priest allowed them to stay next to him with a similar cape and which make the ranks of the pastoral operators of the liturgy and which at the, te at the end are thanked as in the uh, titles of the uh, movie, they are underpaid uh, uh, staff, they are just laity, just to say, but they are used to be the staff of a, an apparatus ritual which uh, reduced the people to, pub to public and it just increased the number of factors. Number three, if the form of the rite may be performance-based or liturgy-based, the distinction is by uh, Humphrey and Law. It has an ancient history, but we start from there. The sites about the, re the preferred relation that can happen between ritual actions and non-ritual actions of those who partake in the ritual brings in their own, do they bring their own life within or they live it outside of the church? This is a distinction that uh, tell one experience religious from the other. And Catholic, and you can find everything in the Catholicism, though the governing of the ritual is in a deep crisis. Those who build churches or renovate them affect the form that this relationship can assume. Not just for the way in which it organizes the position of clergy and laity in the hall. But also giving form to the uh, entrance of the building. So how do you enter? How do you get out? Where do you enter? Where do you get out? What uh, must be left out and what must be brought inside? To the door or the doors of the hall, uh, allowing the access, and the pavis, pavis. So there's, how is it? Is it up is it just four bricks? Is it a climb or a descent? Last but not least, the relationship of inside and outside for a church is decided by the flow of lights, of sounds, and smells that is materially built and allowed in both directions, from outside to the inside, from the inside to the outside. Let's not underestimate this final point. It's a decisive ground to, to provide an account of the really sophisticated and paradoxical solution that uh, Christianity and particularly Catholicism would like to give to the problem of the identity of a church and the believer. In a church, in an appropriate church, church for an ecclesial religious, we should materialize an outside which is internal to the inside and an inside which is not uh, different, but also not confusable uh, with the outside. So the sociologist says that is lost for words because only God knows how to do it. But if you want to 
save the paradoxical nature of the ecclesia you must do this otherwise you build a temple or a supermarket in the bail hall this was a great solution for its own uh, previous history and for its own capacity to be hybridized so it's a uh, provocation towards hybridization but it's not the only solution of history we have had things like that which were different from the uh, stone paints so in a church nothing depends on and decides of the issue of the relationship between inside and outside uh, as much as the collocation and the form of the baptistry so to sum up the same of the whole parvis door light sounds smells and baptistry are solutions that affect the representation of identity so the relationship between in the inside and the outside of a church and this that was point three point number four the issue that we are dealing with is an issue that does not just touch but which basically decide the crucial point of catholicism which is the parish the question of that mediation, which is non de jure divino, so not of divine law, because you only have the diocese of the jure divino, which is a peculiar church, which is the only one where you have the church of the canonical law, so the church of Christ, which is, subsists in the Catholic church, which is a peculiar church. So it's not a holding. So the parish is the non the jure divino mediation that on paper must uh, preserve grassroots religious Catholicism within ecclesiality, a condition which should distinguish it sharply from other variants of Christianity, which are historical or more recent, congregationalist, movementist, cult sects, and so on and so forth. And from a surgical perspective, we want to know what is a church is an, an unchosen uh, priest and the universal opening, which is only given by the territorial uh, character of the uh, competence. From the point of view, it must sound silly, but it's the only thing that uh, uh, that will um, tell about the hundred to the forty-four thousand of apocalypse. The rest are just seven cults. But the recognizability of what is the ecclesial form is very simple. And if you do a survey on where uh, people live, those who go to mass, you will discover that with the support of pathetic ecclesiastic authority, an invisible internal market of the religious goods and services of Catholicism prepare the success of a uh, reckless uh, offers, then you have movements and you have sites so I can go whatever I want. So why should I go to the ice cream uh, shop uh, under my uh, house? I'm going to another one where there's a better ice cream. But there, the sacrament is reduced to a thing. Those who guide the right, qualifying my uh, likeness of his dialectic or his rhetoric, rhetoric or his hairstyle, and those who uh, next to me is chosen instead of being one of the 144,000 that I've met. Just a few things make this distinction. So the church between the ecclesial uh, church and parish as the territorial uh, character of the relevance of the institution in the, peculiar, uh, in the parish church and the bureaucratic church, which is a great word, so an office that does not depend on the likelessness of the uh, of the demand bureaucratic uh, word, which is splendid word of the Presbyterian that is guiding the liturgy. Both characters are not by chance intertwined with the renewed and uh, faithful form of the Catholic liturgical rite from the teaching of Vatican II and from Pope Paul VI which is the one under attack. Building, destroying, renovating, abandoning, repurposing churches that happened in the, uh, lately and which is still happening. Or what we are 
designing. Does it enhance or conceal the parish, the mostly parish character of Catholic churches? This is one of the most interesting thing of the history of our country is that between the Po Valley and Sicily, the parish uh, appeared with 1200 years of difference. Catania at the beginning of the 19th century was just one parish. But if you remember the Gattoparto, those who said mass in the uh, Lord's building was a, uh, a subject of the baron. It wasn't a priest sent by the bishop. The baron uh, uh, responded. Besides, from the sociological perspective, it would be laughable, suspicious, and also ugly, the uh, argument saying that the increasing social mobility would imply the failure uh, of the parish institution. On the contrary, from the sociological perspective, obviously, now more than ever and more than any known form, the parish can guarantee a, an ecclesia religious. So the intention between uh, demand and offer, because the parish should not contain life, but you need to insert it without being absorbed. So if I take a niche of market and I build a liturgy, this is totally absorbed by the demand. That's obvious. Diverse things are different for the parish and the assessment changes its sign. If you prefer to the ecclesia, you prefer a neo-confessional or commodified religious, which is something that is less and less rare also in Catholicism. The parish is, is not uh, put into crisis by the lack of clergy. From 1890, the laity dropped much more than the clergy. So the workload of the clergy is much less than 30 years ago. So the so the topic of the crisis of the number of the priests for the parishes, it's a clerical invention. Five, fifth and last point. After adding this in top after adding all the other syndicators to this one that will should be useful, it will be the moment to tackle a a summary aspect, but it's not aspect. So the churches that are left, that will be left after the uh, building, destroying, abandonment, repurposing or, or uh, renovations, will they be able individually and also collectively of manifesting the aversive character of the church of the capital C and its liturgy vis-a-vis -vis any model that wishes a, a self-funded closed social order. So, the church is incompatible with the police and its uh, founding of the civitas. So the system of churches and urban fabric, are they pro police or pro civitas? They can be whatever they wish, but we recognize it. Uh, how do they pose themselves in this fabric? So in front of any Catholic church and all Catholic churches, we need to ask ourselves. So it's evident that from these bricks that... that um, roof, that apse, those doors, that pavis, that uh, belfry, that there women and men gather that with their actions are they still the faithful heirs of the that heritage that Coleman called no anarchists, no zealots, so not uh, um, not the not disliking a social order, but not even zealots, so Otherwise, it becomes like uh, the Church of Sabionetus or something that was something cute in a system which is the power of this world, or like a supermarket where I regulate myself according to the preference or the religious diet of my life. Or are they just hostile to reactionary authoritarianism and indulgent towards the progressive or individualist one or vice versa? What we'll find in front of us, is it a church like a young Joseph Ratzinger brought that materializes a, a, uh, an ecclesial community which is uh, the soul of the Civitas or with its own presence prevents the state, the pre prevents the creation of this power. So in Italy, it would be a republic, but this inexplicably became uh, a sort of something else of state so hostile to any 
police, even that it is a theocratic or theologic police, or will we face something like a supermarket of that kind of goods, the code 9591 of WTO, or the collection of a segment of a population that only exists in the widespread myths of those who concentrate power and spread uh, fear, fuel, uh, anger, and the, uh, mostly the fear for freedom. So as a decisive part of this question, the choice of the solution to be given uh, to the problem of the relation between church and urban fabric can be the decisive part. So there's a town which is Narni near Perugia, which is great to see how the many phases of that, uh, the Christian phases of that city modified the urban fabric, which was a city of median importance of the Roman uh, Republic and the Roman Empire. It's the Cathedral of St. Augustine, San Domenico, so that what made it uh, Civitas from a castrum. And now it must turn it into a police. A decisive aspect of this relationship must be considered the potential trend to reduce the research of proportion in obsessions for symmetries. The church must be proportion, but the proportion is never a symmetry as a narcosis of any transcendence and any embodiment. Another decisive aspect of this relationship is the relationship between the church and the square. And which kind of square can we build in Tiananmen Square, on the red square, as the ones that were built and which created the uh, squares of the Civitas of our municipalities, the Po Valley and the Central North Po Valley, for example. The real conclusion. So somebody might think that in the end, the perspective with which we can face the alternatives we've dealt about was already defined by Manzoni in some of the observation of the Catholic moral or by Rosmini in the one or two of the five plagues. Or even more, somebody else might say th that the teaching of Vatican II and the history that prepared it, and last but not least, a lady interpreting until the end and until martyrdom its own secular uh, nature, already gave a clear answer to these questions in the reform that occurred with uh, something that could be built. And that's actually what it is. We didn't say much uh, new things uh, around the ecclesia religious features, but we, we are not the ones to promote it, but we need to describe this three-way uh, competition. So in front of this uh, observation, Basi said that I can't say anything that what we dealt about is just one of the chapters of the contradictory and contradicted reception of the teaching of the Vatican II and of Paul VI. For a socio sociologist, this is a fact. So the reception of this fact as the French Revolution, uh, then was Napoleon, then it was uh, Vatican II and Pentecostal mo mo movement. So that's the reflection of this. Or which is other. Suppose that it's other, something else. So... From this, it wasn't something different than a peculiar and crucial aspect of the global crisis and global cri and local crisis that an order inspired to the civitas is going through under the hits of the paladins of the regimes inspired to the police. The last one, which are surrounded by um, by henchmen with incense, which want. Uh, very well paid uh, uh, blessings. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Diota Levi, for uh, this great and detailed and complex overview. And for us architects, it's quite hard sometimes to do it, but the topic of the parish and the bureaucratic character, the territorial, character so the importance uh, of this presence has 
been shown as the relationship between outside and inside, light, uh, smells, sounds. So the a report on the identity of the church within the uh, urban landscape. So I would like to conclude this third panel. We have a coffee break of some minutes, 20 minutes, but we would like to ask you to be here at the end and not going uh, too much further. So 15 minutes, sorry. So let's synchronize our watches. Thank you very much. Work has brought together charities, conservation experts, governmental, religious, and university institutions, as well as other professionals. FRH is a non faith, not for profit organization that draws its strength from its diverse network. Our mission is to understand the challenges facing religious heritage, as well as the opportunities it presents to develop solutions for the 21st century. Our ambition is to maintain a network of European organizations with a strong structural framework for ongoing intercultural exchanges regarding the protection, conservation, and management of religious heritage. This network is open to you. Please join us now. Europe has a rich and deeply rooted religious heritage. Its unique buildings, tranquil spaces, and exquisite artifacts encompass the diversity of European culture and identity. This religious heritage is an invaluable resource that is handed over to us for all generations to enjoy. It is all around us and an integral part of our lives and communities. It includes rich cultural traditions, masterpieces of art, wonderful craftsmanship, and extraordinary music. In an era of globalization, cultural heritage helps us to remember our European cultural diversity, and its understanding develops mutual respect and contributes to dialogue amongst different cultures. The future of religious heritage presents us with challenges and opportunities. Knowledge transfer and innovation will be needed to hand over this remarkable patrimony to future generations. From the creative reuse of historic buildings, to educational opportunities, from both real and virtual tourism, to strengthening communities, the value of religious heritage is almost limitless. It is up to us to make the most of its potential. Since 2011, Future for Religious Heritage, a European network, has brought together charities, conservation experts, governmental, religious, and university institutions, as well as other professionals. FRH is a non-faith, not-for-profit organization that draws its strength from its diverse network. Our mission is to understand the challenges facing religious heritage, as well as the opportunities it presents to develop solutions for the 21st century. Our ambition is to maintain a network of European organizations with a strong structural framework for ongoing intercultural exchanges regarding the protection, conservation, and management of religious heritage. This network is open to you. Please join us now. So let's start with the final session of the day. So I would like to invite all the discussants here for the round table. We have uh, Ante Pittini, Belloni, Don Giuliano Zanchi, Don Umberto Bordoni, Don Luca Franceschini, Don Marcello Brunini, who's already on the podium, and Claudia Manenti. So now, the rules. We've had many inputs in uh, throughout this day and uh, also the union or division framework given by Luca Diotalevi. And this opens some issues, some questions that deal with architecture and the city, the design of both things and how the church or churches would like to place themselves in the city. So besides the fact that together with the new buildings, we should think about the new uh, form of use of the build. So Maria Tese Giannetti 
brilliantly showed all those topics that come out of a continuous study practice of the current ecclesia heritage. So the management of spaces, whether they be new or newly created or required by the communities or the ancient ones, call for a management. The management asks for the knowledge of a policy, which is not always clear. So this round table, because there's no table, so there's, let's say, round uh, hall, let's say. So, and the closure of this uh, first day of this conference, uh, circumstances, let's say, the room monsters of Tino Grisi. So there will be a first phase of uh, communication of projects, of projects, so of built realities. And then on this project and the many uh, inputs that this day has given, we will discuss with Umberto Boldoni, Giuliano Zanchi, uh, Claudia Manenti, and Luca Franceschini, who have specific roles. So you see, we try to involve the culture, the current cultural debate. So Don Giuliano Zanchi is the director of the journal of the Italian clergy, so an historical journal of Italy, where there's also a constant push on the line that the journal has some monitoring research and a great interest to try and provide a lifelong learning of the clergy. Don, uh, Father Roberto Bordoni is the director of Arte Cristiana, a journal that many of you already know and which deal with topics related to art and also talking about the peripheries of sacred and religious Claudia Manenti. We've already met her. She's the director of Dies Domini Center. I've already introduced her author and promoter of many initiatives, last but not least, the magnificent sem seminar in Devazio at uh, the uh, top room in Devazio in the, recent, in the recent edition, Father Luca Franceschini, who is also the promoter and the uh, customer because he is the director of the National Office of Ecclesiastic uh, Cultural Heritage and Places of Worship of the Italian Episcopal Conference. So thank you, everybody. And I would like to leave the floor to Father Marcello Brunini, who represents, who presents an interesting experience. This morning, somebody talked about participation as the key of the uh, building processes of new churches and communities. So what happened to Varignano, a district of Viareggio, in which there had been the call for a, an Italian Episcopate uh, conference uh, project, which was then won by Dama Associati, who built the new church and which was driven as a social process by the priest, who is Tomacello, Father Marcello Brunini, who follow the social building of this parish. So the uh, this presentation must be very quick, please. So he is a designer, even though he's not, but he's considered to be a social designer. So please stick to 10, 12 minutes uh, with the slides. Then we will uh, keep the same times during the debate. Thank you very much. The floor to you. Thank you very much for the invitation and the kindness. I'm... I'm a bit fish out of the water here because I'm not used to speak at this kind of conference events, but I'll try. So the adventure of the construction of the new parish center of the resurrection of our Lord in the Varignano district in uh, Viareggio started at the beginning of 2014 when the parish was introduced in the... Uh, project of the Episcopal Conference uh, called the uh, uh, Diocesan Path. So the, com the community asked four things, memory, sobriety, future, and beauty. First of all, memory. Varignano, which means small harbor, 
between the Lake of Masashukuri and the sea is a district that was developed since the 1960s and which is still developing. From the minimal houses, which were just uh, huts with low foundations, we moved to uh, to social houses that, together with uh, the inhabitants of village, welcomed many migrants, first of all from southern Italy, and now foreigners coming mostly from northern Africa. This is a district that, in less than two square kilometers, contains more than 10,000 inhabitants. So a complex body crossed by a plurality of tensions, but always committed in a, a democratic participatory process to have the fundamental rights as respected. So the Christian community introduced itself in the context by relating social commitment and faith, a presence that found a shape in specific forms. So a farm became the uh, the headquarters for the community and uh, a um, and another building became the uh, chapel so the first uh, church was the green uh, church with it was a prefab compound favoring the uh, participation of the assembly and introduced in the district. So this uh, building was used for meeting in the district. So theater, the assemblies of the district and uh, also school meetings and due to its deterioration for legal issues, the demolition was ordered. A demolition that could not, uh, I mean, make us forget about its soul that we tried to design to design it to transfer the soul in the new building together with memory, also sobriety. Barignano is a poor neighbor made of workers, seasonal, um, seasonal workers, retired people, and some uh, clerk with a presence of great number of millennials who do not know study nor work. The Christian community is very small and quite poor, but willing to live the gospel of hope by sharing the spiritual taste of being a people, as Pope Francis put it. So the new building must be uh, aimed at a sober and uh, welcoming uh, style, future. The visible city is always compared to the invisible city, as Italo Calvino said. The new uh, premises must be open to new generations and their original feeling. And also the meeting and clashes between, among different cultures. So a construction leading to the unsaid, which is held by the future, and then beauty. The Christian community of Varignano is dedicated to uh, the resurrection of our Lord. And it would like to offer a bit of the uh, glory of the resurrected, recognized in the Bible as beauty. So an attractive building that can surprise, open to silence and to brotherhood. So I would like to say something about the participatory uh, path. So these hopes, memory, sobriety, future and beauty were made concrete towards a participatory path, which has not always been fully understood. Let's sum up. First of all, the drafting of the preliminary document of the drafting, the so-called DPP, which lasted several months and which saw the uh, confluence of many subjects, the parish community, which uh, reflected upon its own history, the relationship between um, the church for people and church's temple, the characteristic of a place of worship, and the relationship between the district and the city. The responsible of this procedure who animated the involvement of all the relevant parties, the, res the responsible people in the dioceses, the Italian Episcopal Conference, the technicians of the communities, and also an exchange of opinions with some professors of the professors of the Polytechnic School of Milan. The DPP that was proposed by to the designer is made of report, a 
technical analysis and a video. Mission Varignano one, because there's another one that we've done. The, relay, the reports together with the urban, technical, liturgical, and pastoral requirements also describe some anthropological elements allowing to take a better look on the uh, neighborhood and the uh, inhabitants. So the participatory path ended up with the choice of the project, which happened in two phases which were preceded by a local seminar to present the proposal and to, um, and to explain the peculiarity of the district and its Christian dimension. The second phase had the participation of 10 um, design studies uh, selected among the 34 proposals. So the parish community insisted on its own involvement in the final assessment of the project which was not foreseen by the calls by the Italian Episcopal Center. So we asked the community to choose the winner among the final three chosen by the Institutional and Technical Commission, but that was not possible. However, the parish commission made of 15 members examined in four days the 10 proposals and drafted a report which was sent to the president of the Technical Institutional Commission who read it after uh, the choices of the commission. Surprisingly, the two commissions picked uh, as first the uh, the proposal by Studio Associati from Venice, uh, Studio Dama Associati from Venice. After the tender, there was a period of dialogue between the uh, clients, so the dioceses and the parish, and the winning bidders to articulate this project. In this phase, we created a positive synergy between uh, uh, clients and designers, ended with the approval of the project as revised by the uh, Italian Episcopal Conference Committee. The um, this was also reflected in the contracting phase. The three selected uh, uh, firms were also invited uh, to present their projects to the uh, pastoral council, which is unusual. At the final, the temporary uh, joint venture Polistatic Camp Bizenzio and the other one from Bressanone, from Brixen, were uh, chosen. This uh, Baroque, um, let's say, this unusual procedure led to a positive synergy among all involved subjects. We should highlight the relationship between the parish, the neighborhood, and the city. To make the uh, winning project uh, known, we organized an exhibition at the Modern and Contemporary Art Gallery in Viareggio together with uh, some meetings that involved a lot of citizens. During the building, we organized some open building sites in order to show the uh, status of the work to the community and the neighborhood and also to the uh, Guild of Architects from the province of Lucca. Finally, the grand opening, 8 June 2019, which was a great people's uh, uh, celebration, as our Archbishop said. Now, very quickly, some architectural and structural features. The new complex was made after the demolition of the old one, and this oriented some choices for the building. The shape with a central plan recalls the old church, the philosophy of noble simplicity in the spirit of, in the spirit of sustainability with a photovoltaic plant covering uh, the uh, church on the roof and external uh, insulation to reduce thermal um, dispersion, the use of solid wood panels and the x lamp technology. And then the choice of uh, keeping uh, uh, these woods uh, finishing to, grieve, to give uh, natural warmth and light to the uh, spaces. All architectural choices were made on the durability of materials, which are uh, easily and the ease of access to any space and reduction of uh, maintenance costs. 
So there's the floor plan of the new parish, uh, the church and the garden. Here are some uh, internal, so the liturgic hall as a squared uh, uh, plant uh, with a small nave uh, closed by the chapel that uh, and the altar is the focus of the liturgic hall at the center of the presbyterium it gathers the look of the old the assembly the marble which almost cubic which is ornated in the front by a polished brass cross the monument of the resurrected is very is marble very simple which is pointed towards the assembly to uh, make the listening to the word easier. The uh, the seat is on the left between the altar and the assembly. So one uh, is the uh, chair, but everybody celebrates. Then the baptistry, right of the entrance, it has the source of the old church and the baptism um, flask. So there are uh, white uh, tiles which has also a square with golden uh, squares. So, so it is surmounted by a scale of 12 uh, uh, elements in brass. So this element uh, this element create a stair of light. Of the old church, from the old church we have the cross and the great fresco. The cross is placed right of those who watch the altar on a completely white wall. The great fresco is repositioned in the uh, wall of the nave. It accompanies those who enter from the side entrance with four scenes of Christ, uh, the resurrection, the meeting with Pilatus, the resurrection of Lazarus, and the embodiment. By entering on the left, you can go to the celebration of reconciliation, Moving on, you go to a small chapel with an image of the Virgin Mary. So the itinerary with Christ, mm, figurative Christ, opens the real Christ in the chapel of the Eucharistic Reserve. So a ceramic refig um, depicting Christ is over the tabernacle, which is a, knob, uh, which is a work that can be uh, interpreted. So this is just the last slide. There's also a big window which retraces the blue of Giotto's uh, painting in the Scroveni Chapel, then the light coming from the roof, and uh, there are also other small works of art. So the new uh, compound proposes a great articulation between liturgical whole pastoral elements, making a set recalling the dimension of the building as the house of the church, and it favors an entrance in the urban dynamic of the district. It's a complex relationship between the parish and the uh, neighborhood, which is further specified by the parvis, the insertion of a great uh, garden in which the doors of the greenhouses were repositioned in order to form a sort of a monument. The parvis and the garden as welcoming and participation pay, uh, spaces. So in a world, in a neighborhood like mine, mine where rancor is brewing, we need to find the culture of dialogue and the meeting, a culture that must be learn another time from the grassroots, in the roads, in the uh, factories, in schools, in public spaces, and also in the church. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Father Marcello. You can take my place. You can sit here. Uh, also thank uh, Professor Olimpianiglio, uh, accompanied by uh, Father Marcello, because she's from Lucca, despite the fact that she teaches in Pavia. I will uh, invite uh, another speech from an architect, Routine. Sandra Routine, do you want to sit or you want to be at the podium? From this point of view, well, it is the, uh, it built a new church with, so, 
the kind of contamination from the past. Thank you. I uh, created this presentation uh, following two uh, topics I thought were important in terms of what we have what we have to do in this uh, secularized city that lost also has a relationship with this territory that was becoming always more secularized where but something that in the eighties that talked about secularized territory it lost its identity. We're at a crossroad. I think we either uh, take this uh, identity back, made of small signs of great presences, or we we're gonna lose it forever. So uh, future uh, churches. But my first uh, topic was the smart. Uh, churches, smart cliches, which is kind of an old uh, word. We're now in postmodernity, so it, we have more of this probably future uh, church that you know is, is part of us. In a secularized uh, territory, the answer is aggregation. We have to uh, challenge this. Uh, aspect of the territory and what is sacred. In a polycentric city, the, the answer is also presence. Uh, you know, we are build cities and build small, large uh, buildings that belong to uh, Catholicism. We have to create these presences. The first topic, you know, something I it's kind of reading something that was already done, something in, that was done in 2007. But by reading it and going through it again, I feel like saying that this experience had a huge problem. Parishes are always less and less managed by uh, priests. So... What should we do? It's not just a problem of the clergy. It's also the problem of architecture. Because you know, the term that I used is aggregation. It's aggregating. So I want to show you here that we are in the northeast of Italy, in the field of Venezia Giulia. There are three parishes, the three churches that you see on the left these three parishes and they're aggregated in that one church uh, on the top left there's immediately a problem that we have to face first of all we have to uh, enlarge enhance the current uh, churches because we have more believers to welcome and there's another aspect that's the abandonment of churches a huge issue in Fiorentina Giulia there are more than a thousand churches that we have to manage, and we don't know how, really. So there's the aspect, for example, that uh, church on the bottom left was merged by uh, by families. It's full of uh, olive trees there, and there are also all sorts of wealthy families. So that chapel became the, the personal chapel of this uh, wealthy family, that uh, produce wine, that make wine. So all of this leads to a sort of presence still because that is maintained. It's not. It's not abandoned. Also, for example, uh, uh, churches near cemeteries also are interesting. For example, here in our region in Emilia Romagna, we have all sorts of regions like this. Uh, churches like this who are in the middle of fields sometime. But let's move on right now. These are all important aspects. Uh, the answer here was to, let's merge them together. The church is inserted, the red one, in a, a pre-existing fabric, 
with a strong presence of former uh, popular e economic house where, uh, sorry, um, project house that has, have no longer Catholic families. So there was, a, as I said, a pre-existent uh, uh, building. So they decided to put all put both these uh, uh, Presbyterians, uh, one facing the other. This is the entrance. The, this liturgic hall as the final image of this example that I picked. So basically, it's a church that is it's kind of similar to, and gets closer, sorry, to the former, to the other church. The other problem we have in a post century city, uh, our answer must be uh, to, to be present. So we have to build important uh, highlights to, you know, you know, uh, these are some of the things that I thought about by uh, doing uh, all of this to inclusivity, for example. Uh, here we, in the east part of the Veneto region, in this case, this parish is at the edge of uh, social fabric that uh, became bigger in the 90s. So there wasn't much around the parish anymore. So this was the map in 1835. It was this large villa and it was, a, it was the parish then. Then you see the development and that's the current situation. So this project that, you know, um, surrounds this, uh, the church. So these parishes uh, are open to uh, to the public. We have, you know, this we've done this uh, uh, this diagram to show a new uh, urban system made of relationships. In the right, in right, you saw the new uh, buildings. This is the core, uh, which is uh, uh, a green area that can be used for all sorts of activities. You know, of course, with springtime, the the meadows, you know, blossoms. So, this is the core of the of the building that can be used in all sorts of ways. You know, give a purpose to this uh, multifunctional uh, uh, building. The in, the grand opening seemed quite interesting because this uh, the external part became uh, the liturgic hall, where people were there in a moment where sure the church opened to the public and opened to the community to build new connections that were never built before. Uh, we've done everything on time. Now I would like to give the floor to the last designer who is presenting, well, I know two works by architect Paolo Belloni the Ch Church of Cibeno di Carpi. There's a student of mine from the Theological Faculty of Emilia Romagna who also, was also done a small work of liturgical analysis, which was carried out in 2017. Then we talk about recent cases and the Church of Cavernago, the territories in which Giuliano Zanchi comes from, so from Bergamo. So carried out design in 2013 to 2019, and then it was built in 2019. Thank you very much, Paolo. The floor to you. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me to this very important uh, uh, event. I'm putting my clock because I don't want to uh, to overshoot the time allotted. So I will present very quickly this project along with the two that I that you've quoted, which I believe are very representative of a sort of topic. So I'm Belloni. The title is Belloni. Okay, here it is. 
And I think that they can be interesting for this conference on many topics. So first, it's a project that I cared about, which is the liturgic uh, adaptation of the Church of Brembo di Dalmine, an existing church from 1950s. So you can see this architecture very reassuring, which was typical of many of the churches that were built uh, in our province during those years. The uh, inside of the church was like this. Di grande. So with a sort of big granary, let's say, very simple architecture, very essential with some interesting uh, structural elements, uh, with some situations that made this place, let's say, very dark, closed, loaded with meanings, objects, signs, symbols, uh, and memories also. So this was one of the topics that we had to deal with in uh, this project. So the first one, the first step was to open these uh, side chapels as much as possible. You have the image of the Virgin Mary and uh, the side altar, the Presbyterian, uh, open towards the sacristy. And there is a difficulty, the fact that many of the people that were participating in this participatory process had participated in the building of the original church. So there was this memory. So it's hard to do, it was hard to do big works and, and because this was a wound for many people. But regardless, the priest with the commission was, had the courage of taking this challenge. It was a small invitational a uh, call that was organized by the diocese and we won. So we had very heavy um, intervention also by opening one of the wings of the church to remove this very rigid symmetry. This is the final result. So a series of images of the final results, which brought light. You can see on the right side of this image, you have this part of this red light, which is the light filtered by a cold window. So it's natural light coming from the outside and which also renewed some decorative elements that were within the space. So we can see this golden embossed uh, uh, sculpture that was in copper and it was clad in gold. It was in copper, so it was very dark and it contributed to a certain general heaviness of the atmosphere. But there was the need of not removing it, of recovering it. And then we worked on that as we recovered this wonderful wooden sta statue of the Virgin, which was uh, uh, enhanced with this lateral chapel that was, the side chapel that was uh, highlighted by this uh, smooth alabaster and the tabernacle was encapsulated in this new uh, stainless steel, uh, brushed, uh, polished stainless steel uh, structure. And then we intervened on in liturgical elements. So we brought this presence of natural light on the Presbyterian with the opening of this big window uh, on top. Jesus the Christ has been recovered by placing it on a new cross and this uh, velarium, this uh, background, uh, backlit background uh, of the Presbyterium, um, bringing uh, liturgic colors within the uh, hall through uh, lights. This is the enlargement where we did the choir, then the baptism uh, source, the uh, the confessional, this is one of the elements in uh, embossed silver that has been recovered uh, with uh, these uh, uh, action that recovered the image of the church with great fear, with great concern, also some controversy that then was uh, quickly silenced during the grand opening of this, uh, of this new church. So here... We worked with light. So I have five minutes left. Okay, so I need to run some other pictures. Then I'm going very quick. So light. In Cavernago, the topic was shadow. And in this case, the similar situation as one as my colleague, two parishes, Cavernago and Malpaga, that uh, were supposed to merge. 
Cabernago and Malpaga said two small churches with two uh, castles, a new urbanized fabric in the central uh, part with with was without the uh, urban uh, fabric. So the part on top is the uh, Cabernago Castle, the small church. There is just a single priest, so there was the uh, need to merge the two parishes, and there was a chance to provide this urban fragging, uh, this anonymous urban fabric with an aggregation center. So the the church, the parish house, and the community center. So it was very inarticulated topics. So the challenge was to merge these two dimensions from the perspective of protection and closure to create a limit on the perimeter, and at the same time, welcoming people in an, in, in an inner space. Obviously, the project was a, a call, a call with invitation. 13, 15 designers were invited, and the presence of a liturgy expert was not envisaged, strangely enough, but I wanted to involve Don Giuliano, Father Giuliano Zanchi, who, um, uh, who accompanied the project. But then we worked uh, together, you know, the sharing with the commission, the circuit part, the diocese and the Italian Episcopal Conference and all the passages that involve uh, uh, updates of the project. The general plan of the church. It's a tradition, an axial one, but we wanted to place a side entrance to make the perception of internal space more dynamic. Here are some study uh, models. Uh, this, when we broke ground, and it was the point where it was placed the altar, which became the point of reference around which we traced the new building. So a simple gesture, but symbolically very important from my perspective. The altar is not an object that is put on uh, uh, the floor, but it's rooted in the ground. So Le Corbusier probably taught us something, and we try to repropose something. The choice of material, which is very important. The concept of a long time of an important matter, which is uh, solid, which is sound, which is unique that we wanted to bring inside this project even though the shapes and the composition is very contemporary and also very bold but the reference is the architecture of the romantic the gothic where with just one uh, material the local stone you do insulation floors uh, uh, walls and also roofs so if this and there is just one uh, material, which is texturized uh, uh, cement, which we used with uh, um, with some papering with uh, uh, bales that uh, lead the bring this light within the space so that composes and uh, highlights some volumetric elements of the whole uh, building. The cooperation with uh, Artist Ricardo, Gian Riccardo Piccoli, he uh, came in in the successive phase, uh, a very enriching work, some moments of sharing of this journey, which scares the architects, but from which you uh, come out uh, enriched in terms of experience and knowledge. So it's very, his presence was very important. He worked on the project of the tabernacle, the Via Crucis, and uh, an interesting wall along the uh, baptism source. The Via Crucis and the uh, baptistry that has this graffiti in which the name of the children that are born and baptized there are uh, carved in with a nail. And that's a, an image of these uh, compound. The consecration, the altar, in uh, uh, armed concrete, so the liturgic uh, uh, in concrete, sorry, uh, the Presbyterium opens towards this internal cloister where we put this secular uh, olive tree, the pastoral center, uh, pictures from the outside recalling 
the materialness and the linear continuity of the walls um, and the, the walls of the castles that are a, a perimeter uh, single unit towards the outside and then some images of the inside here we have shadows uh, in an intervention uh, rather than what we did in Bremo di Darmine where we worked with light, we worked more with shadows here. And then this eye that was raised, so there wasn't the will to do a bell tower, so we used this elevation of a volumetric element that is orientated to the west. So uh, in the evening, uh, during dusk, you have, during sun at sunset, you have this warm light, and then some details in bronze and brass that are worked in a very simple way, working on materials and uh, on texture, on the sensitiveness of materials. And the goal is to create a unique place with an approach that uh, uh, has a plastic, uh, willing and artistic thing to trans turn the church into a place that is as remote as possible from other spaces that we are used to see a museum or shopping mall where more or less the materials that are used are basically uh, the ones at Cibeno di Carpi. It was another call and the work is totally uh, different from the one that won the uh, call because meanwhile there has been the earthquake in Emilia Romagna, the diocesis took other decisions so the way we were recalled trying to uh, uh, we were asked to have a much simpler, much cost-effective uh, uh, project, and the idea was to work within the perimeter of the of the existing cemetery, a deconsecrated cemetery, an abandoned cemetery, a bonif uh, bonificate and a reclaimed cemetery. So the church became a volume within a. Um, the church uh, was made within an existing space, saving uh, uh, some ground the consumption of soil. The church is dedicated to the Trinity, the work on the Trinity of Masaccio, which was the pretext for the topic on which then we've built some decoration elements of textures of the facade and some volumetric elements characterizing the architecture. In the inside, the tradition of the altar that has been recovered and reinterpreting these techniques these are some trials we've cooperated with an artist with whom we've cooperated, Manfred Lois Meyer from uh, Merano, an artist with whom there is affinity of thinking. And this process was made gradually and the important artisans working in this uh, path, volumetric trials and the placement and the position of the altar, the amban and uh, uh, the liturgic places, the artist Manfred Meyer and the topic of light, very simple element where the eye of the artist can make the difference on a very uh, simple uh, structure like this by calibrating the texture, the distance, the reflect, the recovery of a wooden virgin to which the community is, um, is very uh, bound to. And, and by reinterpreting and treating it with this blue, giotto blue, uh, enter then this uh, chapel at the entrance of the church. Here are some uh, pictures of the construction. Here we have uh, the uh, recovery of the wall of the old cemetery. And inside this volume that raises bringing light to the presbyteral part. And you can see some, so you can see this texture of the image of Masaccio, which is, which can be barely seen. The Church of Longuelo, or which I want to talk, so which just some minutes because I think it's worth so it's just one minute. We can just give you one minute, not just on this image. So 
So this is an architecture made by Pino Pizzigoni, one of the most important architects of the uh, 20th century in Bergamo at the beginning of the 60s, consecrated in 66, and that small dot is the priest of that time who was uh, looking, uh, who was doing some surveys. So this was a uh, church as a tent as the new relationship with the territory. So I don't want to dwell on that. So the intervention was a restoration of the modern. So uh, we are joining technical data. So the degradation of uh, concrete. So these are the studies that were done and the demolitions and then the re philological rebuilding of the defects that the construction at the time had on a very bold project had. So this was a moment of study of research, which is very interesting and very current one. Uh, getting to the need of uh, protecting ourselves uh, from future degradation without working on external cladings and then working on surfaces. Thank you. I'll stop here. Thank you so much. Now, thank you. It's clear that eyes need beauty, of course. We need beauty. Liturgy and the community both need beauty. Now, we have kind of, we're kind of at the end uh, of today's conference. So, not everyone here. Have seen, have witnessed the long speeches that we had today. So just pinpoint certain things. And then different people can, you know, take a stand. The one has two points. I'll use the metaphor of the keys. Someone mentioned it, uh, I think. Professor Giametti, who has the keys of the church? Who has the keys of the church? The key of the church, the keys of the church. It's not just a physical element to entrance the church, but it's also a, a judicial issue. Who has the responsibility of the church? Who has these keys? There's this, the problem of, uh, of the patronage does the community have the keys? It, this may be representative of the community that has the keys as a representative of the community. Or he has them because the priest gave them the or gave them the keys. So it's someone acting on behalf of someone else who's the real owner. It's the patronage. Professor Diotalevi was saying today that the issue with the clergy does not exist. It's a thing of the past because the reduction in uh, believers is way larger than that of the clergy. From 1993 to today. But wait, it's not that when you meet a priest, they're gonna tell us, oh, I have 17, uh, 17 churches. Uh, sometimes it's just an excuse to uh, working and or being implicated in all sorts of human uh, working sites and their you know, human working sites are often uh, sorry the architectural one than the human ones from this point of view priests are they at the service of the community or of the buildings? Isn't the parish the last, you know, the last space where, uh, you know, should the church has its uh, sense of time? You know, participatory um, committee is a judicial uh, body or or else. 
then we have a we have the architectural question these you know on the on the one hand we have the ex existing uh, parishes on which we should adapt a sort of uh, logic that protects uh, um, cultural heritage on the other hand there's the always a uh, more clear uh, need of you know of new things emerging because I'm not talking what we've seen but new the, the types uh, of churches with large halls and large liturgical hall which you know maybe it's used once a week for whom how there are the models. Shall we th conceive a different model, different model of uh, ecclesial presence, uh, a twenty-four-seven uh, presence? That model that uh, Professor Gerard uh, talked about, uh, hybridation. Maybe that's the model. Maybe that's what we need to have a more um, homogeneous uh, church. There's the metaphor of salt on 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 the salt of the earth, but a hybridation. It's not a hybridation of space, but it's also a hybridation of time. We can have maybe a church is managed uh, in certain uh, time spaces. These are some of the kind of uh, provocations that we we talked about, but not uh, thinking and not tackling this kind of crossroad moment is it's a mistake for me, I think. We have models of churches that could not be the same as they were in the 60s. We cannot be late on this. From this point of view, uh, the importance of the patronage must be uh, defined. These are some of my thoughts. You know, we have here lots of people that might you know, want to talk about this. There's a, a microphone uh, in front of uh, Mr. Boldoni, Dr. Boldoni. And, of course, he, he will speak now about it. Thank you, Luigi. Surely... Uh, there's an image of church that is changing. That image is emerging right now. And we heard it today from different speeches when the Second Council uh, redefined uh, the church around the people of God. When Pope Francis uh, talks about synod synodical church, it, it, that's a different church from what we used to. It's rather bizarre that considering the churches that we, we talk about, people sometimes prefer a more frontal, uh, uh, kind of frontal uh, sort of church. So there's sort of spiritual climate that is different and it is emerging climate maybe of research but now it's it's hard to have maybe uh kind of this drive of having a le you know less lazy sort of uh, sort of uh liturgy and sort of type of church that we we want but it's hard to say what will happen in the future. It's good to experiment. It's good to. It's good that church is moving past uh, sort of the fact of being outside of the world of universities. The fact that churches do not just belong to uh, Christians and believers, but to the whole city. We could dream maybe of a city uh, asking itself about its future. 
or maybe having a church where to discuss uh what's this what's you know about important things and having everyone in you know coming there to talk about important things and there's a this, we have a chance we have a possibility of changing things and us you know we as a as a believers we and are responsible for all this the thing that I wanted to talk about that I found really interesting we heard that it's not about the multi-use of church, but it's a hybrid use of church. And I'd like the Professor Gerard would say something more on the theological value of hybridation. Because there's something that talks about uh, sort of different uses, but that safeguards at the same time the, the purpose of the church. That we know that Christianity still keeps certain different aspects together. So the divine and the human, of course, horizontal aspects or the vertical aspect. When we exclude one of them, there's something missing when it comes to the church. So this aspect of hybridation, so having a, a space open to cities so that life enters everyone everyone's lives enters the church the church keeps being the place where there's a mysterious presence and that's god so we might not reduce the 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 function we must not limit the function of the churches but it still uh, be open it's good that there's a to experiment spaces around uh, the city there are spaces for reflecting and for many other things and that's what Ms., uh, professor grisa said and there's a place that can host people and that's a a parallel uh, aspect of the church per se because it's not about building new churches anymore. It's about understand, it's better to understand how to use the pre existing ones differently. So I add too many things, to two more things, sorry. We have the, the, this aspect of the holy, the, the, of the other. And it puts the anthropological aspect before the before God. But the question is how this language is not eliminated, but is lived and used by today's uh, humanity. And maybe there's an aspect, and there's a name that shows everyone's presence this this dedicated to everyone's presence there's another one dedicated to mediation there's another one dedicated to the mystery of god so having three different spaces and that should be reproduced within a worship uh, building that it's something that is not just human nor divine of course, people that are there to to, to be a priest, it, you know, works there, but then goes back to the community. But of course, there's a space for God, and it's a space for the people. And the building should be um, at the portrait, or the portrayal of a perception of becoming one people. last thing I wanted to say uh, regards something that I didn't feel you know, was touched upon today enough. And that's the aspect of the uh, historical identity, the testimony uh, brought 
on by the history of the building, the memory of the building, the artistic and uh, cultural heritage that, that the building brings about. That's already a strong uh, testimony already. And together with the people of God, that's a, an actor, a real actor in the ritual. So when you imagine a certain use of the space, history cannot be um, uh, overlooked. I feel that, that this aspect is not always uh, kept in mind. It can easily be forgotten and or can be dismissed quite easily. And that risks to... Um, yeah, you know, not have the right amount of attention for the those buildings that we can save because there are often too many churches for for the resources that we have, both in a human sense but also in a financial sense. Of course, want to save things, but of course we're not able to save all every single church. This aspect of hybridation maybe tells us that this should be a presence that tells us that certain aspects should be the uh, the subject of public debate, so that the city can take them back. So there's also this dynamic, uh, this interesting between the territories. So we've carried out studies as the University of Bologna by discovering that in Italy we have a huge density of churches. It's the most territorial structure in it's the most present territorial structure in the uh, national territory. So we have a church of uh, uh, each five kilometers of road if you distribute them in the territory. So the question has quite different now between the city communities among cities and villages, smaller places where there is a more rooted sense of tradition. There is a diversity between belonging to a city and belonging to a village or a town in which maybe, maybe the design of the place of worship can have a sense, can collect voices and collect the diversity. And I would like to say that even in these places in the periphery or in the internal areas, are they are called many times the presence of the population is more permanent than the priests. The priests come and go, but the constant element is the community. Father Giuliano Zanchi on uh, this, and not just on this, so there will be a possibility of asking questions and uh, uh, remarks. So please prepare your thoughts and notes. So we have everything to say. We have just 10 minutes. The trick is to, I'm saying three things. And then I say three things. To try and add something more to what I've already said. Father Umberto said things that I share. The first one is on the topic of patronage, those who have the keys, those who don't have the keys. Which key are we talking about? Yes, uh, those who keep it open, those who administer it, who fixes the roof when you need to fix it, who pays for that. Let me speak as a priest. The keys of the patronage up to now are remotely well, more remotely, are the ones that are trying to create a connection that is effective between the liturgical building and the liturgy that is celebrated there. I have this conviction that if there is a lack of ecclesiastic uh, patronage that we have uh, criticized for lack of preparedness or excessive influence or that we tried to 
to bring back to some effective processes with the methods of participation, etc. But I have the impression that the weakness of the ecclesiastic committance is refer to the places of uh, worship is that in this 50, 60 years after the uh, concilium, we've lost a, a specific and shared uh, perspective on the liturgic form and the liturgic style. So we don't know why are we building this church for, for which kind of liturgy. So our liturgy is no longer the organic one of the trident world where the two things were uh, went hand in hand and designers know that things change sometimes radically according to the liturgist that they have in front of them and this is the fact that the liturgic reform of Vatican II couldn't produce a celebratory style that could inspire a, in an organic way, uh, the aesthetic and the places. So this is the idea that I'm keeping writing. Probably it's wrong, but it's the idea that I have that the uh, historical episode in which the spirit of liturgy as it was uh, uh, celebrating Sacrosanctum Concilium and uh, the architectural quality of its translation, the highest moment of this adjoining became before the Concilium, the Council, and it happened in Germany with Schwarz von Stefalk. And the uh, church is that Tino Grisi is studying. So that was the episode where, for the last time, there was that. Uh, meeting with an architecture and a liturgical style that we lost, meaning that liturgy, as you know, in the last 30, 40 years, ecclesiastically became the trench of an intra-church controversy that has a meaning that goes beyond liturgy and which is mostly political. So let's add to this that the, the Universal Catholic Church, and you can understand it from how the Universal Synod of this month, of this year is going. So it's coming back to have the multiplicity and the multifacetedness of ancient Christianity. So we will become, continental churches are very diverse, but they're very diverse. And within uh, Europe, the Western and the Eastern the Catholic churches have completely different visions. I'm suspecting that we are going to we are going back to a, a multiple sensitiveness and also multiple rituals. For what concerns to us, what concerning us, this struggling in finding a liturgic style is what prevented us not just to let's say uh, process an aesthetic in a, in a shared way, so uh, liturgy translated into architecture and art. But for example, it prevented us to think about spaces, architecture, and to think about the transformation of Catholicism as a spiritual experience and also as a liturgic experience, which is turning into, which is transforming profoundly, deeply. So the Catholic Mass is no longer the right of all people as it was for many centuries. It's no longer the, the ritual for Christians. And the belonging to Christianity is deeply changing. And it's also changing thanks to the transformations that the idea of spirituality had in our society. And therefore, I was positively struck by the word hybrid, the capacity of conceiving an ecclesial space, which is not flattened on the liturgic translation, on the conventional liturgical translation that we inherited, but which is capable to turn ecclesial space into In, in hosting several levels in which you can enter in a real spiritual 
experience, which is also a Christian one. So in the future, this will mean not just the mass, not just Eucharisty. So this will mean many rites. This mean this will mean many ministries in the small parishes that you say. So if the church will stay because your funeral must be uh, done by somebody who's not a priest and you will need an appropriate place also to host this. These are factual problems. The third item, this difficulty in thinking and sharing an actual liturgical style, which is at the same time able to host the ev spiritual evolution of the time. This makes us harder to think about the role that a Christian and Catholic church must uh, have uh, for everybody. So a church that, even if it's Catholic, it's a sign not just for the Catholic, but it's for everybody, both in the on the outside and in the inside. Especially in our cities, when they challenge the sky with extremely vertical buildings, but they are spiritually horizontal. So the sign of the church is still a sign, not just for us, it's a sign for everybody. Also the interior of the church, and this should give us some criteria on the problem that was raised by Father Umberto. What are we going to do about what we have? I think that of the 1,400 churches that the Diocese of Bergamo has, divided in 380 parishes in 50, 70 years, there only will be half of them left. So this is a mourning that we need to process. We'll need to lose something. We will lose something just for an economic, also for an economical reasons, because you don't have the money to fix the roof and to keep them and to maintain them. So we will use we will lose something in 17, 200 years. So what are we going to find? We'll find the outcome of the criteria that we will be able to uh, set up on what to keep and what to leave. But to do that, we need to have some appropriate criteria. Appropriate criteria that are also related to this, the form that can uh, that Christianity can have in a time like ours that must accept uh, to inspire to forms and aesthetics that are manifold, that need to be thought and organized. So finally, the uh, tangible sign of the fact that there's a deep uh, discordance between a liturgical ideal promoted by the reform of the council that every time tries to be translated in architecture and aesthetics and our actual liturgical uh, and spiritual sensitiveness which is related uh, to some paradigms that occupy our minds like alien they are they are there i mean the proof of that is how when we build a church of which we are happy, of which we say it has a dignity, the point is how we inhabit it and how it is inhabited and the contaminations that are introduced in the capacity to celebrate in a way in which that space would suggest you to celebrate. And this never happens. It, the other way around happens. So we say a lot of things commissions, uh, drafts, projects. And then in the end, the priest changes and then you go back celebrating with the idea that you need to go to the plenary presbyterium, that you need to put the statue of Padre Pio or uh, the Virgin. And with that, we betray this dissociation. And I would say, this schizophrenia in the spiritual and liturgical style, which I believe, in my opinion, the biggest reason for stall together with
a modesty of the general church culture vis-a-vis -vis many things, but mostly vis-a-vis -vis aesthetics. Thank you. Thank you, Father Giuliano. That was really interesting. In order to build new churches, you have to have proper criteria. So I ask myself if this criteria is from the church, that if there's someone can give those criteria, we're not able to have proper criteria from this point of view. On the other hand, the church as a gift, as a presence for the city, for this city, for this society, you were saying that it keeps having a value even for our society. It is completely the opposite of, of a universe. It's pluriverse. On this, uh, the Clementis uh, studies, you know, has been uh, quite, uh, quite something. I think that's your uh, turn. I'll set the timer. Otherwise, I don't know how I'm going when I'm going to end. I don't want to abuse uh, of your presence, of your patience. That is really interesting because there's no solution. There's just research. It's research that has been going on since the 40s and 50s. We haven't left the stage yet. I think that there's a, a form of liturgy and architectural research of the 50s and 60s that are, can clearly be defined. And that is have you know focusing on participation so from both point of views there has been a great attention to a form of horizontalness that is also the uh, a, a, it's about family taking part in the ritual so that's really important when it comes to a, the awareness of uh, the Christian community of what is the, a liturgy, what is the mass, what is the community, and arch architectures try to interpret this sort of humility. This since since I'm being humble, we said this. We've seen this in Bologna in the 40s and 50s. New churches that were experience, experiencing this new. Uh, liturgical forms with the altar at the center of the church being detached by the wall. These churches, from the point of view of the city, are quite anonymous. You can barely see them. They have really no visibility because they they were supposed to be um, humble. And it wasn't uh, Charles de Foucault's intentions to to be the seed uh, kind of lost in the middle of the flower uh, uh, the eastern flower of so I think there's a clear connotation of that period that gave many results and fruits because I know in the last in the one of the latest researches that I've done, in the for the like, Claro churches, I've seen a just clear passion, but we must be aware that times have changed. Uh, we can also say matured in a way. Those elements, so the the fact that it's the community that is celebrating, of course, not everyone assimilated this aspect, uh, understood this aspect, but there are some positive things, positive elements. I happen to participate to a reconciliar a ritual and I thank them because because, of the, because before the uh, Vatican Council, you know, nowadays uh, uh, the laity can participate, but back then they couldn't. But nowadays, of course, we're in a period of rapid change a great mobility. So the aspect of churches being anchored to a territory with people with reduced mobility. So uh, 
featured by a sense of stability. You know, all of this cannot be, it's not true anymore because people are not uh, set, that sedentary anymore. People move, people look for new things. So you don't have those um, aspects anymore that made that territory uh, to, to be representative of a, of a community. So we must ask ourselves, what spaces uh, the church wants where to manifest our uh, reality. Because the church as a building manifests a search that's coming from uh, the ecclesia, the church as a community. So I, I ask myself what the what our needs are I think that we need to, uh, going back to a sense, a sense of verticality, so a sense of an, uh, of an experience. So things that are said now just are easily forgotten. Today, what stays is, is, experience, is experiences. We've done, for example, uh, a call for tennis for uh, involving 30 architects or building a church, but their preparation and their formation, sorry, was not just in terms of uh, liturgical architectural uh, knowledge. It also, was also about experiencing things. They went to the Lavena the Sanctuary. They experienced a life of spirituality and they, they were moved. They were deeply moved. And the results of these uh, calls are quite uh, relevant. So I found this aspect to be very interesting. I think that uh, the church's experience will have to be, well, I was going to have all sorts of contaminations, but we understood that we have to value uh, the beauty of this community around a God that became man. I think that aside from this aspect, there's no much more. And that tells us that there's a, a will of a need of spirituality. It, and it's there. Uh, and you, as you can see, sex are really popular nowadays. There's a sense of community and churches have started as communities. Uh, our, our Lord uh, was surrounded by people. So this is a very strong aspect that we have today. We also have this, uh, this will of contrasting fear. Our cities are terrorized. Our uh, children are uh, in their house because they're terrorized of the possibility of defeating fear and to give to be a safe haven for people and to recreate that's on my phone by the way so to restore these conditions of protections but a, wel a welcoming protection I think welcoming is the right word so a community to, is able to meet people. I don't think that I think you know churches are not very unified anymore, but I think that right now we should be able we, we have to be able to be welcoming so, so that buildings are able to to be welcoming. This sort of loving, welcome, loving, welcoming. I noted three words: community, uh, welcoming, and uh, beauty. We have a desperate need for beauty. Desperate need, because we're full of an apparent uh, uh, beauty. The fact that we have to polish our nails—nails nails I don't have—the fact that 
you cannot look disheveled. The fact that you have to look fit all the time. The fact that you have to wear branded uh, clothes. Now, this beauty that, beauty that we see in commercials, it is something we have to conform to, but it's not a beauty that is good for us. Real beauty is what is given to us by confronting to it with eternity. We have historical churches that are um, that have all sorts of beauty in it. There are they are master uh, they are masterpieces of beauty. So I think that remembering that the church has always recurred to a, a spiritual beauty. There's not the same beauty that we see sometimes in some churches in a bad way, but it's a beauty that has its roots in a lived spirituality. I think that's a great resource, having welcoming spaces, uh, having the common uh, spaces, for the, spaces for the community, uh, spaces that allow you to uh, confront yourself and uh, to communicate with uh, with mystery, the sense of mystery that God has. So uh, beauty that is able to uh, gather people. It's something that it's something that we should uh, look for in new churches, but also in abandoned churches or in spaces that we think to use in different ways. It's important, it's important to um, focus on this term that is often misunderstood, and that is beauty. Because I think that's a sign of something that we really need today in our cities. Thank you. So on the topic of beauty, we can open a great chapter. So naturally, what is beauty today? This is another huge topic. So we are under the frescoes of Caracci, so the story of the foundation of Rome. And I think that many see these places... We are hosted by the Unicate Bank, and they've seen the Namaskar cartoon as figures, but all things needs and need a narration. So to be made alive by a narration, otherwise you don't bring them home. You don't meet with that symbolical aspect that the forms of art in general open. Something that you drew out and that you uncovered, Claudia, is the aspect of the lecture the lesson of the 50s so if we take the lesson of the 50s then i'm interested in your remark is participation as you said i remember the motto that was on the provisional altar of vercaro that if we share the celestial uh, bread, how won't we uh, share the earthly one so in this perspective the participation was described so if we share the celestial bread, so the Eucharisty, how won't we, why won't we share the earthly one? Some of the project way didn't become during Mercado a participatory, clear, explicit form. So there weren't participatory uh, things during Mercado because from uh, the technical point of view, the participatory design, design was created in the 1960, 1965. So from this perspective, now we move to Father Luca Franceschini. Father Luca Franceschini here represents, well, not say the patrons, but not the solution, but a point, an important coordination point of what is produced in the diocese of Italy. So there are at least two questions, uh, in my opinion, come from the notes that were offered by the uh, speakers. The first one is on this issue of participation. So there are some uh, uh, paths, where are them? And it's a system logic. It can be uh, carried out for churches that uh, the Italian Episcopal Conference uh, does in Italy. And the secondly, and the second, 
we cannot express criteria. So ultimately, this remark puts doubts on the possibility itself of building churches. Theoretically, I mean, ultimately, I said, so if we don't have the criteria, a single criteria to be patrons, I mean, how can we build churches? Can we still build churches? This is an extremity, but I am uh, uh, asking you in practical terms. Is there the possibility? Do you see it possible? Is there a margin? Is there a territory in which to promote design criteria or a method? Is there an effort to get to, to build a system within which variability is compressed and therefore to provide the right proposal to our territory? So what is the possibility of the Italian Episcopal Conference of suggesting designing criteria for the church? Is that possible in your opinion? It's hard, but since, but because we are in Italy, Italy has unique characteristics in the world. France has 98 dioceses. Italy, at the end of the Concilium, had 320. Now we've reduced to 20, 225. Germany has less than France. We have 225 dioceses. Some of them are very small. We have 100,000 churches, 67,000 churches, depending on the 225 Italian bishops. With differences, with huge differences in the territory, I come from Tuscany. And when we say that a big village, big town, a big town, a big town has 300 uh, inhabitants. When you talk about, in Apulia, about a small village, Oh, you are uh, the priest in a small village is 2,000. Well, 2,000 is not a village, it's Pontremoli, which is considered a city. So it's not a town or a village. So we have a huge difference because in my diocese, we have uh, some municipalities where you have a church for each 30 inhabitants. So that's completely depopulated, but with a faith and a tradition of people that participates in 85-90% uh, to liturgical celebrations of the life of the church, and they have no intention, if they die, that people to uh, have a funeral in the uh, neighboring church. They want to die and to uh, have their funeral in their own church to be buried in their own cemetery. So there's this deep connection with the history of that community, that church, and without, well, being too willing of changing the uh, tradition of that church. So this is the first important scenario. So how do you rule uh, this thing from, from the top, this very diverse situation of north, central, south, many bishops, many dioceses, many bishops that have small dioceses. This means a small diocese means a diocese that does not have people in charge that have the possibility of studying, of specializing themselves, while today we were live in a world where you must specialize to be the treasurer of the diocese or to manage a, a parish. Even if you have 30 inhabitants, you need skills, because, competencies, because then you have bills to pay, you can say taxes to pay, then you have, uh, uh, you didn't pay the property tax, you didn't pay uh, the uh, register. So in 1949, there was an inspection of the tax authority and they said that uh, the drawing was not compliant with the floor plan. And from 1949 to uh, today, the searches are still not compliant with the cadaster. So you see, how, to, um, how do you rule that? I work for the Italian uh, Episcopal Conference, but the it, Episcopal Conference is not the ruler or the um, the superior of the bishops. The bishops only respond to report to the Pope and to God. So the Italian Episcopal Conference doesn't have a power. Well, if it has a power, because, well, we have a bit of a power because we manage the money of the eight thousands of the tax revenue. So you would like to make a church 75%? Yes, we can pay it, but at some conditions. But 
the uh, bishops do not report to us. So if the bishop wants to do a direct assignment for the project, we can't tell them, no, you can't. So the soft policies, but I think effective policies that was made by the Italian uh, Episcopal Conference, so my predecessors, because I've been here for just a few time, has been an important policy. So to start talking a design that can be done by creating a team instead of uh, entrusting uh, trusting a single architect. So involving the a liturgist with the architect, the geologist, an engineer, and maybe also an artist. And then suggesting that we can design together in a dialogue among more people instead of asking one, please do a church which is a losing choice, even uh, if he were the biggest architect in this world. But then the following step, which was, you were talking about the preliminary uh, document uh, in design. When I was younger, I never heard about that. Now we talk about it also to design a new altar for a church. So let's do preliminary document. So let's, talk before so let's wonder what we need let's see what the concilium and uh, the council asks let's see what the uh, italian uh, church asks after the council let's see what are the best practices let's ask our people what do they expect let's have a meeting with uh, the people who can draw the altar uh, in their opinion then maybe we won't follow them but then but we involve them anyway so these are some steps that our church made thanks to a policy, a central policy on behalf of the Italian Episcopal Conference that produced some step forwards, which were extremely important in a context that is a very hard, hard, tough context. Why is that? Because I believe, and I don't want to be wrong, probably I'm the youngest among the priests here, even though I look older with my bird, but the church after the council is a church, and I was born after the council, it's a church that didn't want, by its own choice, to provide some guidelines uh, like San Carlo Borromeo. So on some part, you can see a church is made like this, this, and this. It must have this, this, and this. Yes, there are some guidelines. I mean, yes, but they're just guidelines. You don't have radical choices, according to which some said, well, after the, the Second Vatican uh, Concilium, after the, con the Trento, council you change style and we find a new way of building a church nobody said it nobody wanted to say that it's a choice it's a choice for the church of not wanting to take uh pre-made decisions in that view that synodal view that is part of the council which is to say we are not saying what you are supposed to do you must wonder about what you want to do but that's hard that's hard that's and the proof of this uh, toughness is, on the one hand, this uncertainty that everybody has. And on the other, and I uh, think this scares me the most, is that in the end, in a context that's perceived by many as an uncertain context, not just as a synodal concept where you can say something, where we can discuss to produce something new, something ours. So in this climate, defensive uh, attitudes work. And among young priests, I see radicalized defensive attitudes compared to some years ago when I was a young priest. And we already had a bit of this when I was a young priest. I mean, there was this willingness to find a stronger identity because identity of the church was too generic. But now it's much more. And many seeking for generic spirituality can find it in the catholic church the catholic church because they are looking for it where you can find something that is more rigid giving you more security a unique method which is that one providing you certain responses also rational ones but doesn't matter they are certain we are looking for uh, cheap certainties there's no more sociologists so the market becomes strong and it becomes very attractive for those who wants to make money out of it because it's easy it's easy to sell to sell security safeties in a, a totally insecure and unsafe world this is a great question but i don't know the answer because there are two possibilities one is to 
say that we believe in it so much that we press forward and we keep on synodal. And Pope Francis, I think, is a great believer of it and he invites to follow this line. But not everybody can have this faith in a weak way of doing things. Because it produces so much uncertainty and insecurity in people that the temptation is to find some security. But the Pope says this is the gospel. But this requires great faith in a moment like this one where we've had an unprecedented liquid faith. Now uh, this is fashionable, but but it's liquid faith a bit on the side. And in a moment like this, to have a strong faith in not relying to anything. So in the ancient testament you have in the old testament you have the image of the road. If you if you ask uh, help to the pharaohs, you'll be like the one leaning to a road. But if but it can uh, break and then you fall down with your hand broken. So going there without leaning is the big challenge of this moment. I think that the Episcopal Conference can't do anything more. We can improve what we are doing, obviously, and we're trying to do it. Also, with your advice and your help for what I've said, we don't have the authority to say local church what we are supposed to do. And we cannot do it. Yesterday, the Secretary General reminded us that the Episcopal Conference was born with regional churches that in Italy were delegated by the Pope to be uh, the places where they make laws. But the Episcopal Conference does not have the power of making laws, of taking decisions or imposing bishops anything. Therefore, with many dioceses, many small dioceses that have no tools to produce design processes to press forward, everything is very hard, but we are not relying, we are not uh, leaning uh, to any rod. So, and the work that thanks to you that was done in this year's the training, uh, awareness, participation, involving communities and working before giving uh, uh, the role to anybody to make a uh, the uh, putting together different preliminary projects, ideas, providing some inputs, which we didn't think about. So this is the risk that we've already th thought about anything. Then we can ask a designer, so we explain it what they are supposed to do, and so then we can take a cheap one because they did do what we want to. But I hope that the next designers will be the great designers that in front of our ideas can propose something something more. Finally, then we need to come to get to grips with reality because with less economic resources and availability because the 8,000s diminish and also uh, the co-participation of our community uh, decreases because they have less resources than some years ago and Beautiful churches are where you have the time to build, not just with a lot of money, but also with many years to build the Sagrada Familia. Yes, you can do it. You can do it, a church like that, but it takes a century to do that. Together, we can... Now we can't uh, design medieval uh, cathedral for the next century. Then they realized that they couldn't do uh, these century-long designs that you had to end before. Because if you start now and then you leave the work for the 100 years or the either the Pope pays like for the St. Peter Bail or, or uh, like in Siena and other places you uh, leave unfinished cat cathedrals. Now we are doing smaller things and try to complete them. Thank you very much for the attention. Thank you Don Luca. Padre Luca. So, so per certo che ci... I know that there are some questions. So So who's, the, who's first? Professor Giammetti, good evening and thank you for your input. I just wanted uh, to build on what has been just said. I 
feel, uh, let's say, uh, stimulated as an architect, because in the first speech, there's a summary of the topic of the space of the whole in this duality between vertical and horizontal, which is a tension within we need to move to make sure that that space is not represented, but that it must be activated, which is slightly different. Because if I think that dichotomy, that potential of being horizontal and vertical must be represented, so I must... Uh, have the public and the actor because it's reassuring if i work on a character of the space saying that that's in order to leave that potential into activate that potentiality uh, through a performative dimension so that if i don't uh experience experience the liturgy in a participatory way that space is not filled with character, automatically this thing won't work. A simple thing to do that, and I'm saying it as an architect, is to remove the seats. Removing the organized structure of the uh, seats, so removing the bench, because as long as we block the space with the uh, seats, which I more than mentioned, because the space is before, there were great depictions of lateral space, of the side spaces where there were no seats. So I'm saying, so if you take a look at the way of inhabiting the uh, the hall, it's like a mosque because there are small groups. So it has this groups of grouping of great spaces. So they were organized as small groups, but people organized because it was activated. They were activated. The other issue is the difference of quarters within the space. Uh, because as, when I work on the floor, which looks like niche neutral, so this generates uh, spaces. So if I generate uh, this spaces, I limit the activation potential, which is related to a performative dimension of the ritual, which is something nice that was left by the concilium, the council. So naturally, there's a text and there's who reads it. There's the text and there's who reads it. As an architect, when I uh, write the space, I'm not closing the message if I put myself in that dimension. If I activate some devices as such that I'm not closing the text, the position of the benches, the section of the floor, the orientation of light, in German churches, we often see this light, which is a puncture light, that comes down with small lamps as if it wishes to put some transcendence going through a, a radical form of feminine. So that artificial light, that for us, the Mediterraneans, it's something very strange. That we are used to another kind of light. And this is interesting because when we design spaces, we cannot design those spaces. I'm deeply in love with these spaces, but an architect, well, they're not mine. I come from Naples, so they are not mine at all. But I need to know that. Symbols. How do I work with is sign, symbol, and icon? They are three dimensions of communication that, in my opinion, should be an issue. Because we are in a society working with icons, so I have 21-year-old uh, students that only speak with icons, so I have problems uh, to make them draw cross-sections. But in our spiritual dimension, we need what? We need signs, symbols, or icons. This is the reasoning that must go through uh, training. I deeply believe that in this transitionary moment, we need to work on school on the school of architects, the school of the liturgists, the school of the priests, because it isn't easy to be a priest today. It's very complicated. It's like being a mayor. These are the two things that I never wish to do. So I'm sorry, this is not a question. This was just my remark. We welcome your remarks. And uh, it's very interesting, very interesting remarks and this session.
is recorded for internal purposes for documenting and also the remarks are recorded. Are there any other remarks? Uh, Davide Di Modugno. So you already introduced yourself. I just, thank you, uh, Luigi. Uh, good evening. I just wanted to pick up from when Don Marcello Brunini said, talking about the theological value of hybridation and the reuse. So I won't push myself to the theological value, but I would like to provide a juridical meaning to the uh, to use churches in a mixed way. So I would like to, to uh, refer to the canonical law and the second paragraph says that ecclesiastical uh, assets have three purposes, worship, the support for the clergy and charity. And therefore, the use or reuse must be inspired to a charity. And charity is not just about giving support to the poor, but is to support different poverties, which are relational, cultural. And in my idea, the outcome of my research in the PhD, which ended up into a book, I'm saying that this is the strategy that we need to follow, which is consistent with the protection that the state offers to this heritage, because there's the boundary of Article 831, second paragraph of the Civil Code, is, which is constitutionally legitimized in the the right of the freedom of worship. And when this boundary is missing, we need to find a new use, a new purpose, which is constitutionally rele relevant. And then we have social and cultural uses that might have that social function of the property, uh, which is Article 42 of the Italian Constitution. So opening the idea of common uh, goods and subsidiarity, which is com compatible with the doctrine of the church and also with theological uh, categories of uh, gift and the relationship that I wanted to highlight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this uh, remark. Andrea Longhi. Uh, terms that uh, in the uh, Don Luca and uh, uh, that the concept of criterium. One of the criteria that uh, uh, was codified in the uh, calls is the criterion of recognizability on which the juries, the candidates on the slides as before, so uh, throw the first rocks. So so the juror, I was a juror critical, a critic, I did everything. So recognizability is the hard on which juries get stuck, on which designers uh, struggle, on which designing groups struggle too. I, history says that recognizability is built in history, it doesn't exist a recognizability with capital R. But I was thinking about the three churches that we've seen today. What is recognizability of these buildings that are so different from each other? So when I saw Sanjo's church, I hoped off the Udine Civitale train, I crossed the city center, the periphery, the countryside, and I got to the church on foot. And after this section, as the urban uh, said, so these uh, uh, part in the territory of Cividale, you come to a place, a different place, which is welcoming. So you have this concept of welcoming that Claudia said. So, but you go around, you got off uh, the uh, motorway in Bergamo, you have desperation, you have nothing, and then you find a place and you say, this is a place. There's something here. Somebody thought about it. And the same goes for Viareggio. I was, and I had to leave earlier. You uh, go, you look around, and then, then you see. So it's three recognizable building, buildings. 
uh, from the uh, traditional generic uh, suggestions. So they don't have a pointy uh, roof. They don't have the portal, the apps, uh, the round apps, uh, and getting there. So crossing the territory during this section of foot by car, you will understand that something different happened. Uh, They are anonymous places that are in the same place. So I want to congratulate on the designers, friends, but you can say much about the churches. So that's clear that when you see the calls, they look alike, they're cubic uh, brown, they're white. Uh, so, but things done in their own places, the recognizability, can uh, they can uh, be conquered on the territory, not on the abacus of the uh, 19th century uh, elements, so in the uh, extinct imaginary. Thank you very much. So the clear the clarity of a foundation act. So on this uh, topic of recognizability, an important reflection is that compared to the 50s, when uh, in Italy and especially in France, in the grand, French Grand Assemblies, there were some places of worship, there were some spaces for liturgical uh, locations, but they were completely unseen and invisible, which and is lost in the set of building and also in the churches of the 50s in Bologna and Milan is quite different, but in Bologna, the churches were not supposed to emerge or have signs of recognition so they have to be uh, the church among the uh, the house among the houses so domestic places so in the 90s in the 1990s we've evolved so in french peripheries to those spaces some signals were put so across or bell tower, or some elements of recognition. And on that element, we've made a reflection to say, no, in the cities, we need uh, uh, to be, uh, this, they could be recognized. When there has been a thought on this that I wondered about when I made research in French peripheries, where the dynamics are so quick, that they can examine. So in Italy it's quite uh, difficult. Why is that? Why is it important to have a visibility, a recognizability of places of worship? I interviewed many people, non-believers, non-churchgoers, and I realized that the places of the mystery and the religious places, I'm not talking about the Catholic uh, church, there are mosques, there are pagodas, others, they are some important points of reference. I think that, according to what I've heard uh, talking with people, it looked like they are perceived as a recall to significance of existence. So uh, places of worship, cultural places must be visible because they are orientation, points of orientation. They are points of reference in uh, human wandering. So, and I think this is important to be taken into account for the evolution of our topic. Thank you very much. I don't know if there are some final remarks. We have just very, very, very few minutes, but uh, the attitude of the Foundation Act that you were recalling, the clarity of the Foundation Act is a uh, thought about uh, things. So I just want to say something. Luciano Gerardi, who wrote about these topics and was a member of the offices created by Lercar involved in the same uh, new church's office, he wrote about the certainty of the artist as an act of artisanship. So the church as a uh, recognizable acts of craftsmanship. So he was shocked 
in the 80s. He participated to a conference and he was shocked talking about in talking about it in 1985. He was shocked about the fact that in churches between the 50s and the 80s, there were prefabricated elements. So the outcome of a uh, serial production without authorship and then uh, unthink without uh, craftsmanship, uh, works of craftsmanship. So these, uh, the churches as a uh, place of artisanship. I don't know if we are able to do it, but that's a topic. Freya, Father Marcello. Solo due suggesti. So just uh, two quick remarks in reference with uh, uh, what you are saying. So this is the first one, uh, the attention to beauty. And you say that we are in here and we need a narration or we can remove the, uh, the benches. In my opinion, when you enter a church, so I don't want to be uh, too much spiritualist or out of my mind, but the church can immediately enlarge, so it disperses you, or immediately it sends you to a condition, an interior condition. This is the threshold. In my uh, view, the people, my people, people from my neighborhood, when uh, they entered the church, they were surprised. But what, that was a surprise that besides the benches and many things, that immediately, in my perspective, was to be placed in a context of interiorization. So this dimension, in my opinion, is the dimension of beauty. And that you have light, the colors. So in my church, there's the gold of the walls because they are in uh, wood. The roof is white. Isaiah is, is like it's a um, a piece of the altar, an altar piece. But in my uh, church is on the assembly, so it's the spirit that surrounds it, looms over the assembly, and then you have the back uh, wall the back glass panel, which is taken from the Scroveni Chapel, which is somehow a dynamic that brings you beyond the altar and gives you the uh, transcendence. And uh, this is a narration. But what struck me is that uh, the people uh, coming into the church are gathered. So we feel... Uh, so to talk about the benches, if you come to Luca and you see the St. Michael's Church, as long as uh, benches were there, I was there with the seminary. So uh, I said, take a look of them from on the outside, because when you come in, but then we found ourselves surprised, but because there were no benches. So the space became effectively different. It became very welcoming. So the dynamic of beauty is so important that it is immediately experimentable. Then you can enrich it further from by different factors that uh, uh, we can highlight. The second thing we need to we need to conclude. So yeah, so when we did all the process with the uh, the Italian Episcopal Conference during the uh, path, I said. So within the, what is the design? So what is the responsible of the procedure? So how to go on? So is there anybody who helps us to, to enter in an ecclesiastic dynamic of these factors? No. So this thing, uh, I'm saying this because Severino Djanic, that created in Florence a school for architects, uh, said the architects, look, if you want to build a church, you need to go uh, to mass once a week on Sunday. But my designers prepared two microphones. But when you are going, when are you going to mass? When uh, we have uh, celebrated that, but we need more microphones. 
because the ecclesia dynamic is fundamental to enter in a criteria. So basically, it's given for granted, but no, because the church of the people is the church of the people. The civitas is not the polis. So these are dimensions on which we should do it. I'm sorry, I need to take the floor because it's 7.05. 7.6, we need uh, to have the interpreters go home that are uh, listening, Francesco and uh, Edoardo Ballerini. Thank you very much. They are in the room uh, adjoining this. They need to catch a trade. So we need to leave the building because it's late. It's 7.06. So I'm sorry for those who wanted to take the floor, but we will say that it's time. Uh, to go so thank you very much of uh, do, uh, the people from Tulcom Eventidia Grammatia who assisted us today uh, Miss Vilma that probably left the uh, room sorry if I cut in this way but we'll see you tomorrow to go on with the conference so with all the group now we are going to move to the bus and I remind you that we have 50 places. I don't know if there is some spot available. If there's some spot available, please tell it to Federica Foligni so we can go together to Sandisma Church, which is white. So Andrea, uh, the church is white in this case. Thank you very much and see you tomorrow.